This reading by Gordon McKenzie. Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Introduction. Come, said my soul, such verses for my body let us write, for we are one, that should I after return, or long, long hence in other spheres, there to some group of mates the chance resuming, tallying earth's soil, trees, winds, tumultuous waves, ever with pleased smile I may keep on, ever and ever yet the verses owning, as, first, I hear and now, signing for soul and body, set to them my name, Walt Whitman. Book One, Inscriptions. One's self I sing. One's self I sing, a simple, separate person. Yet utter the word democratic, the word en masse. A physiology from top to toe I sing. Not physiognomy alone, nor brain alone is worthy for the muse. I say the form complete is worthier far. The female equally with the male I sing. Of life immense in passion, pulse, and power. Cheerful, for freest action formed under the laws divine. The modern man I sing. As I pondered in silence. As I pondered in silence, returning upon my poems, considering, lingering long, a phantom arose before me with distrustful aspect, terrible in beauty, age, and power, the genius of poets of old lands, as to me directing like flame its eyes, with finger pointing to many immortal songs and menacing voice. What singest thou, it said? Knowest thou not there is hut one theme for ever enduring bards? And that is the theme of war, the fortune of battles, the making of perfect soldiers. Be it so, then I answered, I too, haughty shade, also sing war, and a longer and greater one than any, waged in my book with varying fortune, with flight, advance and retreat, victory deferred and wavering. Yet methinks certain, or as good as certain at the last, the field, the world, for life and death, for the body and for the eternal soul, lo, I too am come, chanting the chant of battles. I, above all, promote brave soldiers. In Cabined Ships at Sea In cabined ships at sea, the boundless blue on every side expanding, with whistling winds and music of the waves, the large imperious waves, or some lone bark buoyed on the dense marine, where joyous full of faith, spreading white sails, she cleaves the ether mid the sparkle and the foam of day, or under many a star at night, by sailors, young and old, Haply will I, a reminiscence of the land, be read in full rapport at last. Here are our thoughts, voyagers' thoughts. Here not the land, firm land, alone appears. May then by them be said, the sky o'er arches here. We feel the undulating deck beneath our feet. We feel the long pulsation, 
ebb and flow of endless motion, the tones of unseen mystery, the vague and vast suggestions of the briny world, the liquid flowing syllables, the perfume, the faint creaking of the cordage, the melancholy rhythm, the boundless vista and the horizon far and dim are all here. And this is Ocean's poem. Then falter not, O book. Fulfill your destiny. You not a reminiscence of the land alone. You too as a lone bark cleaving the ether, purposed I know not whither, yet ever full of faith. Consort to every ship that sails, sail you. Bear forth to them folded my love. Dear mariners, for you I fold it here in every leaf. Speed on my book, spread your white sails, my little bark athwart the imperious waves. Chant on. Sail on, bear o'er the boundless blue from me to every sea, this song for mariners and all their ships. To Foreign Lands I heard that you asked for something to prove this puzzle, the new world, and to define America, her athletic democracy. Therefore, I send you my poems, that you behold in them what you wanted. To a Historian You who celebrate bygones, who have explored the outward, the surfaces of the races, the life that has exhibited itself, who have treated of man as the creature of politics, aggregates, rulers, and priests. I, Habitan of the Alleghenies, treating of him as he is in himself in his own rights, pressing the pulse of the life that has seldom exhibited itself, the great pride of man in himself, chanter of personality, outlining what is yet to be, I project the history of the future. To thee, old cause. To thee, old cause, thou peerless, passionate, good cause, thou stern, remorseless, sweet idea, deathless throughout the ages, races, lands. After a strange, sad war, great war for thee. I think all war through time was really fought and ever will be really fought for thee. These chants for thee, the eternal march of thee. A war, O oh, soldiers, not for itself alone. Far, far more stood silently waiting behind, now to advance in this book. Thou orb of many orbs, thou seething principle, thou well-kept latent germ, thou center. Around the idea of thee the war revolving, with all its angry and vehement play of causes, with vast results to come for thrice a thousand years. These recitatives for thee, my book and the war are one, merged in its spirit I and mine, as the contest hinged on thee, as a wheel on its axis turns, this book unwitting to itself 
around the idea of thee. Eidolons. I met a seer, passing the hues and objects of the world, the field of art and learning, pleasure, sense, to glean Eidolons. Put in thy chance, said he, no more the puzzling hour, nor day, nor segments, parts put in. Put first before the rest as light for all an entrance song of all, that of Eidolons. Ever the dim beginning, ever the growth, the rounding of the circle, ever the summit and the merge at last to surely start again. Eidolons, Eidolons. Ever the mutable, ever materials changing, crumbling, recohering. Ever the ateliers, the factories divine, issuing Eidolons. Lo, I or you, or woman, man, or state, known or unknown, we seeming solid wealth, strength, beauty build, but really build Eidolons. The ostent evanescent, the substance of an artist's mood, or savant studies long, or warriors, martyrs, heroes toils, to fashion his Eidolon. Of every human life, the units gathered, posted, not a thought, a motion, deed left out. The whole or large or small summed, added up in its eidolon. The old, old urge, based on the ancient pinnacles. Low, newer, higher pinnacles from science and the modern still impelled. The old, old urge. Eidolon. The present, now and here, America's busy, teeming, intricate world of aggregate and segregate for only thence releasing today's Eidolons. These with the past of vanished lands, of all the reigns of kings across the sea, old conquerors, old campaigns, old sailors' voyages, joining Eidolons. Densities, growth, facades, strata of mountains, soils, rocks, giant trees, far born, far dying, living long to leave Eidolons everlasting. Exult, rapt, ecstatic, the visible but their womb of birth of orbic tendencies to shape and shape and shape the mighty earth eidolon. All space, all time, the stars, the terrible perturbations of the suns, swelling, collapsing, ending, serving their longer, shorter use, filled with eidolons only. The noiseless myriads, the infinite oceans where the rivers empty, the separate countless free identities like eyesight, the true realities, eidolons. Not this world, nor these the universes, they the universes, purport and end ever the permanent life of life. Eidolons, Eidolons. Beyond thy lectures learned, Professor, beyond thy telescope or spectroscope observer keen, beyond all mathematics, beyond the doctor's surgery, anatomy, beyond the chemist with his chemistry, the entities of entities, Eidolons. Unfixed, yet fixed, 
ever shall be, ever have been and are, sweeping the present to the infinite future, Eidolons, Eidolons, Eidolons. The prophet and the bard shall yet maintain themselves in higher stages yet, shall mediate to the modern, to democracy, interpret yet to them God and Eidolons. And thee, my soul, joys, ceaseless exercises, exultations, thy yearning amply fed at last, prepared to meet thy mates, Eidolons, thy body permanent, the body lurking there within thy body, the only purport of the form thou art, the real I myself, an image, an eidolon. Thy very songs, not in thy songs, no special strains to sing, none for itself, but from the whole resulting, rising at last, and floating, a round, full-orbed eidolon. For him I sing, for him I sing, I raise the present on the past, as some perennial tree out of its roots, the present on the past. With time and space I him dilate and fuse the immortal laws to make himself by them the law unto himself. When I read the book, when I read the book, the biography, famous, and is this then, said I, what the author calls a man's life? And so will someone, when I am dead and gone, write my life? As if any man really knew aught of my life, why even I myself, I often think no little or nothing of my real life, only a few hints, a few diffused, faint clues and indirections I seek for my own use to trace out here. Beginning My Studies Beginning my studies, the first step pleased me so much the mere fact consciousness, these forms, the power of motion, the least insect or animal, the senses, eyesight, love, the first step I say awed me and pleased me so much, I have hardly gone and hardly wish to go any farther, but stop and loiter all the time to sing it in ecstatic songs. Beginners How they are provided for upon the earth, appearing at intervals. How dear and dreadful they are to the earth. How they inure to themselves as much as to any. What a paradox appears their age how people respond to them, yet know them not, how there is something relentless in their fate all times, how all times mischoose the objects of their adulation and reward, and how the same inexorable price must still be paid for the same great purchase. To the States, to the States, or any one of them, or any city of the States, resist much, obey little. Once unquestioning obedience, once fully enslaved, once fully enslaved no nation, state, city of this earth ever afterward resumes its liberty. On Journeys Through the States 
On journeys through the states we start, high through the world, urged by these songs, sailing henceforth to every land, to every sea. We willing learners of all, teachers of all, and lovers of all. We have watched the seasons dispensing themselves and passing on, and have said, why should not a man or woman do as much as the seasons and effuse as much? We dwell a while in every city and town. We pass through Canada, the Northeast, the vast valley of the Mississippi, and the southern states. We confer on equal terms with each of the states. We make trial of ourselves and invite men and women to hear. We say to ourselves, remember, fear not, be candid, promulge the body and the soul, dwell a while and pass on, be copious, temperate, chaste, magnetic, and what you effuse may then return as the seasons return, and may be just as much as the seasons. To a certain cantatrice, here, take this gift. I was reserving it for some hero, speaker, or general, one who should serve the good old cause, the great idea the progress and freedom of the race. Some brave confronter of despots, some daring rebel. But I see that what I was reserving belongs to you just as much to any. Me imperturb. Me imperturb. Standing at ease in nature, master of all or mistress of all, aplomb in the midst of irrational things, imbued as they, passive, receptive, silent as they, finding my occupation, poverty, notoriety, foibles, crimes, less important than I thought. Me, toward the Mexican Sea, or in the Manhattan, or the Tennessee, or far north or inland, a river man, or a man of the woods, or of any farm life of these states, or of the coast, or the lakes, or Canada, me wherever my life is lived, oh, to be self-balanced for contingencies, to confront night, storms, hunger, ridicule, accidents, rebuffs, as the trees and animals do. Savantism. Thither as I look I see each result and glory retracing itself and nestling close, always obligated. Thither hours, months, years. Thither trades, compacts, establishments, even the most minute, thither everyday life, speech, utensils, politics, persons, estates, thither we also, I with my leaves and songs, trustful, admirant, as a father to his father going takes his children along with him. The Ship Starting Lo, the unbounded sea, on its breast, a ship starting, spreading all sails, carrying even her moon sails. The pennant is flying aloft as she speeds, she speeds so stately. Below, emulous waves press forward. They surround the ship with shining, curving motions and foam. I hear America singing. 
I hear America singing. The varied carols I hear, those of mechanics, everyone singing his as it should be blithe and strong. The carpenter singing his as he measures his plank or beam. The mason singing his as he makes ready for work or leaves off work. The boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat. The deckhand singing on the steamboat deck. The shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench. The hatter singing as he stands. The woodcutter's song, the plowboy's on his way in the morning or at noon intermission or at sundown. The delicious singing of the mother or of the young wife at work or of the girl sewing or washing. Each singing what belongs to him or her and to none else. The day what belongs to the day. At night, the party of young fellows, robust, friendly, singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs. What place is besieged? What place is besieged and vainly tries to raise the siege? Lo, I send to that place a commander, swift, brave, immortal, and with him horse and foot and parks of artillery and artillerymen, the deadliest that ever fired gun. Still, though, the one I sing, Still, though, the one I sing, one, yet of contradictions made, I dedicate to nationality. I leave in him revolt, O latent right of insurrection, O quenchless, indispensable fire. Shut not your doors. Shut not your doors to me, proud libraries, for that which was lacking on all your well-filled shelves, yet needed most, I bring forth from the war emerging a book I have made, the words of my book nothing, the drift of it everything, a book separate not linked with the rest, nor felt by the intellect, but you, ye untold latencies, will thrill to every page. Poets to come. Poets to come. Orators, singers, musicians to come. Not today is to justify me and answer what I am for. But you, a new brood, native, athletic, continental, greater than before known, arouse, for you must justify me. I myself but write one or two indicative words for the future. I but advance a moment only to wheel and hurry back in the darkness. I am a man who sauntering along without fully stopping, turns a casual look upon you and then averts his face, leaving it to you to prove and define it, expecting the main things from you. To you. Stranger, if you passing meet me and desire to speak to me, why should you not speak to me? Why should I not speak to you? Thou reader, thou reader, throbbest life and pride and love the same as I. Therefore, for thee the following chance. End of book one. Recording by Hugh McGuire. Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman Book 2 
starting from Palmanok. One. Starting from fish-shaped Palmanok, where I was born, well-begotten, raised by a perfect mother. After roaming many lands, lover of populous pavements, dweller in Manhattan, my city, or on southern savannas, or a soldier camped or carrying my knapsack and a gun, or a miner in California. Or rude in my home in Dakota's woods, my diet meat, my drink in the spring. Or withdrawn to muse and meditate in some deep recess, far from the clank of crowds, intervals passing rapt and happy. Aware of the fresh, free giver, the flowing Missouri. Aware of mighty Niagara. Aware of the buffalo herds grazing the plains the herstute and strong-breasted bull of earth, rocks, fifth-month flowers experienced, stars, rain, snow, my amaze. Having studied the mockingbird's tones in the flight of the mountain hawk and heard at dawn the unrivaled one, the hermit thrush from the swamp cedars, solitary, singing in the west, I strike up for a new world. Two, victory, union, faith, identity, time, the indissoluble compacts, riches, mystery, eternal progress, the cosmos, and the modern reports. This then is life. Here is what has come to the surface after so many throes and convulsions. How curious, how real. Underfoot the divine soil, overhead the sun. Sea revolving the globe. The ancestor continents away grouped together, the present and future continents north and south with the isthmus between. See vast trackless spaces. As in a dream they change, they swiftly fill countless masses debauched upon them. They are now covered with the foremost people, arts, institution known. See, projected through time, for me an audience interminable. With firm and regular step they wend, they never stop. Successions of men, Americanos, a hundred million, one generation playing its part and passing on, another generation playing its part and passing on its turn with faces turned sideways or backwards towards me to listen, with eyes retrospective towards me. Three. Americanos, conquerors, marches humanitarian. Foremost, century marches, libertad, masses. For you, a program of chance of the prairies, chants of the long-running Mississippi and down to the Mexican Sea, chants of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin and Minnesota, chants going forth from the center from Kansas and thence equidistant, shooting pulses of fire ceaseless to vivify all. Four. Take my leaves, America. Take them south and take them north. Make welcome for them everywhere. For they are your own offspring. Surround them east and west for they would surround you and you precedents connect lovingly with them, for they connect lovingly with you. 
I conned old times. I sat studying at the feet of the great masters. Now, if eligible, oh, that great masters might return and study me. In the name of these states, shall I scorn the antique? Why, these are the children of the antique to justify them. Five. Dead poets, philosophers, priests, martyrs, artists, inventors, governments long since, language shapers on other shores, nations once powerful now reduced, withdrawn or desolate. I dare not proceed till I respectfully credit what you have left, wafted, hitter. I have perused it. Own it, it's admirable, moving a while among it. Think nothing can ever be greater. Nothing can ever deserve more than it deserves. Regarding it all intently a long while, then dismissing it, I stand in my place with my own day here. Here lands female and male. Here the airship an heiress ship of the world, hear the flame of materials, hear spirituality, the translatress, the openly avowed, the ever tending, the finale of visible forms, the satisfier after due long waiting now advancing, yes, here comes my mistress, the soul. Six, the soul, forever and forever, longer than soil is brown and solid, longer than water ebbs and flows. I will make the poems of materials, for I think they are to be the most spiritual poems, and I will make the poems of my body and of mortality. And I think I shall then supply myself with the poems of my soul and of immortality. I will make a song for these states that no one state may under any circumstances be subjected to another state. And I will make a song that there shall be comity by day and by night between all the states and between any two of them. And I will make a song for the ears of the president full of weapons with menacing points and behind the weapons countless dissatisfied faces And a song make I of the one formed out of all, the fanged and glittering one whose head is over all, resolute, warlike one, including and over all, however high the head of any else, that head is over all. I will acknowledge contemporary land. I will trail the whole geography of the globe and salute courteously every city, large and small, and employments I will put in my poems that with you is heroism upon land and sea. And I will report all heroism from an American point of view. I will sing the songs of companionship I will show what alone must finally compact these. I believe these are to found their own ideal of manly love, indicating it in me. I will therefore let flame from me the burning fires that were threatening to consume me. I will lift what has too long kept down those smoldering fires. I will give them complete abandonment I will write the evangel poem of comrades and of love. For who but I should understand love with all its sorrow and joy? And who but I should be the poet of comrades? Seven. I am the credulous man of qualities, ages, races. I advance from the people in their own spirit 
Here is what sings unrestricted faith. Om, Om. Let others ignore that they may. I make the poem of evil also. I commemorate that part also. I am myself just as much evil as good, and my nation is, and I say, there is in fact no evil. Or if there is, I say it is just as important to you, to the land, or to me, as anything else. I too, following many and followed by many, inaugurate a religion. I descend into the arena. It may be I am destined to utter the loudest cries there, the winners appealing shouts. No, they may rise for me yet. Each is not for its own sake. I say, the whole earth and all the stars in the sky are for religion's sake. I say, no man has ever yet been half devout enough. None has ever yet adored or worshipped half enough. None has begun to think how divine he himself is and how certain. I say that the real and permanent grandeur of these states must be their religion. Otherwise, there is no just, no real, no permanent grandeur. Nor character nor life worthy of the name without religion. Nor land nor man or woman without religion. Eight. What are you doing, young man? Are you so earnest, so given up to literature, science, art, amours? These ostensible realities, politics, points, your ambition or business, whatever it may be. It is well. Against such I say not a word. I am their poet also. But behold, such swiftly subside, burnt up for religion's sake. For not all matter is fuel to heat, palpable flame, the essential life of the earth. And more than such are to religion. Nine. What do you seek so pensive and silent? What do you need, camarado? Dear son, do you think it is love? Listen, dear son, listen, America, daughter or son. It is a painful thing to love a man or woman to excess, yet it satisfies, it is great, but there is something else very great. It makes the whole coincide. It magnificent, beyond materials, with continuous hands, sweeps, and provides for all. Ten. Know you solely to drop in the earth the germs of a greater religion. Following chants, each for its kind I sing. My comrade, for you to share with me two greatnesses and a third one rising inclusive and more resplendent, the greatness of love and democracy and the greatness of religion. Melange mine own, the unseen and the seen, mysterious ocean where the streams empty, prophetic spirit of materials shifting and flickering around me, living beings, identities now doubtless near us in the air that we know not of. Contact daily and hourly that will not release me. These selecting, these hints demanded of me. Not he with a daily kiss onward from the childhood kissing me has winded and twisted around me that which holds me to him. 
any more than I am held to the heavens and all the spiritual world after what they have done to me, suggesting themes. Oh, such themes, equalities, oh, divine average, warblings under the sun, ushered as now, or at noon, or setting, strains musical flowing through ages, now reaching hither, I take to your reckless and composite chords, add to them, and cheerfully pass them forward. Eleven. As I have walked in Alabama, my morning walk, I've seen where the she-bird, the mockingbird, sat on her nest in the briars hatching her brood. I've seen the he-bird also, I have paused to hear him near at hand inflating his throat and joyfully singing. And while I paused, it came to me that what he really sang for was not there only, nor for his mate, nor himself only, nor all sent back by the echoes, but subtle, clandestine, away beyond, a charge transmitted and gift occult for those being born. Twelve. Democracy. Near at hand to you a throat is now inflating itself and joyfully singing. Ma femme. For the brood beyond us and of us. For those who belong here and those to come. I exultant to be ready for them and will now shake out carols stronger and haughtier than ever have yet been heard upon earth. I will make the songs of passion to give them their way and your songs outlaw defenders for I scan you with kindred eyes and carry you with me the same as any. I will make the true poem of riches to earn for the body and the mind whatever adheres and goes forward and is not dropped by death. I will effuse egotism and show it underlying all, and I will be the bard of personality. And I will show of male and female that either is but the equal of the other, and sexual organs and acts. Do you concentrate in me, for I am determined to tell you with courageous, clear voice to prove you illustrious. And I will show that there is no imperfection in the present and can be none in the future. And I will show that whatever happens to anybody, it may be turned to beautiful results. And I will show that nothing can happen more beautiful than death. I will thread a thread through my poems that time and events are compact and that all the things of the universe are perfect miracles, each as profound as any. I will not make poems with reference to parts, but I will make poems, songs, thoughts with reference to ensemble. And I will not sing with reference to a day, but with reference to all days. And I will not make a poem, nor the least part of a poem, but has reference to the soul. Because having looked at the objects of the universe, I find there is no one, nor any particle of one, but has reference to the soul. Thirteen. Was somebody asking to see the soul? See your own shape and continence, persons, substances, beasts, the trees, the running rivers, the rocks and sands. All hold spiritual joys and afterwards loosen them. 
How can the real body ever die and be buried? Of your real body and any man's or woman's real body, item for item, it will elude the hands of the corpse cleaners and pass to fitting spheres, carrying what has accrued to it from the moment of birth to the moment of death. Not the types set up by the printer return their impression, the meaning, the main concern, any more than a man's substance and life, or a woman's substance and life, return in the body and the soul, indifferently before death and after death. Behold, the body includes and is the meaning, the main concern, and includes and is the soul. Whoever you are, how superb and how divine is your body, or any part of it. 14. Whoever you are, to you, endless announcement. Daughter of the lands, did you wait for your poet? Did you wait for one with a flowering mouth and indicative hand? Toward the male of the states and toward the female of the states, exulting words, words to democracy's lands. Interlinked, food-yielding lands. Land of coal and iron, land of gold, land of cotton, sugar, rice, land of wheat, beef, pork, land of wool and hemp, land of the apple and the grape, land of the pastoral plains and the grass fields of the world, land of those sweet, teared, interminable plateaus, Land of the herd, the garden, the healthy house of adobe. Land where the northwest Columbia winds, where the southwest Colorado winds. Land of the eastern Chesapeake, land of the Delaware, land of Ontario, Erie, Huron, Michigan. Land of the old 13, Massachusetts land. Land of Vermont land of Connecticut, land of the ocean shores, land of sierras and peaks, land of boatmen and sailors, fishermen's land, inextricable lands, the clutched together, the passionate ones, the side by side, the elder and younger brothers, the bony land, the great woman's land, the feminine, the experienced sisters and the inexperienced sisters, far breath land, arctic braced, Mexican breeze, the diverse, the compact, the Pennsylvanian, the Virginian, the double Carolinian. Oh, all and each well loved by me, my intrepid nations. Oh, I at any rate include you all with perfect love. I cannot be discharged from you, not from one any sooner than another. Oh, death, oh, for all that, I am yet of you unseen this hour with irrepressible love. Walking New England, a friend, a traveler, splashing my bare feet in the edge of the summer ripples on Pomenot sands, crossing the prairies, dwelling again in Chicago, dwelling in every town, observing shows, births, improvements, structures, arts, listening to orators, 
and oratresses in public halls. Of and through the states is during life each man and woman in my neighborhood. The Louisiana, the Georgian, as near to me and as near to him and her. The Mississippian and the Arkansian, yet with me, and I yet with any of them. Yet upon the plains west of the Spinal River, yet in my house of Adobe, yet returning eastward, yet in the seaside state or in Maryland, yet Canadian cheerily braving the winter, the snow and ice welcome to me, yet a true son either of Maine or of the Granite State, or the Narragansett Bay State or the Empire State, yet sailing to other shores to annex the same, yet welcoming every new brother, hereby applying these leaves to the new ones from the hour they unite with the old ones, coming among the new ones myself to be their companion and equal, coming personally to you now, in joining me to acts, character, Fifteen. With me, with firm holding, yet haste, haste on, for your life adhere to me. I may have to be persuaded many times before I consent to give myself really to you. But what of that? Must not nature be persuaded many times? No dainty dolce affettuoso I, bearded, sunburnt, gray-necked, forbidding. I have arrived to be wrestled with as I pass for the solid prizes of the universe. For such I afford whoever can preserve to win them. Sixteen. On my way a moment I pause here for you, and here for America. Still the present I raise a law, still the future of the states I harbor, glad and sublime. And for the past I pronounce what the air holds of the red aborigines. The red aborigines, living natural breath, sound of rain and wind, Calls as of the birds and animals in the woods. Syllable to us for names. Okoni, Kusa, Ottawa, Mano Gahela, South. Oronoco, Wabash, Miami, Saginaw, Chippewa, Oshkosh, Walla Walla. Leaving such to states they melt, they depart, charging the water and the land. Seventeen. Expanding and swift, henceforth. Elements, breeds, adjustments, turbulent, quick, and audacious. A world primal again. Vistas of glory, incessant, and branching. A new race dominating previous ones and grander far. With new contests, new politics, new literatures and religions, new inventions and art. These my voice announcing, I will sleep no more, but arise. You oceans that have been calm within me, how I feel you. Fathomless, stirring, preparing unprecedented waves and storms. Eighteen. Sea, steamers, steaming through my poems. See, 
In my poems, immigrants continually coming and landing. See in arriere the wigwam, the trail, the hunter's hut, the flatboat, the maize leaf, the claim, the rude fence, and the backwoods village. See on the one side the western sea, and on the other the eastern sea. How they advance and retreat upon my poems as upon their own shores. See pastures and forests in my poems. See animals wild and tame. See beyond the caw countless herds of buffalo feeding on short curly grass. See in my poems cities solid, vast, inland, with paved streets, with iron and stone edifices, ceaseless vehicles and commerce, see the many cylindered steam printing press, see the electric telegraph stretching across the continent, see through Atlantica's depths, pulses American, Europe, reaching pulses of Europe duly returned. See the strong and quick locomotive as it departs, panting, blowing, the steam whistle. See plowmen plowing farms. See miners digging mines. See the numberless factories. See mechanics busy at their benches with tools. See from among them superior judges, philosophs, presidents emerge dressed in working dresses. See lounging through the shops and fields of the states, me, well beloved, close held by day and night. Hear the loud echoes of my songs there. Read the hints come at last. Nineteen. O camarado close. O you and me at last, and us two only. O a word to clear one's path ahead endlessly. O something ecstatic and undemonstrable. O music wild. Oh, now I triumph, and you shall also. Oh, hand in hand. Oh, wholesome pleasure. Oh, one more desirer and lover. Oh, to haste. Firm holding. To haste. Haste on with me. Of book two. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Book three. Song of Myself. One. I celebrate myself and sing myself, and what I assume you shall assume. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you, I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, observing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air, Born here of parents, born here from parents the same, and their parents the same. I, now thirty-seven years old, in perfect health begin, hoping to cease not till death. Creeds and schools and abeyance, retiring back a while sufficed at what they are, but never forgotten. I harbor for good or bad. I permit to speak at every hazard, nature without check, with original energy. Two. 
Houses and rooms are full of perfumes. The shelves are crowded with perfumes. I breathe the fragrance myself and know it and like it. The distillation would intoxicate me also, but I shall not let it. The atmosphere is not a perfume. It has no taste of the distillation. It is odorless. It is for my mouth forever. I am in love with it. I will go to the bank by the wood and become undisguised and naked. I am mad for it to be in contact with me. The smoke of my own breath echoes, ripples, buzzed whispers, love root, silk thread, crotch, and vine. My respiration and inspiration, the beating of my heart, the passing of blood and air through my lungs, the sniff of green leaves and dry leaves, and of the shore and dark-colored sea rocks, and of hay in the barn. The sound of the belched words of my voice loosed to the eddies of the wind. A few light kisses, a few embraces, a reaching around of arms. The play of shine and shade on the trees as the supple boughs wag. The delight alone or in the rush of the streets or along the fields and hillsides feeling of health, the full noon trill, the sound of me rising from bed and meeting the sun. Have you reckoned a thousand acres much? Have you reckoned the earth much? Have you practiced so long to learn to read? Have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? Stop this day and night with me, and you shall possess the origin of all poems. You shall possess the good of the earth and sun. There are millions of suns left. You shall no longer take things at second or third hand, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters in books. You shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. Three. I have heard what the talkers are talking, the talk of the beginning and the end, but I do not talk of the beginning or the end. There was never any more inception than there is now, nor any more youth or age than there is now, and will never be any more perfection than there is now, nor any more heaven or hell than there is now. Urge and urge and urge, always the procreant urge of the world. Out of the dimness, opposite equals advance, always substance and increase, always sex, always a knit of identity, always distinction, always a breed of life. To elaborate is no avail, learned and unlearned feel that it is so. Sure as the most certain sure, plumb in the uprights, well entreated, Braced in the beams, stout as a horse, affectionate, haughty, 
electrical. I and this mystery, here we stand. Clear and sweet is my soul, and clear and sweet is all that is not my soul. Black one lacks both, and the unseen is proved by the seen, till that becomes unseen and receives proof in its turn. Showing the best and dividing it from the worst. Age vexes age. Knowing the perfect fitness and equanimity of things, while they discuss, I am silent and go bathe and admire myself. Welcome is every organ and attribute of me and of any man hearty and clean. Not an inch, nor a particle of an inch, is vile, and none shall be less familiar than the rest. I am satisfied. I see, dance, laugh, sing. As the hugging and loving bedfellow sleeps at my side through the night, withdraws at the peep of the day with stealthy tread, leaving me baskets covered with white towels, swelling the house with their plenty. Shall I postpone my acceptation and realization and scream at my eyes that they turn from gazing after and down the road? and forthwith cipher and show me to assent exactly the value of one and exactly the value of two and which is ahead? Four. Trippers and askers surround me. People I meet. The effect upon me of my early life or the ward and city I live in or the nation, the latest dates, discoveries, inventions, societies, authors, old and new, my dinner, dress, associates, looks, compliments, dues, the real or fancied indifference of some man or woman I love, the sickness of one of my folks or of myself, or ill-doing or loss or lack of money or depressions or exaltations, battles, the horrors of fratricidal war, the fever of doubtful news, the fitful events. These come to me days and nights and go from me again, but they are not the me myself. Apart from the pulling and hauling stands what I am, stands amused, complacent, compassionating, idle, unitary, looks down, is erect, or bends an arm on an impalpable certain rest, looking with side-curved head, curious what will come next, both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it. Backward I see in my own days where I sweated through fog with linguists and contenders. I have no mockings or arguments. I witness and wait. Five. I believe in you, my soul. The other I am must not abase itself to you, and you must not be abased to the other. Loaf with me on the grass. Loose the stop from your throat. Not words, not music or rhyme I want, not custom or lecture, not even the best. Only the lull I like. The hum of your valved voice. I mind how once we lay such a transparent summer morning, how you settled your head athwart my hips and gently turned over upon me 
and parted the shirt from my bosom bone and plunged your tongue to my bare stripped heart and reached till you felt my beard and reached till you held my feet swiftly arose and spread around me the peace and knowledge that pass all the argument of the earth and I know that the hand of God is the promise of my own and I know that the spirit of God is the brother of my own and that all the men ever born are also my brothers and the women my sisters and lovers and that a kelson of the creation is love and limitless are leaves stiff or drooping in the fields and brown ants in the little wells beneath them and mossy scabs of the worm vents heaped stones elder mullein and pokeweed six a child said what is the grass fetching it to me with full hands how could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. I guess it must be the flag of my disposition, out of hopeful green stuff woven. Or I guess it is the handkerchief of the Lord, a scented gift and remembrancer designedly dropped, bearing the owner's name some way in the corners that we may see and remark and say, whose? Or I guess the grass is itself a child, the produced babe of the vegetation. Or I guess it is a uniform hieroglyphic, and it means sprouting alike in broad zones and narrow zones, growing among black folks as among white, Canuck, Tuckahoe, Congressman Cuff, I give them the same. I receive them the same. And now it seems to me the beautiful uncut hair of graves. Tenderly will I use you curling grass. It may be you transpire from the breasts of young men. It may be if I had known them I would have loved them. From old people, or from offspring taken soon out of their mother's laps. And here you are the mother's laps. This grass is very dark to be from the white heads of old mothers, darker than the colorless beards of old men, dark to come from under the faint red roofs of mouths. I perceive after all so many uttering tongues, and I perceive they do not come from the roofs of mouths for nothing. I wish I could translate the hints about the dead young men and women, and the hints about old men and mothers, and the offspring taken soon out of their laps. What do you think has become of the young and old men? And what do you think has become of the women and children? They are alive and well somewhere. The smallest sprout shows there is really no death. And if ever there was, it led forward life and does not wait at the end to arrest it and ceased the moment life appeared. All goes onward and outward nothing collapses and to die is different from what anyone supposed and luckier seven has anyone supposed it lucky to be born I hasten to inform him or her it is just as lucky to die and I know it I pass death with the dying 
and am not contained between my hat and boots, and peruse manifold objects, no two alike, and every one good. The earth, good, and the stars, good, and their adjuncts, all good. I am not an earth, nor an adjunct of an earth. I am the mate and companion of people, all just as immortal and fathomless as myself. They do not know how immortal, but I know. Every kind for itself and its own, for me, mine, male and female. For me, those that have been boys and that love women. For me, the man that is proud and feels how it stings to be slighted. For me, the sweetheart and the old maid. For me, mothers and the mothers of mothers. For me, lips that have smiled eyes that have shed tears, for me, children and the begetters of children. Undrape, you are not guilty to me, nor stale, nor discarded. I see through the broadcloth and gingham, whether or no, and am around, tenacious, acquisitive, tireless, and cannot shaken away. 8. The little one sleeps in its cradle. I lift the gauze and look a long time and silently brush away flies with my hand. The youngster and the red-faced girl turn aside up the bushy hill. I peeringly view them from the top the suicide sprawls on the bloody floor of the bedroom. I witness the corpse with its dabbled hair. I note where the pistol has fallen. The blab of the pave, tires of carts, slough of boot soles, talk of the promenaders, the heavy omnibus, the driver with his interrogating thumb the clank of the shod horses on the granite floor, the snow sleighs clinking, shouted jokes, pelts of snowballs, the hurrahs for popular favorites, the fury of roused mobs, the flap of the curtained litter, a sick man inside, born to the hospital, the meeting of enemies, the sudden oath the blows and fall, the excited crowd, the policeman with his star quickly working his passage to the center of the crowd, the impassive stones that receive and return so many echoes, what groans of overfed or half-starved who fall sunstruck or in fits, exclamations of women taken suddenly who hurry home and give birth to babes. What living and buried speech is always vibrating here? What howls restrained by decorum? Arrests of criminals, slights, adulterous offers made, acceptances, rejections, with convex lips. I mind them, or the show, or resonance of them. I come, and I depart. The big doors of the country barn stand open and ready. The dried grass of the harvest time loads the slow-drawn wagon. The clear light plays on the brown, gray, and green intertinged the armfuls are packed to the sagging mow. I am there. I help. I came stretched atop of the load. I felt its soft jolts. One leg reclined on the other. 
I jump from the crossbeams and seize the clover and timothy and roll head over heels and tangle my hair full of wisps. Ten. Alone, far in the wilds and mountains, I hunt, wandering amazed at my own lightness and glee. In the late afternoon, choosing a safe spot to pass the night, kindling a fire and broiling the fresh killed game, falling asleep on the gathered leaves with my dog and gun by my side. The Yankee Clipper is under her sky sails. She cuts the sparkle and scud. My eyes settle the land. I bend at her prow or shout joyously from the deck. The boatmen and clam diggers arose early and stopped for me. I tucked my trouser ends in my boots and went and had a good time. You should have been with us that day round the chowder kettle. I saw the marriage of the trapper in the open air in the far west. The bride was a red girl. Her father and his friends sat near, cross-legged and dumbly smoking. They had moccasins to their feet and large, thick blankets hanging from their shoulders. On a bank lounged the trapper. He was dressed mostly in skins. His luxuriant beard and curls protected his neck. He held his bride by the hand. She had long eyelashes. Her head was bare. Her coarse, straight locks descended upon her voluptuous limbs and reached to her feet. The runaway slave came to my house and stopped outside. I heard his motions crackling the twigs of the woodpile. Through the swung half-door of the kitchen I saw him, limpsy and weak, and went where he sat on a log, and led him in, and assured him, and brought water and filled a tub for his sweated body and bruised feet, and gave him a room that entered from my own, and gave him some coarse, clean clothes, and remember perfectly well his revolving eyes and his awkwardness, and remember putting plasters on the galls of his neck and ankles. He stayed with me a week before he was recuperated and passed north. I had him sit next to me at table. My firelock leaned in the corner. Eleven. Twenty-eight young men bathed by the shore, Twenty-eight young men and all so friendly. Twenty-eight years of womanly life and all so lonesome. She owns the fine house by the rise of the bank. She hides handsome and richly dressed aft the blinds of the window. Which of the young men does she like the best? Ah, the homeliest of them is beautiful to her. Where are you off to, lady? for I see you. You splash in the water there, yet stay stock still in your room. Dancing and laughing along the beach came the twenty-ninth bather. The rest did not see her, but she saw them and loved them. The beards of the young men glistened with wet. They ran from their long hair. Little streams passed all over their bodies. An unseen hand also passed over their bodies. It descended tremblingly from their temples and ribs. The young men float on their backs. Their white bellies bulge to the sun. They do not ask who seizes fast to them. They do not know who puffs and declines with pendant and bending arch. They do not think whom they souse with spray. Twelve. The butcher boy puts off his killing clothes or sharpens his knife at the stall in the market. I loiter, enjoying his repartee and his shuffle and breakdown. 
blacksmiths with grind and hairy chests, and Byron the anvil. Each has his main sledge. They are all out. There is great heat in the fire. From the cinder-strewed threshold, I follow their movements. The lithe sheer of their waists plays even with their massive arms. Overhand, the hammer swing. Overhand, so slow. Overhand, so sure. They do not hasten. Each man hits in his place. Thirteen. The Negro holds firmly the reins of his four horses. The block swags underneath on its tied over chain. The Negro that drives the long dray of the stone yard. Steady and tall, he stands poised on one leg on the string piece. His blue shirt exposes his ample neck and breast and loosens over his hip band. His glance is calm and commanding. He tosses the slouch of his hat away from his forehead. The sun falls on his crispy hair and mustache, falls on the black of his polished and perfect limbs. I behold the picturesque giant and love him. And I do not stop there. I go with the team also. In me, the caresser of life, wherever moving, backward as well as forward slewing, to niches aside and junior bending, not a person or object missing, absorbing all to myself and for this song. Oxen, that rattle the yoke and chain, or halt in the leafy shade. What is that you express in your eyes? It seems to me more than all the print I have read in my life. My tread scares the wood drake and wood duck on my distant and day-long ramble. They rise together. They slowly circle around. I believe in those winged purposes and acknowledge red, yellow, white playing within me and consider green and violet and the tufted crown intentional and do not call the tortoise unworthy because she is not something else and that in the woods never studied the gamut yet trills pretty well to me and the look of the bay mare Shame's silliness out of me. Fourteen. The wild gander leads his flock through the cool night. Yahonk, he says, and sounds it down to me like an invitation. The pert may suppose it meaningless, but I, listening close, find its purpose and place up there toward the wintry sky. The sharp-hoofed moose of the north, the cat on the house sill, the chickadee, the prairie dog, the litter of the grunting sow as they tug at her teats, the brood of the turkey hen, and she with her half-spread wings. I see in them and myself the same old law. The press of my foot to the earth springs a hundred affections. They scorn the best I can do to relate them. I am enamored of growing outdoors, of men that live among cattle, or taste of the ocean, or woods, of the builders and steerers of ships, and the wielders of axes and mauls, and the drivers of horses. I can eat and sleep with them week in and week out. What is commonest, cheapest, nearest, easiest, is me, me going in for my chances, spending for vast returns, adorning myself to bestow myself on the first that will take me, not asking the sky to come down to my goodwill, scattering it freely forever. 15. The pure contralto sings in the organ loft, 
The carpenter dresses his plank. The tongue of his foreplane whistles its wild ascending lisp. The married and unmarried children ride home to their Thanksgiving dinner. The pilot seizes the kingpin. He heaves down with a strong arm. The mate stands braced in the whaleboat. Lance and harpoon are ready. The duck shooter walks by silent and cautious stretches. The deacons are ordained with crossed hands at the altar. The spinning girl retreats and advances to the hum of the big wheel. The farmer stops by the bars as he walks on a first day loaf and looks at the oats and rye. The lunatic is carried at last to the asylum, a confirmed case. He will never sleep any more as he did in the cot in his mother's bedroom. The jour printer, with gray head and gaunt jaws, works at his case. He turns his quid of tobacco while his eyes blur with the manuscript. The malformed limbs are tied to the surgeon's table. What is removed drops horribly in a pail. The quadroon girl is sold at the auction stand. The drunkard nods by the barroom stove. The machinist rolls up his sleeves. The policeman travels his beat. The gatekeeper marks who pass. The young fellow drives the express wagon. I love him, though I do not know him. The half-breed straps on his light boots to compete in the race. The western turkey shooting draws old and young. Some lean on their rifles, some sit on logs. Out from the crowd steps the marksman, takes his position, levels his piece. The groups of newly come immigrants cover the wharf or levee. As the woolly pates hoe in the sugar field, the overseer views them from his saddle. The bugle calls in the ballroom. The gentlemen run for their partners. The dancers bow to each other. The youth lies awake in the cedar-roofed garret and harks to the musical rain. The wolverine sets traps on the creek that helps fill the Huron. The squaw, wrapped in her yellow-hemmed cloth, is offering moccasins and bead bags for sale. The connoisseur peers along the exhibition gallery with half-shut eyes bent sideways. As the deck hands make fast to the steamboat, the plank is thrown for the shore-going passengers. The young sister holds out the skein while the elder sister winds it off in a ball and stops now and then for the knots. The one-year wife is recovering and happy, having a week ago born her first child. The clean-haired Yankee girl works with her sewing machine, or in the factory or mill. The paving man leans on his two-handed rammer. The reporter's lead flies swiftly over the notebook. The sign painter is lettering with blue and gold. The canal boy trots on the towpath. The bookkeeper counts at his desk. The shoemaker waxes his thread. The conductor beats time for the band, and all the performers follow him. The child is baptized. The convert is making his first professions. The regatta is spread on the bay. The race is begun. How the white sails sparkle. The drover, watching his drove, sings out to them that would stray. The peddler sweats with his pack on his back, the purchaser higgling about the odd scent. The bride unrumples her white dress. The minute hand of the clock moves slowly. The opium eater reclines with rigid head and just opened lips. The prostitute draggles her shawl. Her bonnet bobs on her tipsy and pimpled neck. The crowd laugh at her blackguard oaths. 
The men jeer and wink to each other. Miserable. I do not laugh at your oaths, nor jeer you. The president, holding a cabinet council, is surrounded by the great secretaries. On the piazza walk, three matrons stately and friendly with twined arms. The crew of the fish smack pack repeated layers of halibut in the hold. The Missourian crosses the plains, toting his wares and his cattle. As the fare collector goes through the train, he gives notice by the jingling of loose change. The floor men are laying the floor. The tinners are tinning the roof. The masons are calling for mortar. In single file, each shouldering his hod, pass onward the laborers. Seasons pursuing each other, the indescribable crowd is gathered. It is the fourth of seventh month. What salutes of cannon and small arms. Seasons pursuing each other, the plower plows, the mower mows, and the winter grain falls in the ground. Off on the lakes, the pike fisher watches and waits by the hole in the frozen surface. The stumps stand thick round the clearing. The squatter strikes deep with his axe. Flat boatmen make fast towards dusk near the cottonwood or pecan trees. Coon seekers go through the regions of the Red River or through those drained by the Tennessee or through those of the Arkansas. Torches shine in the dark that hangs on the Chattahooch or Altamaha. Patriarchs sit at supper with sons and grandsons and great-grandsons around them. In walls of adobe, in canvas tents, rest hunters and trappers after their day's sport. The city sleeps, and the country sleeps. The living sleep for their time, the dead sleep for their time. The old husband sleeps by his wife, and the young husband sleeps by his wife. And these tend inward to me, and I tend outward to them. And such as it is, to be of these more or less I am, and of these one and all, I weave the song of myself. 16. I am of old and young, of the foolish as much as the wise, regardless of others, ever regardful of others, maternal as well as paternal, a child as well as a man, stuffed with the stuff that is coarse and stuffed with the stuff that is fine. One of the nation of many nations, the smallest, the same, and the largest, the same. A southerner, soon as a northerner, a planter nonchalant and hospitable, down by the Okanee I live. A Yankee bound my own way, ready for trade, my joints the limberest joints on earth, and the sternest joints on earth. A Kentuckian walking the veil of the Elkhorn in my deerskin leggings. A Louisianian or Georgian. A boatman over lakes or bays or along coasts. A Hoosier, Badger, Buckeye. At home on Canadian snowshoes or up in the bush or with fishermen off Newfoundland. At home in the fleet of ice boats sailing with the rest and tracking at home on the hills of Vermont or in the woods of Maine or the Texan ranch. Comrade of Californians, comrade of free Northwesterners, loving their big proportions. Comrade of raftsmen and coal men. Comrade of all who shake hands and welcome to drink and meet. A learner with the simplest a teacher of the thoughtfulest, a novice beginning, yet experient of myriads of seasons, of every hue and caste 
am I? Of every rank and religion. A farmer, mechanic, artist, gentleman, sailor, Quaker, prisoner, fancy man, rowdy, lawyer, physician, priest. I resist anything better than my own diversity. Breathe the air, but leave plenty after me. And I'm not stuck up, and I'm in my place. The moth and the fish eggs are in their place. The bright suns I see and the dark suns I cannot see are in their place. The palpable is in its place and the impalpable is in its place. 17. These are really the thoughts of all men in all ages and lands. They are not original with me. If they are not yours as much as mine, they are nothing, or next to nothing. If they are not the riddle and the untying of the riddle, they are nothing. If they are not just as close as they are distant, they are nothing. This is the grass that grows wherever the land is and the water is. This is the common air that bathes the globe. 18. With music strong I come, with my cornets and my drums. I play not marches for accepted victors only. I play marches for conquered and slain persons. Have you heard that it was good to gain the day? I also say it is good to fall. Battles are lost in the same spirit in which they are won. I beat and pound for the dead. I blow through my embouchures my loudest and gayest for them. Vivas to those who have failed, and to those whose war vessels sank in the sea, and to those themselves who sank in the sea, and to all generals that lost engagements, and all overcome heroes, and the numberless unknown heroes, equal to the greatest heroes known. 19. This is the meal equally set. This the meat for natural hunger. It is for the wicked, just same as the righteous. I make appointments with all. I will not have a single person slighted or left away. The kept woman, sponger, thief are hereby invited. The heavy-lipped slave is invited. The venerially is invited. There shall be no difference between them and the rest. This is the press of a bashful hand. This the float and odor of hair. This the touch of my lips to yours. This the murmur of yearning. This the far off depth and height reflecting my own face. This the thoughtful merge of myself and the outlet again. Do you guess I have some intricate purpose? Well, I have. For the fourth month, showers have, and the mica on the side of a rock has. Do you take it I would astonish? Does the daylight astonish? Does the early red start twittering through the woods? Do I astonish more than they? This hour, I tell things in confidence. I might not tell everybody, but I will tell you. 20. Who goes there? Hankering, gross, mystical, nude. How is it I extract strength 
from the beef island. What is a man anyhow? What am I? What are you? All I mark is my own, you shall offset it with your own. Else it were time lost listening to me. I do not snivel that snivel the world over, that months are vacuums, and the ground but wallow and filth, whimpering and truckling fold with powders for invalids. Conformity goes to the fourth remove. I wear my hat as I please, indoors or out. Why should I pray? Why should I venerate and be ceremonious? Having pried through the strata, analyzed to a hair, counseled with doctors and calculated close, I find no sweeter fat than sticks to my own bones. In all people, I see myself. None more and not one a barley corn less. And the good or bad I say of myself, I say of them. I know I am solid and sound. To me, the converging objects of the universe perpetually flow. All are written to me, and I must get what the writing means. I know I am deathless. I know this orbit of mine cannot be swept by a carpenter's compass. I know I shall not pass like a child's carlicue cut with a burnt stick at night. I know I am August. I do not trouble my spirit to vindicate itself or be understood. I see that the elementary laws never apologize. I reckon I behave no prouder than the level I plant my house by, after all. I exist as I am. That is enough. If no other in the world be aware, I sit content. And if each and all be aware, I sit content. One world is aware, and by far the largest to me, and that is myself. And whether I come to my own today, or in 10,000 or 10 million years, I can cheerfully take it now, or with equal cheerfulness, I can wait. My foothold is tenoned and mortised in granite. I laugh at what you call dissolution, and I know the amplitude of time. 21. I am the poet of the body, and I am the poet of the soul. The pleasures of heaven are with me, and the pains of hell are with me. The first I graft and increase upon myself. The latter I translate into new tongue. I am the poet of the woman, the same as the man. And I say it is as great to be a woman as to be a man. And I say there is nothing greater than the mother of men. I chant the chant of dilation or pride. We have had ducking and deprecating about enough. I show that size is only development. Have you outstripped the rest? Are you the president? It is a trifle. They will more than arrive there every one and still pass on. I am he that walks with the tender and growing night. I call to the earth and sea, half held by the night. Press close, bare bosom night. Press close, magnetic, nourishing night. Night of south winds, 
night of the large few stars, still nodding night, mad naked summer night, smile, O voluptuous cool breathed earth, earth of the slumbering and liquid trees, earth of the departed sunset, earth of the mountain's misty top, earth of the vitreous pour of the full moon just tinged with blue, earth of shine and dark mottling the tide of the river, earth of the limpid gray of clouds, brighter and clearer for my sake. Far swooping elbowed earth, rich apple blossomed earth, smile for your lover comes. Prodigal, you have given me love, therefore I to you give love. Oh, unspeakable, passionate. Love. 22. You, see, I resign myself to you also. I guess what you mean. I behold from the beach your crooked fingers. I believe you refuse to go back without feeling of me. We must have a turn together. I undress. Hurry me out of sight of the land. Cushion me soft. Rock me in billowy drowse, Dash me with amorous wet, I can repay you. Sea of stretched ground swells, Sea breathing broad and convulsive breaths, Sea of the brine of life, And of unshoveled yet always ready graves, Howler and scooper of storms, Capricious and dainty sea. I am integral with you. I, too, am of one phase and of all phases. Partaker of influx and efflux I. Extoler of hate and conciliation. Extoler of amis and those that sleep in each other's arms. I am he, attesting sympathy. Shall I make my list of things in the house and skip the house that supports them? I am not the poet of goodness only. I do not decline to be the poet of wickedness also. What blurt is this about virtue and about vice? Evil propels me, and reform of evil propels me. I stand indifferent. My gate is no fault finders or rejecters gate. I moisten the roots of all that has grown. Did you fear some scrofula out of the unflagging pregnancy? Did you guess? The celestial laws are yet to be worked over and rectified. I find one side a balance, and the antipodal side a balance. Soft doctrine as steady help as stable doctrine. Thoughts and deeds of the present are rouse and early start. This minute that comes to me over the past decillions. There is no better than it and now. What behaved well in the past or behaves well today is not such wonder. The wonder is always and always how there can be a mean man or an infidel. 23. Endless unfolding of words of ages. And mine, a word of the modern, 
the word on mass, a word of the faith that never balks. Here or henceforward, it is all the same to me. I accept time absolutely. It alone is without flaw. It alone rounds and completes all. That mystic baffling wonder alone completes all. I accept reality and dare not question it. Materialism, first and last imbuing. Hurrah for positive science. Long live exact demonstration. Fetch stone crop mixed with cedar and branches of lilac. This is the lexicographer. This is the chemist. This made a grammar of the old cartouches. These mariners put the ship through dangerous unknown seas. This is the geologist. This works with the scalper. And this is a mathematician. Gentlemen, to you the first honors always. Your facts are useful, and yet they are not my dwelling. I but enter by them to an area of my dwelling. Less the reminders of properties told my words, and more the reminders they of life untold, and of freedom and extrication, and make short account of neuters and geldings, and favor men and women fully equipped, and beat the gong of revolt, and stop with fugitives and them that plot and conspire. 24. Walt Whitman, a cosmos of Manhattan the sun, turbulent, fleshy, sensual, eating, drinking, and breeding. No sentimentalist, no stander above men and women or apart from them, no more modest than immodest. Unscrew the locks from the doors, unscrews the doors themselves from their jams. Whoever degrades another degrades me, and whatever is done or said returns at last to me. Through me, the afflatus surging and surging. Through me, the current and index. I speak the password primeval. I give the sign of democracy. By God, I will accept nothing which all cannot have their counterpart of on the same terms. Through me, many long, dumb voices, voices of the interminable generations of prisoners and slaves, voices of the diseased and despairing, and of thieves and dwarves, voices of cycles of preparation and accretion, and of the threads that connect the stars, and of wombs, and of the father's stuff, and of the rights of them that others are down upon, of the deformed, trivial, flat, foolish, despised, fog in the air, beetles, rolling balls of dung. Through me, forbidden voices, voices of sexes and lusts, voices veiled and I remove the veil. Voices indecent, by me clarified and transfigured. I do not press my fingers across my mouth. I keep as delicate around the bowels as around the head and heart. Copulation is no more rank to me than death is. I believe in the flesh and the appetites. Seeing, hearing, feeling are miracles, and each part and tag of me 
is a miracle. Divine am I, inside and out. And I make holy whatever I touch or am touched from. The scent of these armpits, aroma finer than prayer. This head, more than churches, Bibles, and all the creeds. If I worship one thing more than another, it shall be the spread of my own body, or any part of it. Translucent mold of me, it shall be you. Shaded ledges and rests, it shall be you. Firm, masculine coulter, it shall be you. Whatever goes to the tilth of me, it shall be you. You, my rich blood, your milky stream, pale strippings of my life, breast that presses against other breasts, it shall be you. My brain, it shall be your occult convolutions, root of washed sweet flag, timorous pond snipe, nest of guarded duplicate eggs, it shall be you. Mixed tussled hay of head, beard brawn, it shall be you. Trickling sap of maple, fiber of manly wheat, it shall be you. Sun so generous, it shall be you. Vapors lighting and shading my face, it shall be you. You sweaty brooks and dews, it shall be you. Winds whose soft tickling genitals rub against me, it shall be you. Broad muscular fields, branches of live oak, loving lounger in my winding paths, it shall be you. Hands I have taken, face I have kissed, mortal I have ever touched, it shall be you. I dote on myself. There is that lot of me, and all so luscious. Each moment, and whatever happens, thrills me with joy. I cannot tell how my ankles bend, nor whence the cause of my faintest wish, nor the cause of the friendship I emit, nor the cause of the friendship I take again. That I walk, up my stoop, I pause to consider if it really be a morning glory at my window satisfies me more than the metaphysics of books. To behold the daybreak, the little light fades the immense and diaphanous shadows. The air tastes good to my palate hefts of the moving world at innocent gambols, silently rising, freshly exuding, scooting obliquely, high and low. Something I cannot see puts upward libidinous prongs, seas of bright juice suffuse heaven, the earth by the sky stayed with the daily close of their junction. The heaved challenge from the east that moment over my head. The mocking taunt. See then whether you shall be master. 25. Dazzling and tremendous how quick the sunrise would kill me if I could not now and always send sunrise out of me. We also, 
ascend, dazzling and tremendous as the sun. We found our own, oh my soul, in the calm and cool of the daybreak. My voice goes after what my eyes cannot reach. With the twirl of my tongue, I encompass worlds and volumes of worlds. Speech is the twin of my vision. It is unequal to measure itself. It provokes me forever. It says sarcastically, Walt, you contain enough. Why don't you let it out then? Come now. I will not be tantalized. You conceive too much of articulation. Do you not know, O oh speech, how the buds beneath you are folded? Waiting in gloom, protected by frost, the dirt receding before my prophetical screams, I underlying causes to balance them at last. My knowledge, my live parts, it keeping tally with the meaning of all things. Happiness, which whoever hears me, let him or her set out in search of this day. My final merit, I refuse you. I refuse putting from me what I really am. Encompass worlds, but never try to encompass me. I crowd your sleekest and best by simply looking toward you. Writing and talk do not prove me. I carry the plenum of proof and everything else in my face. With the hush of my lips, I wholly confound the skeptic. 26. Now I will do nothing but listen to accrue what I hear into this song, to let sounds contribute toward it. I hear bravuras of birds, bustle of growing wheat, gossip of flames, clack of sticks cooking my meals. I hear the sound I love, the sound of the human voice. I hear all sounds running together, combined, fused, or following. Sounds of the city and sounds out of the city. Sounds of the day and night. Talkative young ones to those that like them. The loud laugh of work people at their meals. The angry bass of disjointed friendship. The faint tones of the sick. The judge with hands tight to the desk. His pallid lips pronouncing a death sentence. The heave yo of stevedores unlading ships by the wharves the refrain of the anchor lifters, the ring of alarm bells, the cry of fire, the whir of swift streaking engines and hose carts with premonitory tinkles and colored lights, the steam whistle, the solid roll of the train of approaching cars, the slow march played at the head of the association marching two and two. They go to guard some corpse. The flag tops are draped with black muslin. I hear the violoncello. Tis the young man's heart's complaint. I hear the keyed cornet. It glides quickly in through my ears. It shakes mad sweet pangs through my belly and breast. I hear the chorus. It is a grand opera. Ah, this indeed is music 
This suits me. A tenor, large and fresh as the creation, fills me. The orbic flex of his mouth is pouring and filling me full. I hear the trained soprano. What work with hers is this? The orchestra whirls me wider than Uranus flies. It wrenches such ardors from me. I did not know I possessed them. It sails me. I dab with bare feet. They are licked by the indolent waves. I am cut by bitter and angry hail. I lose my breath, steeped amid honeyed morphine. My windpipe throttled in fakes of death. At length, let up again to feel the puzzle of puzzles, and that we call being. End of section twenty-six. Twenty-seven. To be in any form. What is that? Round and round we go, all of us, and ever come back thither. If nothing lay more developed, the quahog and its callous shell were enough. Mine is no callous shell. I have instant conductors all over me. Whether I pass or stop, they seize every object and lead it harmlessly through me. I merely stir, press, feel with my fingers, and am happy. To touch my person to someone else's is about as much as I can stand. Twenty-eight. Is this then a touch, quivering me to a new identity? Flames and ether making a rush for my veins. Treacherous tip of me reaching and crowding to help them. My flesh and blood playing out lightning to strike what is hardly different from myself. On all sides, prurient provokers stiffening my limbs, straining the udder of my heart with its withheld drip, behaving licentious toward me, taking no denial. Depriving me of my best as for a purpose, unbuttoning my clothes, holding me by the bare waist, deluding my confusion with the calm of the sunlight and pasture fields, immodestly sliding the fellow senses away. They bribed to swap off with touch and go, and graze at the edges of me. No consideration, no regard for my draining strength or my anger. Fetching the rest of the herd around to enjoy them a while, then all uniting to stand on a headland and worry me. The sentries desert every other part of me. They have left me helpless to a red marauder. They all come to the headland to witness and assist against me. I am given up by traitors. I talk wildly. I have lost my wits. I and nobody else am the greatest traitor. I went myself first to the headland. My own hands carried me there. You villain, touch! What are you doing? My breath is tight in its throat. Unclench your floodgates. You are too much for me. Twenty-nine. Blind, loving, wrestling touch, sheathed, hooded, sharp-toothed touch. Did it make you ache so, leaving me? Parting, tracked by arriving, perpetual payment of perpetual loan, rich. Showering rain and recompense richer afterward. Sprouts take 
and accumulate. Stand by the curb prolific and vital. Landscapes projected masculine, full-sized and golden. 30. All truths wait in all things. They neither hasten their own delivery nor resist it. They do not need the obstetric forceps of the surgeon. The insignificant is as big to me as any. What is less or more than a touch? Logic in sermons never convince. The damp of the night drives deeper into my soul. Only what proves itself to every man and woman is so. Only what nobody denies is so. A minute and a drop of me settle my brain. I believe the soggy clods shall become lovers and lamps. And a compend of compends is the meat of a man or woman. And a summit and flower there is the feeling they have for each other. And they are to branch boundlessly out of that lesson until it becomes omnific and until one and all shall delight us and we them. 31. I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars and the pismire is equally perfect and a grain of sand, and the egg of the wren, and the tree toad is a chef d'oeuvre for the highest, and the running blackberry would adorn the parlors of heaven, and the narrowest hinge in my hand puts to scorn all machinery, and the cow, crunching with depressed head, surpasses any statue, and a mouse is a miracle enough to stagger sextillions of infidels. I find I incorporate nice, coal, long-threaded moss, fruits, grains, esculent roots, and am stuccoed with quadrupeds and birds all over, and have distanced what is behind me for good reasons, but call anything back again when I desire it. In vain the speeding or shyness, in vain the plutonic rocks send their old heat against my approach, in vain the mastodon retreats beneath its own powdered bones, in vain objects stand leagues off and assume manifold shapes, in vain the ocean settling in hollows and the great monsters lying low, in vain the buzzard houses herself with the sky. In vain, the snake slides through the creepers and logs. In vain, the elk takes to the inner passes of the woods. In vain, the razor-billed auk sails far north to Labrador. I follow quickly. I ascend to the nest in the fissure of the cliff. 32. I think I could turn and live with animals. They are so placid and self-contained. I stand and look at them long and long. They do not sweat and whine about their condition. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. Not one is dissatisfied. Not one is demented with the mania of owning things. Not one kneels to another, nor to his kind that lived thousands of years ago. Not one is respectable or unhappy over the whole earth. So they show their relations to me and I accept them. 
they bring me tokens of myself. They evince them plainly in their possession. I wonder where they get those tokens. Did I pass that way huge times ago and negligently drop them? Myself moving forward then and now and forever, gathering and showing more always and with velocity, infinite and omnigenous, and the like of these among them, not too exclusive toward the reachers of my remembrancers, picking out here one that I love, and now go with him on brotherly terms. A gigantic beauty of a stallion, fresh and responsive to my caresses, head high in the forehead, wide between the ears, limbs glossy and supple, tail dusting the ground, eyes full of sparkling wickedness, ears finely cut, flexibly moving. His nostrils dilate as my heels embrace him. His well-built limbs tremble with pleasure as we race around and return. I but use you a minute, then I resign you, stallion. Why do I need your paces? when I myself outgallop them, even as I stand or sit, passing faster than you. 33. Space and Time Now I see it is true, what I guessed at, what I guessed when I loafed on the grass, what I guessed while I lay alone in my bed, and again as I walked the beach under the paling stars of the morning. My ties and ballasts leave me, my elbows rest in sea gaps. I skirt sierras, my palms cover continents. I am afoot with my vision. By the city's quadrangular houses, in log huts, camping with lumbermen, along the ruts of the turnpike, along the dry gulch and rivulet bed, weeding my onion patch, or hosing rows of carrots and parsnips, crossing savannas, trailing in forests, prospecting gold digging, girdling the trees of a new purchase, scorched ankle deep by the hot sand, hauling my boat down the shallow river, where the panther walks to and fro on a limb overhead, where the buck turns furiously at the hunter, where the rattlesnake suns his flabby length on a rock, where the otter is feeding on fish, where the alligator in his tough pimples sleeps by the bayou, where the black bear is searching for roots or honey, where the beaver pats the mud with his paddle-shaped tail, over the growing sugar, over the yellow-flowered cotton plant, over the rice in its low, moist field, over the sharp-peaked farmhouse with its scalloped scum and slender shoots from the gutters, over the western persimmon, over the long-leaved corn, over the delicate blue flower of flax, over the white and brown of buckwheat, a hummer and buzzer there with the rest, over the dusky green of the rye as it ripples and shades in the breeze, scaling mountains, pulling myself cautiously up, holding on by low, scragged limbs, walking the path worn in the grass and beat through the leaves of the brush where the quail is whistling betwixt the woods and the wheat lot where the bat flies in the seventh month eve where the great gold bug drops through the dark where the brook puts out of the roots of the old tree and flows to the meadow where cattle stand and shake away flies the tremulous shuddering of their hides. 
where the cheesecloth hangs in the kitchen, where andirons straddle the hearth slab, where cobwebs fall in festoons from the rafters, where trip hammers crash, where the press is whirling its cylinders, wherever the human heart beats with terrible throes under its ribs, where the pear-shaped balloon is floating aloft, floating in it myself and looking composedly down, where the life car is drawn on the slip noose, where the heat hatches pale green eggs in the dented sand, where the she-whale swims with her calf and never forsakes it, where the steamship trails hindways its long pennant of smoke, where the fin of the shark cuts like a black chip out of the water, where the half-burned brig is riding on unknown currents, where shells grow to her slimy deck, where the death are corrupting below, where the dense starred flag is born at the head of the regiments, approaching Manhattan up by the long stretching island. Under Niagara, the cataract falling like a veil over my countenance. Upon a doorstep, upon the horse block of hardwood outside, upon the race course, or enjoying picnics or jigs, or a good game of baseball. At he festivals, with blackguard jibes, ironical license, bull dances, drinking, laughter, at the cider mill, tasting the sweets of the brown mash, sucking the juice through a straw. At apple peelings, wanting kisses for all the red fruit I find. At musters, beach parties, friendly bees, huskings, house raisings, where the mockingbird sounds his delicious gurgles, cackles, screams, weeps, where the hayrick stands in the barnyard, where the dry stalks are scattered, where the brood cow waits in the hovel, where the bull advances to do his masculine work, where the stud to the mare, where the cock is treading the hen, where the heifers browse, where geese nip their food with short jerks, where Sundown shadows lengthen over the limitless and lonesome prairie, where herds of buffalo make a crawling spread of the square miles far and near, where the hummingbird shimmers, where the neck of the long-lived swan is curving and winding, where the laughing gull scoots by the shore, where she laughs her near-human laugh, where beehives range on a gray bench in the garden half-hid by the high weeds, where band-necked partridges roost in a ring on the ground with their heads out, where burial coaches enter the arched gates of a cemetery, where winter wolves bark amid wastes of snow and icicle trees, where the yellow-crowned heron comes to the edge of the marsh at night and feeds upon small crabs, where the splash of swimmers and divers cools the warm noon, where the katydid works her chromatic reed on the walnut tree over the well, through patches of citrons and cucumbers with silver-wired leaves, through the salt lick or orange glade, or under conical firs, through the gymnasium, through the curtain saloon, through the office or public hall, pleased with the native and pleased with the foreign, pleased with the new and old, pleased with the homely woman, as well as the handsome, pleased with the Quakeress as she puts off her bonnet and talks melodiously. 
pleased with the tune of the choir of the whitewashed church, pleased with the earnest words of the sweating Methodist preacher, impressed seriously at the camp meeting, looking in at the shop windows of Broadway the whole forenoon, flatting the flesh of my nose on the thick plate glass, wandering the same afternoon with my face turned up to the clouds, or down a lane or along the beach, my right and left arms round the sides of two friends, and I in the middle, coming home with the silent and dark-cheeked bush boy. Behind me he rides at the drape of the day. Far from the settlements, studying the print of animals' feet, or the moccasin print. By the cot in the hospital, reaching lemonade to a feverish patient. Nigh the coffined corpse, when all is still, examining with a candle, voyaging to every port to dicker and adventure, hurrying with the modern crowd as eager and fickle as any, hot toward one I hate, ready in my madness to knife him, solitary at midnight in my backyard, my thoughts gone from me a long while. Walking the old hills of Judea, with the beautiful, gentle God by my side. Speeding through space, speeding through heaven and the stars. Speeding amid the seven satellites and the broad ring, and the diameter of eighty thousand miles. Speeding with tailed meteors, throwing fireballs like the rest, carrying the crescent child that carries its own mother in its belly, storming, enjoying, planning, loving, cautioning, backing and filling, appearing and disappearing. I tread day and night such roads. I visit the orchards of spheres and look at the product, and look at quintillions ripened, and look at quintillions green. I fly those flights of a fluid and swallowing soul. My course runs below the soundings of plummets. I help myself to material and immaterial. No guard can shut me off. No law prevent me. I anchor my ship for a little while only. My messengers continually cruise away or bring their returns to me. I go hunting polar furs in the seal, leaping chasms with a pike-pointed staff, clinging to topples of brittle and blue. I ascend to the fore truck. I take my place late at night in the crow's nest. We sail the Arctic Sea. It is plenty light enough. Through the clear atmosphere I stretch around on the wonderful beauty. The enormous masses of ice pass me, and I pass them. The scenery is plain in all directions. The white-topped mountains show in the distance. I fling out my fancies toward them. We are approaching some great battlefield in which we are soon to be engaged. We pass the colossal outposts of the encampment. We pass with still feet and caution. Or we are entering by the suburbs some vast and ruined city. The blocks and fallen architecture more than all the living cities of the globe. I am a free companion. I bivouac by invading watchfires. I turn the bridegroom out of bed and stay with the bride myself. I tighten her all night to my thighs and lips. My voice 
is the wife's voice. The screech by the rail of the stairs. They fetch my man's body up, dripping and drowned. I understand the large hearts of heroes, the courage of present times and all times. How the skipper saw the crowded and rudderless wreck of the steamship and death chasing it up and down the storm. How he knuckled tight and gave not back an inch and was faithful of days and faithful of nights and chalked in large letters on a board. Be of good cheer, we will not desert you. How he followed with them and tacked with them three days and would not give it up. How he saved the drifting company at last. How the lank, loose-gowned women looked when boated from the side of their prepared graves. How the silent, old-faced infants and the lifted sick and the sharp-lipped, unshaven men. All this I swallow. It tastes good. I like it well. It becomes mine. I am the man. I suffered. I was there. The disdain and calmness of martyrs. The mother of old, condemned for a witch, burnt like dry wood, her children gazing on. The hounded slave that flags in the race, leans by the fence blowing, covered with sweat. The twinges that sting like needles his legs and neck. The murderous buckshot and the bullets. All these I feel or am. I am the hounded slave. I wince at the bite of the dogs. Hell and despair are upon me. Crack and again crack the marksman. I clutch the rails of the fence. My gore dribs, thinned with the ooze of my skin. I fall on the weeds and stones. The riders spur their unwilling horses, haul close, taunt my dizzy ears, and beat me violently over the head with whip stalks. Agonies are one of my changes of garments. I do not ask the wounded person how he feels. I myself become the wounded person. My hurts turn livid upon me as I lean on a cane and observe. I am the mashed fireman with breastbone broken. Tumbling walls buried me in their debris. Heat and smoke I inspired. I heard the yelling shouts of my comrades. I heard the distant click of their picks and shovels. They have cleared the beams away. They tenderly lift me forth. I lie in the night air in my red shirt. The pervading hush is for my sake. Painless after all, I lie exhausted, but not so unhappy. White and beautiful are the faces around me. The heads are bared of their fire caps. The kneeling crowd fades with the light of the torches. Distant and dead resuscitate. They show as the dial or move as the hands of me. I am the clock myself. I am an old artillerist. I tell of my fort's bombardment. I am there again. Again, the long roll of the drummers. 
Again the attacking cannon mortars. Again to my listening ears the cannon responsive. I take part. I see and hear the whole. The cries, curses, roar. The plaudits for well-aimed shots. The ambulanza slowly passing, trailing its red drip. Workmen searching after damages, making indispensable repairs. The fall of grenades through the rent roof. The fan-shaped explosion. The whiz of limbs, heads, stone, wood, iron, high in the air. Again gurgles the mouth of my dying general. He furiously waves with his hand. He gasps through the clot. Mind not me. Mind the entrenchments. 34. Now I tell what I knew in Texas in my early youth. I tell not the fall of Alamo. Not one escaped to tell the fall of Alamo. The hundred and fifty are dumb yet at Alamo. Tis the tale of the murder in cold blood of four hundred and twelve young men. Retreating, they had formed in a hollow square with their baggage for breastworks. Nine hundred lives out of the surrounding enemies. Nine times their number was the price they took in advance. Their colonel was wounded and their ammunition gone. They treated for an honorable capitulation, received writing and seal, gave up their arms and marched back prisoners of war. They were the glory of the race of rangers, matchless with horse, rifle, song, supper, courtship. Large, turbulent, generous, handsome, proud, and affectionate. Bearded, sunburnt, dressed in the free costume of hunters. Not a single one over thirty years of age. The second first day morning they were brought out in squads and massacred. It was beautiful early summer. The work commenced about five o'clock and was over by eight. None obeyed the command to kneel. Some made a mad and helpless rush. Some stood stark and straight. A few fell at once, shot in the temple or heart. The living and dead lay together. The maimed and mangled dug in the dirt the newcomers saw them there. Some half-killed attempted to crawl away. These were dispatched with bayonets or battered with the blunts of muskets. A youth not seventeen years old seized his assassin till two more came to release him. The three were all torn and covered with the boy's blood. At eleven o'clock began the burning of the bodies. That is the tale of the murder of the four hundred and twelve young men. Thirty-five. Would you hear of an old-time sea fight? Would you learn who won by the light of the moon and stars? Listen to the yarn, as my grandmother's father, the sailor, told it to me. Our foe was no skulk in his ships, I tell you, said he. His was the surly English pluck, and there is no tougher or truer, and never was, and never will be. Along the lowered eve, he came horribly raking us. We closed with him. The yards entangled, the cannon touched. My captain lashed fast with his own hands. 
we had received some 18-pound shots under the water. On our lower gun deck, two large pieces had burst at the first fire, killing all around and blowing up overhead. Fighting at sundown, fighting at dark. Ten o'clock at night, the full moon well up, our leaks on the gain, and five feet of water reported. The master at arms loosing the prisoners confined in the aft hold to give them a chance for themselves. The transit to and from the magazine is now stopped by the sentinels. They see so many strange faces they do not know whom to trust. Our frigate takes fire. The other asks if we demand quarter, if our colors are struck and the fighting done. Now I laugh content, for I hear the voice of my little captain. We have not struck, he composedly cries. We have just begun our part of the fighting. Only three guns are in use. One is directed by the captain himself against the enemy's mainmast. Two well served with grape and canister silence his musketry and clear his decks. The tops alone second the fire of this little battery, especially the main top. They hold out bravely during the whole of the action. Not a moment's cease. The leaks gain fast on the pumps. The fire eats toward the powder magazine. One of the pumps has been shot away. It is generally thought we are sinking. Serene stands the little captain. He is not hurried. His voice is neither high nor low. His eyes give more light to us than our battle lanterns. Toward twelve, there in the beams of the moon, they surrender to us. 36. Stretched and still lies the midnight. Two great hulls, motionless on the breast of the darkness. Our vessel riddled and slowly sinking. Preparations to pass to the one we have conquered. The captain on the quarter-deck coldly giving his orders, through a countenance white as a sheet. Nearby the corpse of the child that served in the cabin. The dead face of an old salt with long white hair and carefully curled whiskers. The flames, spite of all that can be done, flickering aloft and below. The husky voices of the two or three officers yet fit for duty. Formless stacks of bodies and bodies by themselves. Dabs of flesh upon the masts and spars. Cut of cordage, dangle of rigging, slight shock of the soothe of waves, black and impassive guns, litter of powder parcels, strong scent, a few large stars overhead, silent and mournful shining, delicate sniffs of sea breeze, smells of sedgy grass and fields by the shore. Death messages given in charge to survivors. The hiss of the surgeon's knife. The gnawing teeth of his saw. Wheeze, cluck. Swash of falling blood. Short, wild scream. And long, dull, tapering groan. These so, these irretrievable. 37. You laggards there on guard, look to your arms. In at the conquered doors they crowd. I am possessed. Embody all presences outlawed or suffering. See myself in prison, shaped like another man, and feel the dull unintermitted pain. For me, the keepers of convicts shoulder their carbines and keep watch. It is I let out in the morning and barred at night. 
Not a mutineer walks handcuffed to jail, but I am handcuffed to him and walk by his side. I am less the jolly one there and more the silent one with sweat on my twitching lips. Not a youngster is taken for larceny, but I go up too and am tried and sentenced. Not a cholera patient lies at the last gasp, but I also lie at the last gasp. My face is ash-colored, my sinews gnarl. Away from me, people retreat. Askers embody themselves in me, and I am embodied in them. I project my hat, sit shamefaced, and beg. 38. Enough, enough, enough. Somehow I have been stunned. Stand back. Give me a little time beyond my cuffed head. Slumbers, dreams, gaping. I discover myself on the verge of a usual mistake. That I could forget the mockers and insults that I could forget the trickling tears and the blows of the bludgeons and hammers, that I could look with a separate look on my own crucifixion and bloody crowning. I remember now. I resume the overstayed fraction. The grave of rock multiplies what has been confided to it, or to any graves. Corpses rise, gashes heal, fastenings roll from me. I troop forth, replenished, with supreme power, one of an average, unending procession. Inland and seacoast we go, and pass all boundary lines, our swift ordinances on their way over the whole earth. The blossoms we wear in our hats, the growth of thousands of years. Elevs, I salute you. Come forward. Continue your annotations. Continue your questionings. 39. The friendly and flowing savage. Who is he? Is he waiting for civilization? or past it and mastering it? Is he some southwesterner raised outdoors? Is he Canadian? Is he from the Mississippi country, Iowa, Oregon, California, the mountains, prairie life, bush life, or sailor from the sea? Wherever he goes, men and women accept and desire him. They desire he should like them touch them, speak to them, stay with them. Behavior lawless as snowflakes, words simple as grass, uncombed head, laughter, and naivete, slow stepping feet, common features, common modes and emanations. They descend in new forms from the tips of his fingers, they are wafted with the odor of his body or breath. They fly out of the glance of his eyes. 40. Flaunt of the sunshine, I need not your bask. Lie over. You light surfaces only. I force surfaces and depths also. Earth. You seem to look for something at my hands. Say, old topknot, what do you want? Man or woman? I might tell how I like you, but cannot. And might tell what it is in me, and what it is in you, but cannot. And might tell that pining I have, that pulse of my nights and days. Behold, I do not give lectures or a little charity. When I give, 
I give myself. You there, impotent, loose in the knees. Open your scarfed chops till I blow grit within you. Spread your palms and lift the flaps of your pockets. I am not to be denied. I compel. I have stores plenty and to spare. And anything I have, I bestow. I do not ask who you are. That is not important to me. You can do nothing and be nothing. But what I will enfold you. To cotton field drudge or cleaner of privies I lean. On his right cheek I put the family kiss. And in my soul I swear I never will deny him. On women fit for conception, I start bigger and nimbler babes. This day I am jetting the stuff of far more arrogant republics. To anyone dying, thither I speed and twist the knob of the door, turn the bedclothes toward the foot of the bed, let the physician and priest go home. I seize the descending man and raise him with resistless will. O oh, despairer, here is my neck. By God, you shall not go down. Hang your whole weight upon me. I dilate you with tremendous breath. I buoy you up. Every room of the house do I fill with an armed force. Lovers of me, bafflers of graves. Sleep, I and they keep guard all night. Not doubt, not decease shall dare to lay finger upon you. I have embraced you and henceforth possess you to myself. And when you rise in the morning, you will find what I tell you is so. End of 40, 41. I am he bringing help for the sick as they pant on their backs. And for strong upright men I bring yet more needed help. I heard what was said of the universe. Heard it and heard it of several thousand years. It is middling well as far as it goes. But is that all? Magnifying and applying come I, outbidding at the start of the old cautious hucksters, taking myself the exact dimensions of Jehovah, lithographing Kronos, Zeus his son, and Hercules his grandson, buying drafts of Osiris, Isis, Belus, Brahma, Buddha, in my portfolio placing Manitou loose, Allah on a leaf, the crucifix engraved, with Odin and the hideous faced Mixitli, and every idol and image taking them all for what they are worth and not a cent more, admitting they were alive and did the work of their days. They bore mites as for unfledged birds who have now to rise and fly and sing for themselves. Accepting the rough deific sketches to fill out better in myself, bestowing them freely on each man and woman I see, discovering as much or more in a framer framing a house, putting higher claims for him there with his rolled up sleeves, driving the mallet and chisel, not objecting to special revelations, considering a curl of smoke or a hair on the back of my hand just as curious as any revelation. Lads a hold of fire engines and hook and ladder ropes no less to me than the gods of the antique wars, minding their voices peal through the crash of destruction, 
their brawny limbs passing safe over charred lathes, their white foreheads whole and unhurt out of the flames. By the mechanic's wife with her babe at her nipple, interceding for every person born. Three scythes at harvest whizzing in a row from three lusty angels with shirts bagged out at their waists. The snag-toothed hostler with red hair redeeming sins past and to come. Selling all he possesses, traveling on foot to fee lawyers for his brother, and sit by him while he is tried for forgery. What was strewn in the amplest strewing the square rod about me, and not filling the square rod then? The bull and the bug never worshipped half enough, dung and dirt more admirable than was dreamed, the supernatural of no account, myself waiting my time to be one of the supremes. The day getting ready for me when I shall do as much good as the best, and be as prodigious. By my life lumps, becoming already a creator, putting myself here and now to the ambushed womb of the shadows. 42. A call in the midst of the crowd, my own voice, orotund, sweeping and final. Come, my children, come, my boys and girls, my women, household and intimates. Now the performer launches his nerve. He has passed his prelude on the reeds within. Easily written, loose-fingered chords, I feel the thrum of your climax and close. My head slews round on my neck, Music rolls, but not from the organ. Folks are around me, but they are no household of mine. Ever the hard, unsunk ground, ever the eaters and drinkers, ever the upward and downward sun, ever the air and the ceaseless tides, ever myself and my neighbors, refreshing, wicked, real, Ever the old, inexplicable query, ever that thorned thumb, that breath of itches and thirsts. Ever the vexers hoot, hoot, till we find where the sly one hides and bring him forth. Ever love, ever the sobbing liquid of life, ever the bandage under the chin, ever the trestles of death. Here and there, with dimes on the eyes walking, to feed the greed of the belly, the brains liberally spooning, tickets buying, taking, selling, but into the feast never once going, many sweating, plowing, thrashing, and then the chaff for payment receiving, a few idly owning, and they the wheat continually claiming. This is the city, and I am one of the citizens. Whatever interests the rest interests me. Politics, wars, markets, newspapers, schools, the mayor and councils, banks, tariffs, steamships, factories, stocks, stores, real estate, and personal estate. The little plentiful mannequins skipping around in collars and tailed coats. I am aware who they are. They are positively not worms or fleas. I acknowledge the duplicates of myself. The weakest and shallowest is deathless with me. What I do and say the same awaits for them. Every thought that flounders in me the same flounders in them. I know perfectly well my own egotism, know my omnivorous lines and must not write any less, and would fetch you whoever you are, flush with myself. Not words of routine, 
this song of mine, but abruptly to question, to leap beyond yet nearer bring. This printed and bound book, but the printer and the printing office boy, the well-taken photographs, but your wife or friend close and solid in your arms, the black ship mailed with iron, her mighty guns in her turrets, but the pluck of the captain and engineers. In the houses, the dishes and fare and furniture, but the host and hostess and the look out of their eyes. The sky up there, yet here or next door or across the way. The saints and sages in history, but you yourself. Sermons, creeds, theology, but the fathomless human brain. And what is reason? And what is love? And what is life? 43. I do not despise you priests. All time the world over, my faith is the greatest of faiths and the least of faiths. Enclosing worship ancient and modern and all between ancient and modern, believing I shall come again upon the earth after five thousand years, waiting responses from oracles, honoring the gods, saluting the sun, making a fetish of the first rock or stump, pow-wowing with sticks in the circle of Obus, helping the Lama or Brahmin as he trims the lamps of the idols, dancing yet through the streets in a phallic procession, wrapped and austere in the woods, a gymnosophist, drinking mead from the skullcap, to Shastas and Vedas, admirant, minding the Quran, walking the Teocallus, spotted with gore from the stone and knife, beating the serpent skin drum, accepting the Gospels, accepting him that was crucified, knowing assuredly that he is divine, to the mass kneeling, or the Puritan's prayer rising, or sitting patiently in a pew, ranting and frothing in my insane crisis, or waiting dead-like till my spirit arouses me, looking forth on pavement and land, or outside of pavement and land, belonging to the winders of the circuit of circuits. One of that centripetal and centrifugal gang, I turn and talk like man leaving charges before a journey. Downhearted doubters, dull and excluded, frivolous, sullen, moping, angry, affected, disheartened, atheistical, I know every one of you. I know the sea of torment, doubt, despair, and unbelief. How the flukes splash, how they contort rapid as lightning with spasms and spouts of blood. Be at peace, bloody flukes of doubters and sullen mopers. I take my place among you as much as among any. The past is the push of you, me all precisely the same. And what is yet untried and afterward is for you, me all precisely the same. I do not know what is untried and afterward, but I know it will in its turn prove sufficient and cannot fail. Each who passes is considered. Each who stops is considered. Not single one can it fall. It cannot fall the young man who died and was buried, nor the young woman who died and was put by his side, nor the little child that peeped in at the door and then drew back and was never seen again, 
nor the old man who has lived without purpose and feels it with bitterness worse than gall, nor him in the poor house, tuberculed by rum and the bad disorder, nor the numberless slaughtered and wrecked, nor the brutish kobu called the ordure of humanity, nor the sacks merely floating with open mouths for food to slip in, nor anything in the earth, or down in the oldest graves of the earth, nor anything in the myriads of spheres, nor the myriads of myriads that inhabit them, nor the present, nor the least wisp that is known. 44. It is time to explain myself. Let us stand up. What is known, I strip away. I launch all men and women forward with me into the unknown. The clock indicates the moment. But what does eternity indicate? We have thus far exhausted trillions of winters and summers. There are trillions ahead and trillions ahead of them. Births have brought us richness and variety, and other births will bring us richness and variety. I do not call one greater and one smaller. That which fills its period and place is equal to any. Were mankind murderous or jealous upon you, my brother, my sister? I am sorry for you. They are not murderous or jealous upon me. All has been gentle with me. I keep no account with lamentation. What have I to do with lamentation? I am an acme of things accomplished, and I an encloser of things to be. My feet strike an apex of the apices of the stairs. On every step, bunches of ages and larger bunches between the steps, all below duly traveled, and still I mount and mount. Rise after rise bow the phantoms behind me. Afar down I see the huge first nothing. I know I was even there. I waited, unseen, and always, and slept through the lethargic mist, and took my time, and took no hurt from the fetid carbon. Long I was hugged, close, long and long. Immense have been the preparations for me, faithful and friendly the arms that have helped me, Cycles ferried my cradle, rowing and rowing like cheerful boatmen. For room to me, stars kept aside in their own rings. They sent influences to look after what was to hold me. Before I was born out of my mother, generations guided me. My embryo has never been torpid. Nothing could overlay it. For it, the nebula cohered to an orb, the long, slow strata piled to rest it on. Vast vegetables gave it sustenance. Monstrous soroids transported it in their mouths and deposited it with care. All forces have been steadily employed to complete and delight me. Now on this spot I stand with my robust soul. 45. O oh, span of youth, ever pushed elasticity. O oh, manhood, balanced, florid, and full. My lovers suffocate me, crowding my lips in the pores of my skin 
jostling me through streets and public halls, coming naked to me at night, crying by day, ahoy, from the rocks of the river, swinging and chirping over my head, calling my name from flower beds, vines, tangled underbrush, lighting on every moment of my life, bussing my body with soft balsamic buses, noiselessly passing handfuls out of their hearts and giving them to be mine. Old age, superbly rising, oh welcome, ineffable grace of dying days. Every condition promulges not only itself, it promulges what grows after and out of itself. And the dark hush promulges as much as any. I open my scuttle at night and see the far sprinkled systems and all I see multiplied as high as I can cipher edge but the rim of the farther systems. Wider and wider they spread, expanding, always expanding outward and outward and forever outward. My son has his son round him obediently wheels. He joins with his partners a group of superior circuit, and greater sets follow, making specks of the greatest inside them. There is no stoppage, never can be stoppage. If I, you, and the worlds and all beneath or upon their surfaces were this moment reduced back to a pallid float, it would not avail the long run. We should surely bring up again where we now stand, and surely go as much farther, and then farther, and farther. A few quadrillions of eras, a few octillions of cubic leagues, do not hazard the span or make it impatient. They are but parts. Any thing is but a part. See ever so far. There is limitless space outside of that. Count ever so much. There is limitless time around that. My rendezvous is appointed. It is certain. The Lord will be there and wait till I come on perfect terms. The great camarado, the lover true for whom I pine, will be there. 46. I know I have the best of time and space, and was never measured, and never will be measured. I tramp a perpetual journey. Come, listen all. My signs are a rainproof coat, good shoes, and a staff cut from the woods. No friend of mine takes his ease in my chair. I have no chair, no church, no philosophy. I lead no man to a dinner table, library, exchange. But each man and each woman of you I lead upon a knoll, my left hand hooking you round the waist, my right hand pointing to landscapes of continents and the public road. Not I, not anyone else can travel that road for you. You must travel it for yourself. It is not far. It is within reach. Perhaps you have been on it since you were born and did not know. Perhaps it is everywhere, on water and on land. Shoulder your duds, dear son, and I will mine. And let us hasten forth. Wonderful cities and free nations we shall fetch as we go. If you tire, 
give me both burdens and rest the chuff of your hand on my hip. And in due time, you shall repay the same service to me. For after we start, we never lie by again. This day before dawn, I ascended a hill and looked at the crowded heaven. And I said to my spirit, when we become the enfolders of those orbs, and the pleasure and knowledge of everything in them, shall we be filled and satisfied then? And my spirit said, no. We but level that lift to pass and continue beyond. You are also asking me questions, and I hear you. I answer that I cannot answer. You must find out for yourself. Sit a while, dear son. Here are biscuits to eat, and here is milk to drink. But as soon as you sleep, and renew yourself in sweet clothes, I kiss you with a goodbye kiss, and open the gate of your egress hence. Long enough have you dreamed contemptible dreams. Now I wash the gum from your eyes. You must have it yourself to the dazzle of the light and of every moment of your life. Long have you timidly waited, holding a plank by the shore. Now I will you to be a bold swimmer to jump off in the midst of the sea, rise again, nod to me, shout, and laughingly dash with your hair. 47. I am the teacher of athletes. He that by me spreads a wider breast than my own proves the width of my own. He most honors my style who learns under it to destroy the teacher. The boy I love, the same becomes a man not through derived power, but in his own right, wicked rather than virtuous, out of conformity or fear, fond of his sweetheart, relishing well his stake. Unrequited love, or a slight, cutting him worse than sharp steel cuts, first rate to ride, to fight to hit the bull's eye, to sail a skiff, to sing a song, or play on the banjo, preferring scars and the beard and faces pitted with smallpox over all latherers, and those well tanned to those that keep out of the sun. I teach straying from me, yet who can stray from me? I follow you, whoever you are, from the present hour. My words itch at your ears till you understand them. I do not say these things for a dollar or to fill up the time while I wait for a boat. It is you talking just as much as myself. I act as the tongue of you, tied in your mouth. In mine, it begins to be loosened. I swear I will never again mention love or death inside a house. And I swear I will never translate myself at all, only to him or her who privately stays with me in the open air. If you would understand me, go to the heights or water shore. The nearest gnat is an explanation and a drop or motion of waves, key, the maul, the oar, the hand saw, second my words. No shuttered room or school can commune with me, but roughs and little children better than they. The young mechanic is closest to me. He knows me well. The woodman that takes his axe and jug with him shall take me with him all day. The farm boy plowing in the field feels good at the sound of my voice. In vessels that sail, my words sail. I go with fishermen and seamen 
and love them. The soldier camped, or upon the march, is mine. On the night, ere the pending battle, many seek me, and I do not fail them. On that solemn night, it may be their last. Those that know me, seek me. My face rubs to the hunter's face when he lies down alone in his blanket. The driver, thinking of me, does not mind the jolt of his wagon. The young mother and old mother comprehend me. The girl and the wife rest the needle a moment and forget where they are. They and all would resume what I have told them. 48. I have said that the soul is not more than the body, and I have said that the body is not more than the soul, and nothing, not God, is greater to one than one's self is, and whoever walks a furlong without sympathy walks to his own funeral dressed in his shroud, and I or you, pocketless of a dime, may purchase the pick of the earth, and to glance with an eye, or show a bean in its pod, confounds the learning of all times, and there is no trade or employment, but the young man following it may become a hero, and there is no object so soft, but it makes a hub for the wheeled universe. And I say to any man or woman, let your soul stand cool and composed before a million universes. And I say to mankind, be not curious about God, for I who am curious about each am not curious about God. No array of terms can say how much I am at peace about God and about death. I hear and behold God in every object, yet understand God not in the least, nor do I understand who there can be more wonderful than myself. Why should I wish to see God better than this day? I see something of God each hour of the twenty-four each moment then, in the faces of men and women, I see God, and in my own face in the glass, I find the letters from God dropped in the street, and every one is signed by God's name, and I leave them where they are, for I know that wheresoe'er I go, Others will punctually come forever and ever. 49. And as to you, death, and you bitter hug of mortality, it is idle to try to alarm me. To his work without flinching, the accoucheur comes. I see the elder hand pressing, receiving, supporting. I recline by the sills of the exquisite flexible doors and mark the outlet and mark the relief and escape. And as to you, corpse, I think you are good manure, but that does not offend me. I smell the white roses, sweet-scented and growing. I reach to the leafy lips. I reached to the polished breasts of melons. And as to you, life, I reckon you are the leavings of many deaths. No doubt I have died myself ten thousand times before. I hear you whispering there, O stars of heaven, O suns, O grass of graves, O perpetual transfers and promotions. If you do not say anything, 
how can I say anything of the turbid pool that lies in the autumn forest, of the moon that descends the steeps of the soughing twilight, toss sparkles of day and dusk, toss on the black stems that decay in the muck, toss to the moaning gibberish of the dry limbs. I ascend from the moon, I ascend from the night, I perceive that the ghastly glimmer is noonday sunbeams reflected, and debouche to the steady and central from the offspring, great or small. 50. There is that in me. I do not know what it is, but I know it is in me. Wrenched and sweaty, calm and cool, then my body becomes. I sleep. I sleep long. I do not know it. It is without name. It is a word unsaid. It is not in any dictionary, utterance, symbol. Something it swings on more than earth, I swing on. To it the creation is the friend whose embracing awakes me. Perhaps I might tell more. Outlines, I plead for my brothers and sisters. Do you see, O oh my brothers and sisters? It is not chaos or death. It is form, union, plan. It is eternal life. It is happiness. 51. The past and present wilt. I have filled them, emptied them, and proceed to fill my next fold of the future. Listener up there, what have you to confide to me? Look in my face while I snuff the sidle of evening. Talk honestly, no one else hears you, and I stay only a minute longer. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. I concentrate toward them that are nigh. I wait on the door slab. Who has done his day's work? Who will soonest be through his supper? Who wishes to walk with me? Will you speak before I am gone? Will you prove already too late? 52. The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering. I too am not a bit tamed. I too am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yelp over the roofs of the world. The last scud of day holds back for me, flings my likeness after the rest, and true as any on the shadowed wilds, coaxes me to the vapor and the dusk. I depart as air. I shake my white locks at the runaway sun. I effuse my flesh in eddies and drift it in lacy jags. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless, and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you.
End of 52. End of Song of Myself. End of Book 3. Today's reading by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Book 4. Children of Adam. To the Garden, the World. To the garden, the world anew ascending, potent mates, daughters, sons, preluding the love, the life of their bodies, meaning and being. Curious here, behold my resurrection after slumber, the revolving cycles in their wide sweep having brought me again, amorous, mature, all beautiful to me, all wondrous my limbs and the quivering fire that ever plays through them, for reasons most wondrous, existing I peer and penetrate still, content with the present, content with the past, by my side or back of me Eve following, or in front, and I following her just the same. From Pent-Up Aching Rivers from pent-up aching rivers, from that of myself without which I were nothing, from what I am determined to make illustrious, even if I stand sole among men, from my own voice resonant, singing the phallus, singing the song of procreation, singing the need of superb children, and therein superb grown people, singing the muscular urge and the blending, Singing the bedfellow's song. O oh, resistless yearning. O oh, for any and each the body correlative attracting. O oh, for you, whoever you are, your correlative body. O oh, it, more than all else, you delighting. From the hungry gnaw that eats me night and day. From native moments, from bashful pains, singing them seeking something yet unfound, though I have diligently sought it many a long year. Singing the true song of the soul, fitful at random, renascent with grossest nature, or among animals, of that, of them, and what goes with them, my poems informing, of the smell of apples and lemons, of the pairing of birds, of the wet of woods, of the lapping of waves, of the mad pushes of waves upon the land, I them chanting, the overture lightly sounding, the strain anticipating, the welcome nearness, the sight of the perfect body, the swimmer swimming naked in the bath, or motionless on his back, lying and floating, the female form approaching, I pensive, Love flesh tremulous, aching. The divine list for myself, or you, or for anyone making. The face, the limbs, the index from head to foot, and what it arouses. The mystic deliria, the madness amorous, the utter abandonment. Hark close and still what I now whisper to you. I love you. Oh, you entirely possess me. Oh, that you and I escape from the rest and go utterly off, free and lawless, two hawks in the air, two fishes swimming in the sea, not more lawless than we. The furious storm through me careering, I passionately trembling. The oath of the inseparableness of two together, of the woman that loves me and whom I love more than my life, that oath swearing. Oh, I willingly stake all for you. Oh, let me be lost, if it must be so. Oh, you and I, what is it to us what the rest do or think? What is all else to us, only that we enjoy each other and exhaust each other, if it must be so? From the master, the pilot I yield the vessel to, the general commanding me, commanding all, from him permission-taking. 
from time the program hastening. I have loitered too long as it is. From sex, from the warp, and from the woof, from privacy, from frequent repinings alone, from plenty of persons near, and yet the right person not near, from the soft sliding of hands over me and thrusting of fingers through my hair and beard, from the long sustained kiss upon the mouth or bosom, from the close pressure that makes me or any man drunk, fainting with excess, from what the divine husband knows, from the work of fatherhood, from exultation, victory and relief, from the bedfellow's embrace in the night, from the act poems of eyes, hands, hips and bosoms, from the cling of the trembling arm, from the bending curve and the clinch, from side by side the pliant coverlet off throwing, from the one so unwilling to have me leave, and me just as unwilling to leave. Yet a moment, O oh tender waiter, and I return. From the hour of shining stars and dropping dews, from the night a moment I emerging, flitting out. Celebrate, you act divine, and you children prepared for, and you stalwart loins. I sing the body electric. One. I sing the body electric. The armies of those I love engirth me, and I engirth them. They will not let me off till I go with them, respond to them, and discorrupt them, and charge them full with the charge of the soul. Was it doubted that those who corrupt their own bodies conceal themselves? And if those who defile the living are as bad as they who defile the dead? And if the body does not do fully as much as the soul? And if the body were not the soul, what is the soul? 2. The love of the body of man or woman balks account. The body itself balks account. That of the male is perfect and that of the female is perfect. The expression of the face balks account, but the expression of a well-made man appears not only in his face, it is in his limbs and joints also. It is curiously in the joints of his hips and wrists. It is in his walk, the carriage of his neck, the flex of his waist and knees. Dress does not hide him. The strong, sweet quality he has strikes through the cotton and broadcloth. To see him pass conveys as much as the best poem, perhaps more. You linger to see his back, and the back of his neck and shoulder side. The sprawl and fullness of babes, the bosoms and heads of women, the folds of their dress, their style as we pass in the street, the contour of their shape downwards. The swimmer, naked in the swimming bath, seen as he swims through the transparent green shine, or lies with his face up, and rolls silently to and from the heave of the water. The bending forward and backward of rowers in rowboats. The horseman in his saddle. Girls, mothers, housekeepers, in all their performances, the group of laborers, seated at noontime, with their dinner kettles, and their wives waiting. The female soothing a child, the farmer's daughter in the garden or cow yard, the young fellow hoeing corn, the sleigh driver driving his six horses through the crowd, the wrestle of wrestlers, two apprentice boys, quite grown, lusty, good-natured, native-born, out on the vacant lot at sundown after work, the coats and caps thrown down, the embrace of love and resistance, the upper hold and under hold, the hair rumpled over and blinding the eyes, the march of firemen in their own costumes, 
the play of masculine muscle through clean-setting trousers and waist straps. The slow return from the fire, the pause when the bell strikes suddenly again, and the listening on the alert. The natural, perfect, varied attitudes, the bent head, the curved neck, and the counting. Such like I love, I loosen myself, pass freely, am at the mother's breast with the little child, swim with the swimmers, wrestle with the wrestlers, march in line with the firemen, and pause, listen, count. Three. I knew a man, a common farmer, the father of five sons, and in them the fathers of sons, and in them the fathers of sons. This man was a wonderful vigor, calmness, beauty of person. The shape of his head, the pale yellow and white of his hair and beard, the immeasurable meaning of his black eyes, the richness and breadth of his manners. These I used to go and visit him to see. He was wise also. He was six feet tall. He was over eighty years old. His sons were massive, clean, bearded, tan-faced, handsome. They and his daughters loved him. All who saw him loved him. They did not love him by allowance. They loved him with personal love. He drank water only. The blood showed like scarlet through the clear brown skin of his face. He was a frequent gunner and fisher. He sailed his boat himself. He had a fine one presented to him by a ship joiner. He had fowling pieces presented to him by men that loved him. When he went with his five sons and many grandsons to hunt or fish, you would pick him out as the most beautiful and vigorous of the gang. You would wish long and long to be with him. You would wish to sit by him in the boat that you and he might touch each other. Four. I have perceived that to be with those I like is enough. To stop in company with the rest at evening is enough. To be surrounded by beautiful, curious, breathing, laughing flesh is enough. To pass among them, or touch any one, or rest my arm ever so lightly round his or her neck for a moment. What is this, then? I do not ask any more delight. I swim in it as in a sea. There is something in staying close to men and women, and looking on them, and in the contact and odor of them that pleases the soul well. All things please the soul, but these please the soul well. Five. This is the female form. A divine nimbus exhales from it, from head to foot. It attracts with fierce, undeniable attraction. I am drawn by its breath, as if I were no more than a helpless vapor. All falls aside but myself and it. Books, art, religion, time, the visible and solid earth, and what was expected of heaven or feared of hell are now consumed. Mad filaments, ungovernable shoots play out of it, the response likewise ungovernable. Hair, bosom, hips, bend of legs, negligent falling hands, all diffused, mine too diffused. Ebb stung by the flow, and flow stung by the ebb, Love flesh swelling and deliciously aching. Limitless limpid jets of love, hot and enormous, quivering jelly of love, white blow and delirious nice. Bridegroom night of love working surely and softly into the prostrate dawn. 
undulating into the willing and yielding day, lost in the cleave of the clasping and sweet-fleshed day. This the nucleus. After the child is born of woman, man is born of woman. This the bath of birth. This the merge of small and large, and the outlet again. Be not ashamed, women. Your privilege encloses the rest, and is the exit of the rest. You are the gates of the body, and you are the gates of the soul. The female contains all qualities, and tempers them. She is in her place, and moves with perfect balance. She is all things duly veiled. She is both passive and active. She is to conceive daughters as well as sons, and sons as well as daughters. As I see my soul reflected in nature, as I see through a mist, one with inexpressible completeness, sanity, beauty, see the bent head and arms folded over the breast, the female I see. Six. The male is not less the soul, nor more. He too is in his place. He too is all qualities. He is action and power. The flush of the known universe is in him. Scorn becomes him well, and appetite and defiance become him well. The wildest, largest passions, bliss that is utmost, sorrow that is utmost become him well. Pride is for him. The full-spread pride of man is calming and excellent to the soul. Knowledge becomes him. He likes it always. He brings everything to the test of himself. Whatever the survey, whatever the sea and the sail, he strikes soundings at last only here. Where else does he strike soundings except here? The man's body is sacred and the woman's body is sacred. No matter who it is, it is sacred. Is it the meanest one in the laborer's gang? Is it one of the dull-faced immigrants just landed on the wharf? Each belongs here or anywhere, just as much as the well-off just as much as you. Each has his or her place in the procession. All is a procession. The universe is a procession with measured and perfect motion. Do you know so much yourself that you call the meanest ignorant? Do you suppose you have a right to a good sight, and he or she has no right to a sight? Do you think matter has cohered together from its diffuse float, and the soil is on the surface, and water runs and vegetation sprouts for you only, and not for him and her? 7. A man's body at auction. For before the war, I often go to the slave mart and watch the sale. I help the auctioneer. The sloven does not half know his business. Gentlemen, look on this wonder. Whatever the bids of the bidders, they cannot be high enough for it. For it the globe lay preparing quintillions of years without one animal or plant. For it the revolving cycles truly and steadily rolled. In this head, the all-baffling brain. In it, and below it, the makings of heroes. Examine these limbs, red, black, or white. They are cunning in tendon and nerve. They shall be stripped that you may see them. Exquisite senses, life-lit eyes, pluck, volition, flakes of breast muscle, pliant backbone and neck, flesh not flabby, good-sized arms and legs, and wonders within there yet. 
Within there runs blood, the same old blood, the same red running blood. There swells and jets a heart. There all passions, desires, reachings, aspirations. Do you think they are not there because they are not expressed in parlors and lecture rooms? This is not only one man. This is the father of those who shall be fathers in their turns. In him the start of populous states and rich republics. Of him countless immortal lives with countless embodiments and enjoyments. How do you know who shall come from the offspring of his offspring through the centuries? Who might you find you have come from yourself if you could trace back through the centuries? Eight. A woman's body at auction. She too is not only herself. She is the teeming mother of mothers. She is the bearer of them that shall grow and be mates to the mothers. Have you ever loved the body of a woman? Have you ever loved the body of a man? Do you not see that these are exactly the same to all? in all nations and times, all over the earth. If anything is sacred, the human body is sacred, and the glory and sweet of a man is the token of manhood untainted, and in man or woman a clean, strong, firm-fibered body is more beautiful than the most beautiful face. Have you seen the fool that corrupted his own live body, or the fool that corrupted her own live body? For they do not conceal themselves, and cannot conceal themselves. 9. O oh, my body, I dare not desert the likes of you in other men and women, nor the likes of the parts of you. I believe the likes of you are to stand or fall with the likes of the soul, and that they are the soul. I believe the likes of you shall stand or fall with my poems, and that they are my poems. Man's, woman's, child's, youth's, wife's, husband's, mother's, father's, young man's, young woman's poems. Head, neck, hair, ears, drop and tympan of the ears. Eyes, eye fringes, iris of the eye, eyebrows, and the waking or sleeping of the lids. Mouth, tongue, lips, teeth, roof of the mouth, jaws, and the jaw hinges. Nose, nostrils of the nose, and the partition. Cheeks, temples, forehead, chin, throat, back of the neck, neck slew. Strong shoulders, manly beard, scapula, hind shoulders, and the ample side round of the chest. Upper arm, armpit, elbow socket, lower arm, arm sinews, arm bones, wrist and wrist joints, hand, palm, knuckles, thumb, forefinger, finger joints, fingernails, broad breast front, curling hair of the breast, breast bone, breast side, ribs, belly, backbone, joints of the backbone, hips, hip sockets, hip strength, inward and outward round, man balls, man root, strong set of thighs, well carrying the trunk above, leg fibers, knee, knee pan, upper leg, under leg, ankles, instep, football, toes, toe joints, the heel, 
all attitudes, all the shapeliness, all the belongings of my or your body or of anyone's body, male or female, the lung sponges, the stomach sac, the bowels sweet and clean, the brain in its folds inside the skull frame, sympathies, heart valves, palate valves, sexuality, maternity, womanhood, and all that is a woman, and the man that comes from woman, the womb, the teats, nipples, breast milk, tears, laughter, weeping, love looks, love perturbations and risings, the voice, articulation, language, whispering, shouting aloud, food, drink, pulse, digestion, sweat, sleep, walking, swimming, poise on the hips, leaping, reclining, embracing, arm curving and tightening, the continual changes of the flex of the mouth and around the eyes, the skin, the sunburnt shade, freckles, hair, the curious sympathy one feels when feeling with the hand the naked meat of the body, the circling rivers, the breath, and breathing it in and out, the beauty of the waist, and thence of the hips, and thence downward toward the knees, the thin red jellies within you or within me, the bones and the marrow in the bones, the exquisite realization of health. Oh, I say these are not the parts and poems of the body only, but of the soul. Oh, I say now, these are the soul. A woman waits for me. A woman waits for me. She contains all. Nothing is lacking. Yet all were lacking if sex were lacking, or if the moisture of the right man were lacking. Sex contains all. Bodies, souls, meanings, proofs, purities, delicacies, results, promulgations, songs, commands, health, pride, the maternal mystery, the seminal milk, all hopes, benefactions, bestowals, all the passions, loves, beauties, delights of the earth, all the governments, judges, gods, followed persons of the earth. These are contained in sex as parts of itself and justifications of itself. Without shame, the man I like knows and avows the deliciousness of his sex. Without shame, the woman I like knows and avows hers. Now I will dismiss myself from impassive women. I will go stay with her who waits for me, and with those women that are warm-blooded and sufficient for me. I see that they understand me and do not deny me. I see that they are worthy of me. I will be the robust husband of those women. They are not one jot less than I am. They are tanned in the face by shining suns and blowing winds. Their flesh has the old divine suppleness and strength. They know how to swim, row, ride, wrestle, shoot, run, strike, retreat, advance, resist, defend themselves. They are ultimate in their own right. They are calm, clear, well-possessed of themselves. I draw you close to me, you women. I cannot let you go. I would do you good. I am for you, and you are for me, not only for our own sake, but for others' sakes. Enveloped in you sleep greater heroes and bards, 
They refuse to awake at the touch of any man but me. It is I, you women. I make my way. I am stern, acrid, large, undissuadable. But I love you. I do not hurt you any more than is necessary for you. I pour the stuff to start sons and daughters fit for these states. I press with slow, rude muscle. I brace myself effectually. I listen to no entreaties. I dare not withdraw till I deposit what has so long accumulated within me. Through you I drain the pent-up rivers of myself. In you I wrap a thousand onward years. On you I graft the grafts of the best beloved of me and America. The drops I distill upon you shall grow fierce and athletic girls, new artists, musicians, and singers. The babes I beget upon you are to beget babes in their turn. I shall demand perfect men and women out of my love spendings. I shall expect them to interpenetrate with others as I and you interpenetrate now. I shall count on the fruits of the gushing showers of them as I count on the fruits of the gushing showers I give now. I shall look for loving crops from the birth, life, death, immortality I plant so lovingly now. Spontaneous Me Spontaneous Me Nature The loving day The mounting sun The friend I am happy with The arm of my friend hanging idly over my shoulder The hillside whitened with blossoms of the mountain ash The same late in autumn the hues of red, yellow, drab, purple, and light and dark green. The rich coverlet of the grass, animals and birds, the private untrimmed bank, the primitive apples, the pebble stones, beautiful dripping fragments, the negligent list of one after another as I happen to call them to me or think of them, the real poems what we call poems, being merely pictures. The poems of the privacy of the night and of men like me. This poem, drooping, shy, and unseen, that I always carry, and that all men carry. No once for all, avowed on purpose, wherever are men like me are our lusty, lurking, masculine poems. Love thoughts, love juice, love odor, love yielding, love climbers, and the climbing sap. Arms and hands of love, lips of love, phallic thumb of love, breasts of love, bellies pressed and glued together with love, earth of chaste love, life that is only life after love, the body of my love, the body of the woman I love, the body of the man, the body of the earth. Soft forenoon airs that blow from the southwest, the hairy wild bee that murmurs and hankers up and down, that grips the full-grown lady flower, curves upon her with amorous firm legs, takes his will of her, and holds himself tremulous and tight till he is satisfied. The wet of woods through the early hours. Two sleepers at night lying close together as they sleep, one with an arm slanting down across and below the waist of the other. The smell of apples, aromas from crushed sage plant, mint, birch bark, the boy's longings, the glow and pressure as he confides to me what he was dreaming. The dead leaf whirling its spiral whirl and falling still and content to the ground. The no-formed stings that sights, people, 
objects sting me with. The hubbed sting of myself stinging me as much as it ever can anyone. The sensitive, orbic, underlapped brothers that only privileged feelers may be intimate where they are. The curious roamer, the hand roaming all over the body, the bashful withdrawing of flesh where the fingers soothingly pause and edge themselves, the limpid liquid within the young man, the vexed corrosion so pensive and so painful, the torment the irritable tide that will not be at rest, the like of the same I feel, the like of the same in others, the young man that flushes and flushes, and the young woman that flushes and flushes, the young man that wakes deep at night, the hot hand seeking to repress what would master him, the mystic amorous night, the strange, half-welcome pangs, visions, sweats. The pulse pounding through palms and trembling in circling fingers. The young man all colored, red, ashamed, angry. The souse upon me of my lover the sea, as I lie willing and naked. The merriment of the twin babes that crawl over the grass in the sun the mother never turning her vigilant eyes from them. The walnut trunk, the walnut husks, and the ripening or ripened long round walnuts. The continents of vegetables, birds, animals. The consequent meanness of me should I skulk or find myself indecent, while birds and animals never once skulk or find themselves indecent. The great chastity of paternity to match the great chastity of maternity. The oath of procreation I have sworn, my Adamic and fresh daughters. The greed that eats me day and night with hungry gnaw, till I saturate what shall produce boys to fill my place when I am through. The wholesome relief, repose, content. And this bunch plucked at random from myself. It has done its work. I toss it carelessly to fall where it may. One hour to madness and joy. One hour to madness and joy. Oh, furious. Oh, confine me not. What is this that frees me so in storms? What do my shouts amid lightnings and raging winds mean? Oh, to drink the mystic deliria deeper than any other man. Oh, savage and tender achings. I bequeath them to you, my children. I tell them to you for reasons, O oh, bridegroom and bride. Oh, to be yielded to you, whoever you are and you to be yielded to me in defiance of the world. Oh, to return to paradise, oh, bashful and feminine. Oh, to draw you to me, to plant on you for the first time the lips of a determined man. Oh, the puzzle, the thrice-tied knot, the deep and dark pool, all untied and illumined. Oh, to speed where there is space enough and air enough at last. To be absolved from previous ties and conventions, I from mine and you from yours. To find a new unthought of nonchalance with the best of nature. To have the gag removed from one's mouth. To have the feeling today or any day I am sufficient as I am. Oh, something unproved, something in a trance. To escape utterly from others' anchors and holds. To drive free, to love free. To dash reckless and dangerous. To court destruction with taunts, with invitations. To ascend, to leap to the heavens of the love indicated to me. 
to rise thither with my inebriate soul, to be lost, if it must be so, to feed the remainder of life with one hour of fullness and freedom, with one brief hour of madness and joy. Out of the rolling ocean the crowd. Out of the rolling ocean the crowd came a drop gently to me, whispering, I love you, before long I die. I have traveled a long way merely to look on you, to touch you. For I could not die till I once looked on you. For I feared I might afterward lose you. Now we have met, we have looked, we are safe. Return in peace to the ocean, my love. I too am part of that ocean, my love. We are not so much separated. Behold the great rondure, the cohesion of all, how perfect! But as for me, for you, the irresistible sea is to separate us. As for an hour carrying us diverse, yet cannot carry us diverse forever, be not impatient, a little space. Know you I salute the air, the ocean, and the land every day at sundown, for your dear sake my love. Ages and ages returning at intervals. Ages and ages returning at intervals, undestroyed, wandering immortal, lusty, phallic, with the potent original loins, perfectly sweet, I, chanter of Adamic songs, through the new garden the west, the great cities calling, deliriate, thus prelude what is generated, offering these, offering myself, bathing myself, bathing my songs in sex, offspring of my loins. We too, how long we were fooled. We too, how long we were fooled, now transmuted, we swiftly escape as nature escapes. We are nature. Long have we been absent, but now we return. We become plants, trunks, foliage, roots, bark. We are bedded in the ground. We are rocks. We are oaks. We grow in the openings, side by side. We browse. We are two among the wild herds, spontaneous as any. We are two fishes swimming in the sea together. We are what locust blossoms are. We drop scent around lanes, mornings and evenings. We are also the coarse smut of beasts, vegetables, minerals. We are two predatory hawks. We soar above and look down. We are two resplendent suns. We it is who balance ourselves, orbic and stellar. We are as two comets. We prowl fanged and four-footed in the woods. We spring on prey. We are two clouds, forenoons and afternoons, driving overhead. We are seas mingling. We are two of those cheerful waves rolling over each other and interwetting each other. We are what the atmosphere is, transparent, receptive, pervious, impervious. We are snow, rain, cold, darkness. We are each product and influence of the globe. We have circled and circled till we have arrived home again, we two. We have voided all but freedom and all but our own joy. O Hymen, O Hymene. O Hymen, O Hymene, why do you tantalize me thus? O why sting me for a swift moment only? Why can you not continue? O why do you now cease? Is it because if you continued beyond the swift moment, 
You would soon certainly kill me. I am he that aches with love. I am he that aches with amorous love. Does the earth gravitate? Does not all matter, aching, attract all matter? So the body of me to all I meet or know. Native Moments Native Moments, when you come upon me, Ah, you are here now. Give me now libidinous joys only. Give me the drench of my passions. Give me life, coarse and rank. Today I go consort with nature's darlings. Tonight, too. I am for those who believe in loose delights. I share the midnight orgies of young men. I dance with the dancers and drink with the drinkers. The echoes ring with our indecent calls. I pick out some low person for my dearest friend. He shall be lawless, rude, illiterate. He shall be one condemned by others for deeds done. I will play a part no longer. Why should I exile myself from my companions? Oh, you shunned persons. I, at least, do not shun you. I come forthwith in your midst. I will be your poet. I will be more to you than to any of the rest. Once I passed through a populous city. Once I passed through a populous city, imprinting my brain for future use with its shows, architecture, customs, traditions, Yet now, of all that city, I remember only a woman I casually met there who detained me for love of me. Day by day and night by night we were together. All else has long been forgotten by me. I remember, I say, only that woman who passionately clung to me. Again we wander, we love, we separate again. Again she holds me by the hand. I must not go. I see her close beside me with silent lips, sad and tremulous. I heard you solemn sweet pipes of the organ. I heard you solemn sweet pipes of the organ as last Sunday morn I passed the church. Winds of autumn... As I walked the woods at dusk, I heard your long-stretched sighs, up above so mournful. I heard the perfect Italian tenor singing at the opera. I heard the soprano in the midst of the quartet singing. Heart of my love, you too I heard murmuring low through one of the wrists around my head. Heard the pulse of you when all was still, ringing little bells last night under my ear. Facing West from California's Shores Facing West from California's Shores, inquiring, tireless, seeking what is yet unfound, I, a child, very old, over waves, towards the house of maternity, the land of migrations, look afar. Look off the shores of my western sea, the circle almost circled. For starting westward from Hindustan, from the vales of Kashmir, from Asia, from the north, from the god, the sage and the hero, from the south, from the flowery peninsulas and the spice islands, Long having wandered since, round the earth having wandered, now I face home again, very pleased and joyous. But where is what I started for so long ago? And why is it yet unfound? As Adam, early in the morning. As Adam, early in the morning, 
walking forth from the bower, refreshed with sleep. Behold me where I pass, hear my voice, approach, touch me, touch the palm of your hand to my body as I pass. Be not afraid of my body. End of book four. Today's reading is by Chris Mitchell. The Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Book 5. Calamus. In Paths Untrodden. In Paths Untrodden, in the growth by margins of pond waters, escaped from the life that exhibits itself, from all the standards hitherto published, from the pleasures, profits, conformities, which too long I was offering to feed my soul. Clear to me now standards not yet published, clear to me that my soul, that the soul of the man I speak for rejoices in comrades. Here by myself, away from the clank of the world, tallying and talked to here by tongues aromatic, no longer abashed, for in this secluded spot I can respond as I would not dare elsewhere. Strong upon me the life that does not exhibit itself, yet contains all the rest. Resolved to sing no songs today, but those of manly attachment, projecting them along that substantial life, bequeathing hence types of athletic love, Afternoon this delicious ninth month in my forty-first year, I proceed for all who are or have been young men to tell the secret my nights and days to celebrate the need of comrades. Scented Herbage of My Breast Scented herbage of my breast, leaves from you I glean, I write, to be perused best afterwards, tomb leaves, body leaves, growing up above me, above death, perennial roots, tall leaves, oh, the winter shall not freeze you, delicate leaves, every year shall you bloom again, out from where you retired you shall emerge again, oh, I do not know whether many passing by will discover you or inhale your faint odor, but I believe a few will. O oh, slender leaves, O oh, blossoms of my blood, I permit you to tell in your own way of the heart that is under you. O oh, I do not know what you mean there underneath yourselves. You are not happiness. You are often more bitter than I can bear. You burn and sting me, yet you are beautiful to me, you faint-tinged roots. You make me think of death. Death is beautiful from you. What indeed is finally beautiful except death and love? Oh, I think it is not for life I am chanting here my chant of lovers. I think it must be for death. For how calm, how solemn it grows to ascend to the atmosphere of lovers. Death or life, I am then indifferent. My soul declines to prefer. I am not sure, but the high soul of lovers welcomes death most. Indeed, O oh death, I think now these leaves mean precisely the same as you mean. Grow up taller, sweet leaves, that I may see. Grow up out of my breast. Spring away from the concealed heart there. Do not fold yourself so in your pink-tinged roots, timid leaves. Do not remain down there so ashamed, herbage of my breast. Come, I am determined to unbear this broad breast of mine. I have long enough stifled and choked. Emblematic and capricious blades I leave you, now you serve me not. I will say what I have to say by itself. I will sound myself and comrades only. I will never again utter a call, only their call. 
I will raise with it immortal reverberations through the states. I will give an example to lovers to take permanent shape and will through the states. Through me shall the words be said to make death exhilarating. Give me your tone, therefore, O death, that I may accord with it. Give me yourself, for I see that you belong to me now above all, and are folded inseparably together, you, love, and death are. Nor will I allow you to balk me any more with what I was calling life, for now it is conveyed to me that you are the purports essential that you hide in these shifting forms of life for reasons and that they are mainly for you. That you beyond them come forth to remain the real reality, that behind the mask of materials you patiently wait, no matter how long, that you will one day perhaps take control of all, that you will perhaps dissipate this entire show of appearance, that may be you are what it is all for, but it does not last so very long, but you will last very long. Whoever you are holding me now in hand. Whoever you are holding me now in hand, without one thing all will be useless. I give you fair warning before you attempt me further. I am not what you supposed, but far different. Who is he that would become my follower? Who would sign himself a candidate for my affections? The way is suspicious, the result uncertain, perhaps destructive. You would have to give up all else. I alone would expect to be your sole and exclusive standard. Your novitiate would even then be long and exhausting. The whole past theory of your life and all conformity to the lives around you would have to be abandoned. Therefore, release me now before troubling yourself any further. Let go your hand from my shoulders. Put me down and depart on your way. Or else by stealth in some wood for trial, or back of a rock in the opened air, for in any roofed room of a house I emerge not, nor in company, and in libraries I lie as one dumb, a gawk, or unborn, or dead. But just possibly with you on a high hill, first watching lest any person for miles around approach unawares, or possibly with you sailing at sea, or on the beach of the sea or some quiet island, here to put your lips upon mine I permit you, with the comrade's long dwelling kiss or the new husband's kiss, for I am the new husband and I am the comrade. Or if you will, thrusting me beneath your clothing, where I may feel the throbs of your heart or rest upon your hip, carry me when you go forth over land or sea. For thus merely touching you is enough, is best. And thus touching you would I silently sleep and be carried eternally. But these leaves conning you con at peril. For these leaves and me you will not understand. They will elude you at first and still more afterward. I will certainly elude you. Even while you should think you had unquestionably caught me, behold, already you see, I have escaped from you. For it is not for what I have put into it that I have written this book, nor is it by reading it you will acquire it, nor do those know me best who admire me and vauntingly praise me, nor will the candidates for my love, unless at most a very few, prove victorious. Nor will my poems do good only, they will do just as much evil, perhaps more. For all is useless without that which you may guess at many times and not hit, that which I hinted at. Therefore, release me and depart on your way. For you, O democracy, 
Come, I will make the continent indissoluble. I will make the most splendid race the sun ever shone upon. I will make divine magnetic lands with the love of comrades, with the lifelong love of comrades. I will plant companionship thick as trees along all the rivers of America and along the shores of the Great Lakes and all over the prairies. I will make inseparable cities with their arms about each other's necks by the love of comrades, by the manly love of comrades. For you, these from me, O oh democracy, to serve you, ma femme. For you, for you, I am trilling these songs. These I singing in spring. These I singing in spring collect for lovers, for who but I should understand lovers and all their sorrow and joy, and who but I should be the poet of comrades. Collecting, I traverse the garden, the world, but soon I pass the gates, now along the pond side, now waiting in a little, fearing not the wet, now by the post and rail fences where the old stones thrown there, picked from the fields, have accumulated. Wild flowers and vines and weeds come up through the stones and partly cover them. Beyond these I pass. Far, far in the forest, or sauntering later in summer, before I think where I go. Solitary, smelling the earthy smell, stopping now and then in the silence. Alone I had thought, yet soon a troop gathers around me. Some walk by my side and some behind, and some embrace my arms or neck. They, the spirits of dear friends, dead or alive, thicker they come, a great crowd, and I in the middle. Collecting, dispensing, singing, there I wander with them, plucking something for tokens, tossing toward whoever is near me. Here, lilac with a branch of pine. Here, out of my pocket, some moss which I pulled off a live oak in Florida as it hung trailing down. Here, some pinks and laurel leaves and a handful of sage. And here what I now draw from the water, wading in the pond side. Oh, here I last saw him that tenderly loves me and returns again never to separate from me. And this, oh, this shall henceforth be the token of comrades, this calamus root shall. Interchange it, youths, with each other, let none render it back. And twigs of maple, and a bunch of wild orange and chestnut, and stems of currants and plum blows, and the aromatic cedar, these I compassed around by a thick cloud of spirits, wandering, point to or touch as I pass, or throwing them loosely from me, indicating to each one what he shall have, giving something to each. But what I drew from the water by the pond side that I reserve, I will give of it, but only to them that love as I myself am capable of loving. Not heaving from my ribbed breast only. Not heaving from my ribbed breast only, not in sighs at night in rage dissatisfied with myself, not in those long drawn, ill suppressed sighs, not in many an oath and promise broken, not in my willful and savage soul's volition, not in the subtle nourishment of the air not in this beating and pounding at my temples and wrists, not in the curious systole and diastole within which will one day cease, not in many a hungry wish told to the skies only, not in cries, laughter, defiances, thrown from me when alone far in the wilds, not in husky pantings through clinched teeth, 
not in sounded and resounded words, chattering words, echoes, dead words, not in the murmurs of my dreams while I sleep, nor the other murmurs of these incredible dreams of every day, nor in the limbs and senses of my body that take you and dismiss you continually, not there, not in any or all of them, O oh, adhesiveness, O oh, pulse of my life, need I that you exist and show yourself any more than in these songs. Of the terrible doubt of appearances, of the terrible doubt of appearances, of the uncertainty after all that we may be deluded, that maybe reliance and hope are but speculations after all, that maybe identity beyond the grave is a beautiful fable only, maybe the things I perceive, the animals, plants, men, hills, shining and flowing waters, the skies of day and night, colors, densities, forms, maybe these are, as doubtless they are, only apparitions, and the real something has yet to be known. How often they dart out of themselves as if to confound me and mock me. How often I think neither I know, nor any man knows, aught of them. Maybe, seeming to me what they are, as doubtless they indeed but seem, as from my present point of view, and might prove, as of course they would, not of what they appear, or not anyhow, from entirely changed points of view. To me these and the like of these are curiously answered by my lovers, my dear friends, when he whom I love travels with me or sits along while holding me by the hand, when the subtle air, the impalpable, the sense that words and reason hold not, surround us and pervade us, then I am charged with untold and untellable wisdom. I am silent. I require nothing further. I cannot answer the question of appearances or that of identity beyond the grave, but I walk or sit indifferent. I am satisfied. He a hold of my hand has completely satisfied me. The Base of All Metaphysics And now, gentlemen, as a word I give to remain in your memories and minds, as base and finale too for all metaphysics. So to the students, the old professor at the close of his corrupted course. Having studied the new and antique, the Greek and Germanic systems, Kant having studied and stated, Fichte and Schelling and Hegel stated the lore of Plato and Socrates greater than Plato and greater than Socrates sought and stated Christ divine having studied long. I see reminiscent today those Greek and Germanic systems, see the philosophies all, Christian churches and tenets see, yet underneath Socrates clearly see, and underneath Christ the divine I see. The dear love of man for his comrade, the attraction of friend to friend, of the well-married husband and wife, of children and parents, of city for city and land for land. Recorders ages hence. Recorders ages hence. Come, I will take you down underneath this impassive exterior. I will tell you what to say of me. Publish my name and hang up my picture as that of the tenderest lover, the friend, the lover's portrait, of whom his friend, his lover, was fondest. Who was not proud of his songs, but of the measureless ocean of love within him, and freely poured it forth? Who often walked lonesome walks thinking of his dear friends, his lovers? 
who, pensive away from one he loved often, lay sleepless and dissatisfied at night, who knew too well the sick, sick dread lest the one he loved might secretly be indifferent to him, whose happiest days were far away through fields, in woods, on hills, he and another, wandering hand in hand, they twain, apart from other men. Who, oft as he sauntered, the streets curved with his arm the shoulder of his friend, while the arm of his friend rested upon him also. When I heard at the close of the day, when I heard at the close of the day how my name had been received with plaudits in the capital, still it was not a happy night for me that followed. And else when I caroused or when my plans were accomplished, still I was not happy. But the day when I rose at dawn from the bed of perfect health, refreshed, singing, inhaling the ripe breath of autumn, when I saw the full moon in the west grow pale and disappear in the morning light, when I wandered alone over the beach and undressing bathed, laughing with the cool waters and saw the sun rise, and when I thought how my dear friend, my lover, was on his way coming, oh, then I was happy. Oh, then each breath tasted sweeter, and all that day my food nourished me more, and the beautiful day passed well. And the next came with equal joy, and with the next at evening came my friend. And that night, while all was still, I heard the waters roll slowly, continually up the shores. I heard the hissing rustle of the liquid and sands as directed to me whispering to congratulate me. For the one I love most lay sleeping by me under the same cover in the cool night. In the stillness, in the autumn moonbeams, his face was inclined toward me, and his arm lay lightly around my breast, and that night I was happy. Are you the new person drawn toward me? Are you the new person drawn toward me? To begin with, take warning. I am surely far different from what you suppose. Do you suppose you will find in me your ideal? Do you think it so easy to have me become your lover? Do you think the friendship of me would be unalloyed satisfaction? Do you think I am trusty and faithful? Do you see no further than this facade, this smooth and tolerant manner of me? Do you suppose yourself advancing on real ground toward a real heroic man? Have you no thought, O oh dreamer, that it may be all my illusion? Roots and Leaves Themselves Alone Roots and leaves themselves alone are these, scents brought to men and women from the wild woods and pond side, breast sorrel and pinks of love, fingers that wind around tighter than vines, gushes from the throats of birds hid in the foliage of trees as the sun is risen, breezes of land and love set from living shores to you on the living sea, to you, O oh sailors. Frost-mellowed berries and third-month twigs offered fresh to young persons wandering out in the fields when the winter breaks up. Love buds put before you and within you, whoever you are, buds to be unfolded on the old terms. If you bring the warmth of the sun to them, they will open and bring form, color, perfume to you. If you become the aliment, and the wet they will become flowers, fruits, tall branches, and trees. Not heat flames up and consumes. Not heat flames up and consumes. Not sea waves hurry in and out. 
Not the air delicious and dry, the air of ripe summer bears lightly along white down balls of myriads of seeds, weighted, sailing gracefully to drop where they may. Not these, oh, none of these more than the flames of me consuming, burning for his love whom I love. Oh, none more than I hurrying in and out. Does the tide hurry, seeking something and never give up? Oh, I the same. Oh, nor down balls nor perfumes, nor the high rain emitting clouds are born through the open air any more than my soul is born through the open air, wafted in all directions, O oh love, for friendship, for you. Trickle Drops Trickle drops, my blue veins leaving, O oh drops of me, trickle, slow drops, candid from me falling, drip, bleeding drops from wounds made to free you whence you were prisoned, from my face, from my forehead and lips, from my breast, from within where I was concealed, press forth red drops, confession drops, stain every page, stain every song I sing, every word I say, bloody drops, let them know your scarlet heat, let them glisten, Saturate them with yourself all ashamed and wet. Glow upon all I have written or shall write. Bleeding drops, let it all be seen in your light. Blushing drops. City of Orgies City of Orgies walks and joys, city whom that I have lived and sung in your midst, will one day make, not the pageants of you, not your shifting tableaus, your spectacles, repay me, not the interminable rows of your houses, nor the ships at the wharves, nor the processions in the streets, nor the bright windows with goods in them nor to converse with learned persons or bear my share in the soiree or feast. Not those, but as I pass, O oh, Manhattan, your frequent and swift flash of eyes offering me love, offering response to my own, these repay me. Lovers, continual lovers, only repay me. Behold this swarthy face. Behold this swarthy face, these gray eyes, this beard, the white wool unclipped upon my neck, my brown hands and the silent manner of me without charm. Yet comes one, a Manhattanese, and ever at parting kisses me lightly on the lips with robust love. And I on the crossing of the street or on the ship's deck give a kiss in return. We observe that salute of American comrades land and sea, we are those two natural and nonchalant persons. I saw in Louisiana a live oak growing. I saw in Louisiana a live oak growing. All alone stood it, and the moss hung down from the branches. Without any companion it grew there, uttering joyous of dark green, and its look, rude, unbending, lusty, made me think of myself. But I wondered how it could utter joyous leaves standing alone there without its friend near, for I knew I could not. And I broke off a twig with a certain number of leaves upon it, and twined around it a little moss, and brought it away, and I have placed it in sight in my room. It is not needed to remind me as of my own dear friends, for I believe lately I think of little else than of them. Yet it remains to me a curious token. It makes me think of manly love. For all that, 
and though the live oak glistens there in Louisiana solitary in a wide flat space, uttering joyous leaves all its life without a friend, a lover near, I know very well I could not. To a Stranger Passing stranger, you do not know how longingly I look upon you. You must be he I was seeking, or she I was seeking. It comes to me as of a dream. I have somewhere surely lived a life of joy with you. All is recalled as we flit by each other, fluid, affectionate, chaste, matured. You grew up with me were a boy with me or a girl with me. I ate with you and I slept with you. Your body has become not yours only, nor left my body mine only. You give me the pleasure of your eyes, face, flesh as we pass. You take of my beard, breast, hands in return. I am not to speak to you. I am to think of you when I sit alone or wake at night alone. I am to wait. I do not doubt I am to meet you again. I am to see to it that I do not lose you. This moment yearning and thoughtful. This moment yearning and thoughtful sitting alone. It seems to me there are other men in other lands yearning and thoughtful. It seems to me I can look over and behold them in Germany, Italy, France, Spain, or far, far away in China or in Russia, or talking other dialects. And it seems to me if I could know those men, I should become attached to them as I do to men in my own lands. Oh, I know we should be brethren and lovers. I know I should be happy with them. I hear it was charged against me. I hear it was charged against me that I sought to destroy institutions. But really, I am neither for nor against institutions. What indeed have I in common with them, or what with the destruction of them? Only I will establish in the Manhattan and in every city of these states inland and seaboard and in the fields and woods, and above every keel little or large that dents the water, without edifices or rules or trustees or any argument, the institution of the dear love of comrades. The Prairie Grass Dividing The Prairie Grass Dividing its special odor breathing, I demand of it the spiritual corresponding, demand the most copious and close companionship of men, demand the blades to rise of words, acts, beings, those of the open atmosphere, coarse, sunlit, fresh, nutritious, those that go their own gait, erect, stepping with freedom and command, leading, not following. Those with a never quelled audacity, those with sweet and lusty flesh clear of taint, those that look carelessly in the faces of presidents and governors, as to say, who are you? Those of earth-born passion, simple, never constrained, never obedient, those of inland America. When I peruse the conquered fame, when I peruse the conquered fame of heroes and the victories of mighty generals, I do not envy the generals, nor the president in his presidency, nor the rich in his great house. But when I hear of the brotherhood of lovers, how it was with them, how together through life, through dangers, odium, unchanging, long and long, through youth and through middle and old age, how unfaltering, how affectionate, 
and faithful they were. Then I am pensive. I hastily walk away filled with the bitterest envy. We two boys together clinging. We two boys together clinging, one the other never leaving, up and down the roads going, north and south excursions making, power enjoying, elbows stretching, fingers clutching, armed and fearless, eating, drinking, sleeping, loving. No law less than ourselves owning, sailing, soldiering, thieving, threatening. Misers, menials, priests alarming, air breathing, water drinking, on the turf or the sea beach dancing. Cities wrenching, ease scorning, statues mocking, feebleness chasing, fulfilling our foray. A Promise to California A promise to California, or inland to the great pastoral plains, and on to Puget Sound and Oregon. Sojourning east a while longer, soon I travel toward you, to remain, to teach robust American love. For I know very well what I and robust love belong among you, inland, and along the western sea. For these states tend inland and toward the western sea, and I will also. Hear the frailest leaves of me. Hear the frailest leaves of me and yet my strongest lasting. Here I shade and hide my thoughts, I myself do not expose them and yet they expose me more than all my other poems. No labor-saving machine. No labor-saving machine, nor discovery have I made, nor will I be able to leave behind me any wealthy bequest to found hospital or library nor reminiscence of any deed of courage for America, nor literary success, nor intellect, nor book for the bookshelf, but a few carols vibrating through the air I leave for comrades and lovers. A Glimpse A glimpse through an interstice caught of a crowd of workmen and drivers in a bar room around the stove late of a winter night, and I unremarked seated in a corner, of a youth who loves me and whom I love, silently approaching and seating himself near, that he may hold me by the hand. A long while, amid the noises of coming and going, of drinking and oath and smutty jest, there we too, content, happy in being together, speaking little, perhaps not a word. A Leaf for Hand in Hand A leaf for hand in hand, you natural persons old and young, you on the Mississippi and on all the branches and bayous of the Mississippi. You friendly boatmen and mechanics, you roughs, you twain, and all processions moving along the streets. I wish to infuse myself among you till I see it common for you to walk hand in hand. Earth, my likeness. Earth, my likeness, though you look so impassive, ample and spheric there, I now suspect that is not all. I now suspect there is something fierce in you eligible to burst forth. For an athlete is enamored of me, and I of him. But toward him there is something fierce and terrible, in me eligible to burst forth. I dare not tell it in words, 
not even in these songs. I dreamed in a dream. I dreamed in a dream I saw a city invincible to the attacks of the whole of the rest of the earth. I dreamed that was the new city of friends. Nothing was greater there than the quality of robust love. It led the rest. It was seen every hour in the actions of the men of that city, and in all their looks and words. What think you I take my pen in hand? What think you I take my pen in hand to record? The battleship, perfect modeled, majestic, that I saw pass the offing today under full sail? The splendors of the past day, or the splendor of the night that envelops me? Or the vaunted glory and growth of the great city spread around me? No but merely of two simple men I saw today on the pier in the midst of the crowd, parting the parting of dear friends, the one to remain hung on the other's neck and passionately kissed him, while the one to depart tightly pressed the one to remain in his arms. To the east and to the west, to the east and to the west, to the man of the seaside state and of Pennsylvania, to the Canadian of the north, to the southerner I love, these with perfect trust to depict you as myself, the germs are in all men. I believe the main purport of these states is to found a superb friendship, exalté, previously unknown because I perceive it waits, and has been always waiting, latent in all men. Sometimes with one I love. Sometimes with one I love, I fill myself with rage, for fear I effuse unreturned love. But now I think there is no unreturned love. The pay is certain one way or another. I loved a certain person ardently, and my love was not returned. Yet out of that I have written these songs. To a Western Boy Many things to absorb I teach to help you become a lev of mine. Yet. If blood like mine circle not in your veins, if you be not silently selected by lovers, and do not silently select lovers, of what use is it that you seek to become a lev of mine? Fast anchored eternal, O oh love. Fast anchored eternal, O oh love, O oh woman I love. O oh bride, O oh wife, more resistless than I can tell the thought of you. Then separate, as disembodied or another born, ethereal, the last athletic reality, my consolation. I ascend, I float in the regions of your love, O oh man, O oh sharer of my roving life. Among the multitude, among the men and women the multitude, I perceive one picking me out by secret and divine signs, acknowledging none else, not parent, wife, husband, brother, child, any nearer than I am. Some are baffled, but that one is not, that one knows me. Ah, lover and perfect equal, I meant that you should discover me so by faint indirections, and I, when I meet you, mean to discover you by the light in you. O oh, you whom I often and silently come, O oh, you, whom I often and silently come where you are, that I may be with you. 
as I walk by your side or sit near, or remain in the same room with you, little you know the subtle electric fire that for your sake is playing within me. That shadow, my likeness. That shadow, my likeness, that goes to and fro, seeking a livelihood, chattering, chaffering. How often I find myself standing and looking at it where it flits. How often I question and doubt whether that is really me. But among my lovers and caroling these songs, oh, I never doubt whether that is really me. Full of life now, full of life now, compact, visible, I, forty years old, the eighty-third year of the states, to one a century hence, or any number of centuries hence, to you yet unborn these, seeking you. When you read these, I that was visible am become invisible, now it is you, compact, visible, realizing my poems, seeking me, fancying how happy you were if I could be with you and become your comrade. Be it as if I were you, be not too certain, but I am now with you. Here ends Book 5. Today's reading is by Chris Mitchell. The Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman Book 6 Salut au monde 1. Oh, take my hand, Walt Whitman. Such gliding wonders, such sights and sounds, such joined unended links, each hooked to the next, each answering all each sharing the earth with all. What widens within you, Walt Whitman? What waves and soils exuding? What climes? What persons and cities are here? Who are the infants, some playing, some slumbering? Who are the girls? Who are the married women? Who are the groups of old men going slowly with their arms about each other's necks? What rivers are these? What forests and fruits are these? What are the mountains called that rise so high in the midst? What myriads of dwellings are they filled with dwellers? 2. Within me latitude widens, longitude lengthens, Asia, Africa, Europe, are to the east. America is provided for in the west. Banding the bulge of the earth winds the hot equator. Curiously north and south turn the axis ends. Within me is the longest day. The sun wheels in slanting rings. It does not set for months. Stretched in due time within me, the midnight sun just rises above the horizon and sinks again. Within me, zones, seas, cataracts, forests, volcanoes, groups, Malaysia, Polynesia, and the great West Indian islands. 3. What do you hear, Walt Whitman? I hear the workman singing and the farmer's wife singing. I hear in the distance the sounds of children and of animals early in the day. I hear emulous shouts of Australians pursuing the wild horse. I hear the Spanish dance with castanets in the chestnut shade to the rebec and guitar. I hear continual echoes from the Thames. I hear fierce French liberty songs. I hear of the Italian boat sculler in the musical recitative of old poems. I hear the locusts in Syria as they strike the grain and grass with the showers of their terrible clouds. 
I hear the Coptic refrain toward sundown, pensively falling on the breast of the black venerable vast mother, the Nile. I hear the chirp of the Mexican muleteer and the bells of the mule. I hear the Arab muezzin calling from the top of the mosque. I hear the Christian priests at the altars of their churches. I hear the responsive bass and soprano. I hear the cry of the Cossack and the sailor's voice putting to sea at Okotsk. I hear the wheeze of the slave coffle as the slaves march on, as the husky gangs pass on by twos and threes, fastened together with wrist chains and ankle chains. I hear the Hebrew reading his records and psalms. I hear the rhythmic myths of the Greeks and the strong legends of the Romans. I hear the tale of the divine life and bloody death of the beautiful God the Christ. I hear the Hindu teaching his favorite pupil the loves, wars, adages transmitted safely to this day from poets who wrote three thousand years ago. Four. What do you see, Walt Whitman? Who are they you salute, and that one after another salute you? I see a great round wonder rolling through space. I see diminutive farms, hamlets, ruins, graveyards, jails, factories, palaces, hovels, huts of barbarians, tents of nomads upon the surface. I see the shaded part on one side where the sleepers are sleeping, and the sunlit part on the other side. I see the curious rapid change of the light and shade. I see distant lands, as real and near to the inhabitants of them as my land is to me. I see plenteous waters, I see mountain peaks, I see the Sierras of Andes where they range. I see plainly the Himalayas, Kian Shachs, Altes, Gauts. I see the giant pinnacles of Elbrus, Kazbek, Bazarjusi. I see the Styrian Alps and the Karnak Alps. I see the Pyrenees, Balks, Carpathians, and to the north the Dofra fields, and off at sea Mount Hecla. I see Vesuvius and Etna, the mountains of the moon, and the red mountains of Madagascar. I see the Libyan, Arabian, and Asiatic deserts. I see huge, dreadful Arctic and Antarctic icebergs. I see the superior oceans and the inferior ones, the Atlantic and Pacific, the Sea of Mexico, the Brazilian Sea, and the Sea of Peru the waters of Hindustan, the China Sea, and the Gulf of Guinea, the Japan waters, the beautiful bay of Nagasaki landlocked in its mountains, the spread of the Baltic, Caspian, Bothnia, the British shores, and the Bay of Biscay, the clear sunned Mediterranean, and from one to another of its islands, the White Sea, and the sea around Greenland. I behold the mariners of the world, some are in storms, some in the night with the watch on the lookout, some drifting helplessly, some with contagious diseases. I behold the sail and steamships of the world, some in clusters in port, some on their voyages. Some double the Cape of Storms, some Cape Verde, others Cape Guardafui, Bon or Bajadore. Others Dondra Head, others past the Straits of Sunda, others Cape Lopatka, others Bering Straits. Others Cape Horn, others sail the Gulf of Mexico or along Cuba or Haiti others Hudson's Bay or Baffin's Bay, others pass the Straits of Dover, others enter the Wash, others the Firth of Solway, 
others round Cape Clear, others the land's end. Others traverse the Zyder Zee or the Scheld, others as comers and goers at Gibraltar or the Dardanelles, others sternly push their way through the northern winter packs, others descend or ascend the Obi or the Lena, others the Niger or the Congo, others the Indus, the Burma Putter, and Cambodia. Others wait steamed up ready to start in the ports of Australia, wait at Liverpool, Glasgow, Dublin, Marseille, Lisbon, Naples, Hamburg, Bremen, Bordeaux, The Hague, Copenhagen, wait at Valparaiso, Rio Janeiro, Panama. 5. I see the tracks of the railroads of the earth. I see them in Great Britain, I see them in Europe, I see them in Asia and in Africa. I see the electric telegraphs of the earth, I see the filaments of the news of the wars, deaths, losses, gains, passions of my race. I see the long river stripes of the earth, I see the Amazon and the Paraguay. I see the four great rivers of China, the Amur, the Yellow River, the Yangtze, and the Pearl. I see where the Seine flows, and where the Danube, the Loire, the Rhone, and the Guadalquivir flow. I see the windings of the Volga, the Dnieper, the Oder. I see the Tuscan going down the Arno, and the Venetian along the Po. I see the Greek seamen sailing out of Aegina Bay. 6. I see the site of the old empire of Assyria, and that of Persia, and that of India. I see the falling of the Ganges over the high rim of Saukara. I see the place of the idea of the deity incarnated by avatars in human forms. I see the spots of the successions of priests on the earth, oracles, sacrificers, Brahmins, Sabians, Lamas, monks, Muftis, exhorters. I see where Druids walked the groves of Mona. I see the mistletoe and the vervain. I see the temples of the deaths of the bodies of gods, I see the old signifiers. I see Christ eating the bread of his last supper in the midst of youths and old persons. I see where the strong, divine young man, the Hercules, toiled faithfully and long and then died. I see the place of the innocent, rich life and hapless fate of the beautiful nocturnal sun the full-limbed Bacchus. I see Neph, blooming, dressed in blue, with the crown of feathers on his head. I see Hermes, unsuspected, dying, well-beloved, saying to the people, Do not weep for me. This is not my true country. I have lived banished from my true country. I now go back there. I return to the celestial sphere where everyone goes in his turn. 7. I see the battlefields of the earth. Grass grows upon them and blossoms and corn. I see the tracks of ancient and modern expeditions. I see the nameless masonries, venerable messages of the unknown events, heroes, records of the earth. I see the places of the sagas. I see pine trees and fir trees torn by northern blasts. I see granite boulders and cliffs. I see green meadows and lakes. I see the burial cairns of Scandinavian warriors.
I see them raised high with stones by the marge of restless oceans, that the dead men's spirits, when they wearied of their quiet graves, might rise up through the mounds and gaze on the tossing billows, and be refreshed by storms, immensity, liberty, action. I see the steppes of Asia, I see the tumuli of Mongolia, I see the tents of Kalmyks and Baskirs, I see the nomadic tribes with herds of oxen and cows, I see the tablelands notched with ravines, I see the jungles and deserts, I see the camel, the wild steed, the bustard, the fat-tailed sheep, the antelope, and the burrowing wolf. I see the highlands of Abyssinia, I see flocks of goats feeding, and see the fig tree, tamarind, date, and see fields of teff wheat and places of verdure and gold. I see the Brazilian vaquero, I see the Bolivian ascending Mount Sorata, I see the Waco crossing the plains. I see the incomparable rider of horses with his lasso on his arm. I see over the pampas the pursuit of wild cattle for their hides. 8. I see the regions of snow and ice. I see the sharp-eyed Samoyed and the Finn. I see the seal seeker in his boat poising his lance. I see the Siberian on his slight-built sledge drawn by dogs. I see the porpoise hunters. I see the whale crews of the South Pacific and the North Atlantic. I see the cliffs, glaciers, torrents, valleys of Switzerland. I mark the long winters and the isolation. I see the cities of the earth and make myself at random a part of them. I am a real Parisian. I am a habitant of Vienna, St. Petersburg, Berlin, Constantinople. I am of Adelaide, Sydney, Melbourne. I am of London, Manchester, Bristol, Edinburgh, Limerick. I am of Madrid. Cadiz, Barcelona, Oporto, Lyon, Brussels, Bern, Frankfurt, Stuttgart, Turin, Florence. I belong in Moscow, Krakow, Warsaw, or northward in Christiania, or Stockholm, or in Siberian Irkutsk, or in some street in Iceland. I descend upon all those cities and rise from them again. 10. I see vapors exhaling from unexplored countries. I see the savage types, the bow and arrow, the poisoned splint, the fetish and the obi. I see African and Asiatic towns. I see Algiers, Tripoli, Dern, Mogadore, Timbuktu, Monrovia. I see the swarms of Peking, Canton, Benares, Delhi, Calcutta, Tokyo. I see the Kruman in his hut, and the Dahaman and the Ashanti man in their huts. I see the Turk smoking opium in Aleppo. I see the picturesque crowds at the fairs of Kiva and those of Herat. I see Tehran, I see Muscat and Medina, and the intervening sands, see the caravans toiling onward. I see Egypt and the Egyptians, I see the pyramids and obelisks, I look on chiseled histories, records of conquering kings, dynasties, cut in slabs of sandstone or on granite blocks. I see at Memphis mummy pits containing mummies embalmed, swathed in linen cloth, lying there many centuries. I look on the fallen Theban, the large bald eyes, the side-drooping neck, 
the hands folded across the breast. I see all the menials of the earth laboring. I see all the prisoners in the prisons. I see the defective human bodies of the earth, the blind, the deaf and dumb, idiots, hunchbacks, lunatics, the pirates, thieves, betrayers, murderers, slave makers of the earth, the helpless infants and the helpless old men and women. I see male and female everywhere. I see the serene brotherhood of the philosophes. I see the constructiveness of my race. I see the results of the perseverance and industry of my race. I see ranks, colors, barbarisms, civilizations. I go among them. I mix indiscriminately. And I salute all the inhabitants of the earth. 11. You, whoever you are, you daughter or son of England, you of the mighty Slavic tribes and empires, you Rus in Russia, you dim descended black divine souled African, large, fine headed, nobly formed, superbly destined, on equal terms with me, you Norwegian, Swede, Dane, Icelander, you Prussian, you Spaniard of Spain, you Portuguese, you Frenchwoman and Frenchman of France, you Belga, you liberty lover of the Netherlands, you stock whence I myself have descended, you sturdy Austrian, you Lombard, Hun, Bohemian, farmer of Styria, you neighbor of the Danube, you working man of the Rhine, the Elba, or the Vesser, you working woman too, you Sardinian, you Bavarian, Swabian, Saxon, Wallachian, Bulgarian, you Roman, Neapolitan, you Greek, you lithe matador in the arena at Seville, you mountaineer living lawlessly on the Taurus or Caucasus, you Bach horse herd watching your mares and stallions feeding, you beautiful bodied Persian at full speed in the saddle shooting arrows to the mark, you Chinaman and China woman of China, you Tartar of Tartary, you women of the earth subordinated at your tasks, you Jew journeying in your old age through every risk to stand once on Syrian ground, you other Jews waiting in all lands for your Messiah, you thoughtful Armenian pondering by some stream of the Euphrates, you peering amid the ruins of Nineveh, you ascending Mount Ararat, you foot-worn pilgrim welcoming the faraway sparkle of the minarets of Mecca, you sheiks along the stretch from Suez to Bab el Manteb, ruling your families and tribes, you olive grower tending your fruit on fields of Nazareth, Damascus, or Lake Tiberias, you Tibet trader on the wide inland or bargaining in the shops of Lhasa, you Japanese man or woman, you liver in Madagascar, Ceylon, Sumatra, Borneo, all you continentals of Asia, Africa, Europe, Australia, indifferent of place, all you on the numberless islands of the archipelagos of the sea, and you of centuries hence when you listen to me, and you each and everywhere whom I specify not, but include just the same, health to you, good will to you all from me and America sent. Each of us inevitable, each of us limitless, each of us with his or her right upon the earth, each of us allowed the eternal purports of the earth, 
each of us here as divinely as any is here. 12. You Hottentot with clicking palate, you woolly-haired hordes, you owned persons dropping sweat drops or blood drops, you human forms with the fathomless, ever-impressive countenances of brutes, you poor Kobu, whom the meanest of the rest look down upon for all your glimmering language and spirituality, you dwarfed Kamshatkan, Greenlander, Lap, you Austral Negro, naked, red, sooty, with protrusive lip, groveling, seeking your food, you Kafra, Berber, Sudanese, you haggard, uncouth, untutored Bedouin, you plague swarms in Madras, Nankin, Kabul, Cairo, you benighted roamer of Amazonia, you Patagonian, you Fiji man, I do not prefer others so very much before you either. I do not say one word against you. Away back there where you stand, you will come forward in due time to my side. 13. My spirit has passed in compassion and determination around the whole earth. I have looked for equals and lovers and found them ready for me in all lands. I think some divine report has equalized me with them. You vapors, I think I have risen with you, moved away to distant continents and fallen down there for reasons. I think I have blown with you, you winds. You waters, I have fingered every shore with you. I have run through what any river or strait of the globe has run through. I have taken my stand on the bases of peninsulas and on the high embedded rocks to cry thence, What cities the light or warmth penetrates, I penetrate those cities myself. All islands to which birds wing their way, I wing my way myself. Toward you all, in America's name, I raise high the perpendicular hand, I make the signal, to remain after me in sight forever, for all the haunts and homes of men. Here ends Book 6. Book 7. Song of the Open Road. 1. Afoot and light-hearted I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me leading wherever I choose. Henceforth I ask not good fortune, I myself am good fortune. Henceforth I whimper no more, postpone no more, need nothing. Done with indoor complaints, libraries, querulous criticisms, strong and content I travel the open road. The earth, that is sufficient. I do not want the constellations any nearer. I know they are very well where they are. I know they suffice for those who belong to them. Still here I carry my old delicious burdens. I carry them, men and women, I carry them with me wherever I go. I swear it is impossible for me to get rid of them. I am filled with them, and I will fill them in return. 2. You road I enter upon and look around. I believe you are not all that is here. I believe that much unseen is also here. Hear the profound lesson of reception, nor preference nor denial, 
the black with his woolly head, the felon, the diseased, the illiterate person are not denied. The birth, the hasting after the physician, the beggar's tramp, the drunkard's stagger, the laughing party of mechanics. The escaped youth, the rich person's carriage, the fop, the eloping couple. The early market man, the hearse, the moving of furniture into the town, the return back from the town. They pass, I also pass, anything passes, none can be interdicted. None but are accepted, none but shall be dear to me. 3. You air that serves me with breath to speak, you objects that call from diffusion my meanings and give them shape, you light that wraps me and all things in delicate, equable showers, you paths worn in the irregular hollows by the roadsides, I believe you are latent with unseen existences, you are so dear to me. You flagged walks of the cities, you strong curbs at the edges, you ferries, you planks and posts of wharves, you timber-lined side, you distant ships, you rows of houses, you window-pierced facades, you roofs, you porches and entrances, you copings and iron guards, you windows whose transparent shells might expose so much, you doors and ascending steps, you arches, you gray stones of interminable pavements, you trodden crossings. From all that has touched you, I believe you have imparted to yourselves, and now would impart the same secretly to me. From the living and the dead, you have peopled your impassive surfaces, and the spirits thereof would be evident and amicable with me. 4. The earth expanding right hand and left hand, the picture alive, every part in its best light, the music falling in where it is wanted, and stopping where it is not wanted the cheerful voice of the public road, the gay, fresh sentiment of the road. O oh, highway I travel, do you say to me, do not leave me? Do you say, venture not, if you leave me you are lost? Do you say, I am already prepared, I am well beaten and undenied, adhere to me? O oh, public road, I say back I am not afraid to leave you, yet I love you. You express me better than I can express myself. You shall be more to me than my poem. I think heroic deeds were all conceived in the open air, and all free poems also. I think I could stop here myself and do miracles. I think whatever I shall meet on the road I shall like, and whoever beholds me shall like me. I think whoever I see must be happy. 5. From this hour I ordain myself loosed of limits and imaginary lines, going where I list, my own master total and absolute listening to others, considering well what they say, pausing, searching, receiving, contemplating, gently but with undeniable will, divesting myself of the holds that would hold me. I inhale great draughts of space. The east and the west are mine, and the north and the south are mine. I am larger, better than I thought. I did not know I held so much goodness. All seems beautiful to me, can repeat over to men and women, you have done such good to me, I would do the same to you.
I will recruit for myself and you as I go. I will scatter myself among men and women as I go. I will toss a new gladness and roughness among them. Whoever denies me it shall not trouble me. Whoever accepts me, he or she shall be blessed and shall bless me. 6. Now if a thousand perfect men were to appear, it would not amaze me. Now if a thousand beautiful forms of women appeared, it would not astonish me. Now I see the secret of the making of the best persons. It is to grow in the open air and to eat and sleep with the earth. Here a great personal deed has room. Such a deed seizes upon the hearts of the whole race of men. Its effusion of strength and will overwhelms law and mocks all authority and all argument against it. Here is the test of wisdom. Wisdom is not finally tested in schools. Wisdom cannot be passed from one having it to another not having it. Wisdom is of the soul, is not susceptible of proof, is its own proof, applies to all stages and objects and qualities, and is content, is the certainty of the reality and immorality of things, and the excellence of things. Something there is in the float of the sight of things that provokes it out of the soul. Now I re-examine philosophies and religions. They may prove well in lecture rooms, yet not prove at all under the spacious clouds and along the landscape and flowing currents. Here is realization. Here is a man tallied. He realizes here what he has in him. The past, the future, majesty, love, if they are vacant of you, you are vacant of them. Only the kernel of every object nourishes. Where is he who tears off the husks for you and me? Where is he that undoes stratagems and envelopes for you and me? Here is adhesiveness. It is not previously fashioned. It is apropos. Do you know what it is as you pass to be loved by strangers? Do you know the talk of those turning eyeballs? 7. Here is the efflux of the soul. The efflux of the soul comes from within, through embowered gates, ever-provoking questions. These yearnings, why are they? These thoughts in the darkness, why are they? Why are there men and women that while they are nigh me, the sunlight expands my blood. Why, when they leave me, do my penance of joy sink flat and lank? Why are there trees I never walk under, but large and melodious thoughts descend upon me? I think they hang there winter and summer on those trees, and always drop fruit as I pass. What is it I interchange so suddenly with strangers? What with some driver as I ride on the seat by his side? What with some fisherman drawing his seine by the shore as I walk by and pause? What gives me to be free to a woman's and man's good will? What gives them to be free to mine? 8. The efflux of the soul is happiness, here is happiness. I think it pervades the open air, waiting at all times. Now it flows unto us, we are rightly charged. Here rises the fluid and attaching character. The fluid and attaching character is the freshness and sweetness of man and woman. The herbs of the morning sprout no fresher and sweeter every day out of the roots of themselves than it sprouts fresh and sweet continually out of itself. Toward the fluid and attaching character exudes the sweat of the love of young and old. 
From it falls distilled the charm that mocks beauty and attainments. Toward it heaves the shuddering longing ache of contact. 9. Alon, whoever you are, come travel with me. Traveling with me you find what never tires. The earth never tires. The earth is rude, silent, incomprehensible at first. Nature is rude and incomprehensible at first. Be not discouraged. Keep on. There are divine things well enveloped. I swear to you there are divine things more beautiful than words can tell. Alon, we must not stop here. However sweet these laid-up stores, however convenient this dwelling, we cannot remain here. However sheltered this port, and however calm these waters, we must not anchor here. However welcome the hospitality that surrounds us, we are permitted to receive it but a little while. 10. Alon, the inducements shall be greater. We will sail pathless and wild seas. We will go where winds blow, waves dash, and the Yankee clipper speeds by under full sail. Alon, with power, liberty, the earth, the elements, health, defiance, gaiety, self-esteem, curiosity, alon, from all formules. From your formules, O oh, bat-eyed and materialistic priests. The stale cadaver blocks up the passage, the burial waits no longer. Alon, yet take warning, he traveling with me needs the best blood, fuse, endurance. None may come to the trial till he or she bring courage and health. Come not here if you have already spent the best of yourself. Only those may come who come in sweet and determined bodies. No diseased person, no rum drinker, or venereal taint is permitted here. I and mine do not convince by arguments, similes, rhymes. We convince by our presence. 11. Listen, I will be honest with you. I do not offer the old smooth prizes, but offer rough new prizes. These are the days that must happen to you. You shall not heap up what is called riches. You shall scatter with lavish hand all that you earn or achieve. You but arrive at the city to which you were destined. You hardly settle yourself to satisfaction before you are called by an irresistible call to depart. You shall be treated to the ironical smiles and mockings of those who remain behind you. What beckonings of love you receive, you shall only answer with passionate kisses of parting. You shall not allow the hold of those who spread their reached hands toward you. 12. Alon, after the great companions, and to belong to them. They too are on the road. They are the swift and majestic men. They are the greatest women, enjoyers of calms of seas and storms of seas, sailors of many a ship, walkers of many a mile of land, habitues of many distant countries, habitues of far distant dwellings, trusters of men and women, observers of cities, solitary toilers, Pausers and contemplators of tufts, blossoms, shells of the shore, dancers at wedding dances, kissers of brides, tender helpers of children, bearers of children, soldiers of revolts, standers by gaping graves, lowers down of coffins, journeyers over consecutive seasons, over the years 
the curious years each emerging from that which preceded it. Journeyers as with companions, namely their own diverse phases. Fourth steppers from the latent unrealized baby days. Journeyers gaily with their own youth, journeyers with their bearded and well-grained manhood. Journeyers with their womanhood, ample unsurpassed content. Journeyers with their own sublime old age of manhood or womanhood. Old age, calm, expanded, broad with the haughty breadth of the universe. Old age, flowing free with the delicious nearby freedom of death. 13. Along, to that which is endless as it was beginningless, to undergo much, tramps of days, rests of nights, to merge all in the travel they tend to, and the days and nights they tend to, again to merge them in the start of superior journeys, to see nothing anywhere but what you may reach it and pass it, to conceive no time, however distant, but what you may reach it and pass it, to look up or down no road, but it stretches and waits for you, however long, but it stretches and waits for you, to see no being, not gods or any, but you also go thither, to see no possession, but you may possess it, enjoying all without labor or purchase, abstracting the feast yet not abstracting one particle of it, to take the best of the farmer's farm and the rich man's elegant villa, and the chaste blessings of the well-married couple, and the fruits of orchards and flowers of gardens, to take to your use out of the compact cities as you pass through, to carry buildings and streets with you afterward wherever you go, to gather the minds of men out of their brains as you encounter them, to gather the love out of their hearts, to take your lovers on the road with you for all that you leave them behind you, to know the universe itself as a road, as many roads, as roads for traveling souls. All parts away for the progress of souls. All religion, all solid things, arts, governments, all that was or is apparent upon this globe or any globe falls into niches and corners before the procession of souls along the grand roads of the universe. Of the progress of the souls of men and women along the grand roads of the universe, all other progress is the needed emblem and sustenance. Forever alive, forever forward, stately, solemn, sad, withdrawn, baffled, mad, turbulent, feeble, dissatisfied, desperate, proud, fond, sick, accepted by men, rejected by men. They go, they go. I know that they go, but I know not where they go, but I know that they go toward the best, toward something great. Whoever you are, come forth, or man or woman come forth. You must not stay sleeping and dallying there in the house, though you built it, or though it has been built for you. Out of the dark confinement, out from behind the screen, it is useless to protest. I know all and expose it. Behold, through you as bad as the rest, through the laughter, dancing, dining, supping of people, inside of dresses and ornaments, inside of those washed and trimmed faces. Behold, a secret silent loathing and despair. No husband, no wife, no friend, trusted to hear the confession, another self, a duplicate of every one, skulking and hiding it goes, 
formless and wordless through the streets of the cities, polite and bland in the parlors, in the cars of railroads, in steamboats, in the public assembly, home to the houses of men and women, at the table, in the bedroom, everywhere. Smartly attired, countenance smiling, form upright, death under the breast bones, hell under the skull bones, under the broadcloth and gloves, under the ribbons and artificial flowers, keeping fair with the customs, speaking not a syllable of itself, speaking of anything else, but never of itself. 14. Alone, through struggles and wars, the goal that was named cannot be countermanded. Have the past struggles succeeded? What has succeeded? Yourself? Your nation? Nature? Now understand me well. It is provided in the essence of things that from any fruition of success, no matter what, shall come forth something to make a greater struggle necessary. My call is the call of battle. I nourish active rebellion. He going with me must go well armed. He going with me goes often with spare diet, poverty, angry enemies, desertions. 15. Alon. The road is before us. It is safe. I have tried it. My own feet have tried it well. Be not detained. Let the paper remain on the desk unwritten, and the book on the shelf unopened. Let the tools remain in the workshop. Let the money remain unearned. Let the school stand. Mind not the cry of the teacher. Let the preacher preach in his pulpit. Let the lawyer plead in the court, and the judge expound the law. Camarado, I give you my hand. I give you my love more precious than money. I give you myself before preaching or law. Will you give me yourself? Will you come travel with me? Shall we stick by each other as long as we live? Here ends Book 7. Today's reading is by Chris Mitchell. The Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Book 8. Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. 1. Flood tide below me. I see you face to face. Clouds of the west, sun there half an hour high. I see you also face to face. Crowds of men and women attired in the usual costumes. How curious you are to me. On the ferry boats, the hundreds and hundreds that cross, returning home, are more curious to me than you suppose. And you that shall cross from shore to shore years hence are more to me and more in my meditations than you might suppose. 2. The impalpable sustenance of me from all things at all hours of the day, the simple, compact, well-joined scheme, myself disintegrated, everyone disintegrated yet part of the scheme. The similitudes of the past and those of the future, the glories strung like beads on my smallest sights and hearings, on the walk, in the street, and the passage over the river, the current rushing so swiftly and swimming with me far away, the others that are to follow me, the ties between me and them, the certainty of others, the life, love, sight, hearing of others. Others will enter the gates of the ferry and cross from shore to shore. Others will watch the run of the flood tide. Others will see the shipping of Manhattan north and west, and the heights of Brooklyn to the south and east. 
others will see the islands large and small. Fifty years hence, others will see them as they cross, the sun half an hour high. A hundred years hence, or ever so many hundred years hence, others will see them, will enjoy the sunset, the pouring in of the flood tide, the falling back to the sea of the ebb tide. 3. It avails not time nor place, distance avails not. I am with you, you men and women of a generation, or ever so many generations hence. Just as you feel when you look on the river and sky, so I felt. Just as any one of you is one of a living crowd, I was one of a crowd. Just as you are refreshed by the gladness of the river and the bright flow, I was refreshed. Just as you stand and lean on the rail, yet hurry with the swift current, I stood, yet was hurried. Just as you look on the numberless masts of ships and the thick-stemmed pipes of steamboats, I looked. I, too, many and many a time crossed the river of old, watched the twelfth-month seagulls, saw them high in the air, floating with motionless wings, oscillating their bodies saw how the glistening yellow lit up parts of their bodies and left the rest in strong shadow, saw the slow wheeling circles and the gradual edging toward the south, saw the reflection of the summer sky in the water, had my eyes dazzled by the shimmering track of beams, looked at the fine centrifugal spokes of light round the shape of my head in the sunlit water looked on the haze on the hills southward and southwestward, looked on the vapor as it flew in fleeces tinged with violet, looked toward the lower bay to notice the vessels arriving, saw their approach, saw aboard those that were near me, saw the white sails of schooners and sloops, saw the ships at anchor, the sailors at work in the rigging or out astride the spars, the round masts, the swinging motion of the hulls, the slender serpentine pennants, the large and small steamers in motion, the pilots in their pilot houses, the white wake left by the passage, the quick tremulous whirl of the wheels, the flags of all nations, the falling of them at sunset, the scallop-edged waves in the twilight, the ladled cups, the frolicsome crests and glistening, the stretch afar growing dimmer and dimmer, the gray walls of the granite storehouses by the docks. On the river, the shadowy group, the big steam tug closely flanked on each side by the barges, the hay boat, the belated lighter. On the neighboring shore, the fires from the foundry chimneys burning high and glaring into the night, casting their flicker of black contrasted with wild red and yellow light over the tops of houses and down into the clefts of streets. 4. These and all else were to me the same as they are to you. I loved well those cities, loved well the stately and rapid river. The men and women I saw were all near to me. Others the same, others who look back on me because I looked forward to them. The time will come, though I stop here today and tonight. 5. What is it then between us? What is the count of the scores or hundreds of years between us? Whatever it is, it avails not, distance avails not, and place avails not. I too lived, Brooklyn of ample hills was mine. I too walked the streets of Manhattan Island and bathed in the waters around it. I, too, felt the curious, abrupt questioning stir within me. 
In the day among crowds of people, sometimes they came upon me. In my walks home late at night, or as I lay in my bed, they came upon me. I, too, had been struck from the float forever held in solution. I, too, had received identity by my body. That I was, I knew, was of my body. And what I should be, I knew, I should be of my body. 6. It is not upon you alone the dark patches fall. The dark threw its patches down upon me also. The best I had done seemed to me blank and suspicious. My great thoughts as I supposed them, were they not in reality meeker? Nor is it you alone who know what it is to be evil. I am he who knew what it was to be evil. I too knitted the old knot of contrariety. Blabbed, blushed, resented, lied, stole, grudged, had guile, anger, lust, hot wishes I dared not speak, was wayward, vain, greedy, shallow, sly, cowardly, malignant. The wolf, the snake, the hog, not wanting in me, the cheating look, the frivolous word, the adulterous wish, not wanting. Refusals, hates, postponements, meanness, laziness, none of these wanting was one with the rest, the days and haps of the rest, was called by my nighest name by clear, loud voices of young men as they saw me approaching or passing, felt their arms on my neck as I stood, or the negligent leaning of their flesh against me as I sat, saw many I loved in the street or ferry boat or public assembly, yet never told them a word. Lived the same life with the rest, the same old, laughing, gnawing, sleeping, played the part that still looks back on the actor or actress, the same old role, the role that is what we make it, as great as we like, or as small as we like, or both great and small. 7. Closer yet I approach you. What thought you have of me now, I had as much of you. I laid in my stores in advance. I considered long and seriously of you before you were born. Who was to know what should come home to me? Who knows, but I am enjoying this. Who knows, for all the distance, but I am as good as looking at you now. For all you cannot see me. 8. Ah, what can ever be more stately and admirable to me than mast hemmed Manhattan? River and sunset and scallop edged waves of flood tide, the seagulls oscillating their bodies, the hay boat in the twilight, and the belated lighter. What gods can exceed these that clasp me by the hand, and with voices I love, call me promptly and loudly by my nighest name as approach? What is more subtle than this which ties me to the woman or man that looks in my face? Which fuses me into you now, and pours my meaning into you? We understand, then, do we not? What I promised without mentioning it, have you not accepted? What the study could not teach, what the preaching could not accomplish, is accomplished, is it not? 9. Flow on, river, flow with the flood tide and ebb with the ebb tide. Frolic on, crested and scalloped edged waves. Gorgeous clouds of the sunset, drench with your splendor me, or the men and women generations after me. Cross from shore to shore, countless crowds of passengers. Stand up, tall masts of Manahatta, stand up, beautiful hills of Brooklyn. 
throb, baffled and curious brain, throw out questions and answers. Suspend here and everywhere eternal float of solution. Gaze, loving and thirsting eyes, in the house or street or public assembly. Sound out voices of young men, loudly and musically call me by my nighest name. Live old life, play the part that looks back on the actor or actress. Play the old role, the role that is great or small according as one makes it. Consider, you who peruse me, whether I may not in unknown ways be looking upon you. Be firm, rail over the river to support those who lean idly, yet haste with the hasting current. Fly on, seabirds, fly sideways, or wheel in large circles high in the air. Receive the summer sky, you water, and faithfully hold it till all downcast eyes have time to take it from you. Diverge fine spokes of light from the shape of my head or anyone's head in the sunlit water. Come on, ships from the lower bay, pass up or down, white-sailed, schooners, sloops, lighters. Flaunt away flags of all nations, be duly lowered at sunset. Burn high your fires, foundry chimneys, cast black shadows at nightfall, cast red and yellow light over the tops of the houses. Appearances, now or henceforth, indicate what you are. You necessary film, continue to envelop the soul. About my body for me and your body for you be hung our divinest aromas. Thrive cities, bring your freight, bring your shows, ample and sufficient rivers. Expand, being than which none else is perhaps more spiritual. Keep your places, objects than which none else is more lasting. You have waited, you always wait, you dumb, beautiful ministers. We receive you with free sense at last, and are insatiate henceforward. Not you any more shall be able to foil us, or withhold yourselves from us. We use you, and do not cast you aside. We plant you permanently within us. We fathom you not, we love you. There is perfection in you also. You furnish your parts toward eternity. Great or small, you furnish your parts toward the soul. Here ends Book 8. Book 9. Song of the Answerer. 1. Now list to my morning's romanza. I tell the signs of the answerer. To the cities and farms I sing as they spread in the sunshine before me. A young man comes to me bearing a message from his brother. How shall the young man know the whether and when of his brother? Tell him to send me the signs, and I stand before the young man face to face and take his right hand in my left hand and his left hand in my right hand. And I answer for his brother and for men, and I answer for him that answers for all and send these signs. Him all wait for, him all yield up to, his word is decisive and final. Him they accept, in him lave, in him perceive themselves as amid light. Him they immerse and he immerses them. Beautiful women, the haughtiest nations, laws, the landscape, people, animals, the profound earth and its attributes and the unquiet ocean, so tell I my morning's romanza. All enjoyments and properties and money, and whatever money will buy, the best farms, others toiling and planting, and he unavoidably reaps, 
the noblest and costliest cities, others grading and building, and he domiciles there. Nothing for any one but what is for him, near and far are for him, the ships in the offing, the perpetual shows and marches on land are for him if they are for anybody. He puts things in their attitudes. He puts today out of himself with plasticity and love. He places his own times, reminiscences, parents, brothers and sisters, associations, employment, politics, so that the rest never shame them afterward, nor assume to command them. He is the answerer. What can be answered, he answers, and what cannot be answered, he shows how it cannot be answered. A man is a summons and challenge. It is vain to skulk. Do you hear that mocking and laughter? Do you hear the ironical echoes? Books, friendships, philosophers, priests, action, pleasure, pride, beat up and down seeking to give satisfaction. He indicates the satisfaction and indicates them that beat up and down also. Whichever the sex, whatever the season or place, he may go freshly and gently and safely by day or by night. He has the passkey of hearts, to him the response of the prying of hands on the knobs. His welcome is universal. The flow of beauty is not more welcome or universal than he is. The person he favors by day or sleeps with at night is blessed. Every existence has its idiom. Everything has an idiom and tongue. He resolves all tongues into his own and bestows it upon men, and any man translates, and any man translates himself also. One part does not counteract another part. He is the joiner. He sees how they join. He says indifferently and alike, How are you, friend? to the president at his levy. And he says, Good day, my brother, to Cudge that hoes in the sugar field, and both understand him and know that his speech is right. He walks with perfect ease in the capital. He walks among the Congress, and one representative says to another, Here is our equal appearing and new. Then the mechanics take him for a mechanic. And the soldiers suppose him to be a soldier, and the sailors that he has followed the sea. And the authors take him for an author, and the artists for an artist, and the laborers perceive he could labor with them and love them. No matter what the work is, that he is the one to follow it or has followed it. No matter what the nation, that he might find his brothers and sisters there. The English believe he comes of their English stock, a Jew to the Jew he seems, a Rus to the Rus, usual and near, removed from none. Whoever he looks at in the traveler's coffee house claims him. The Italian or Frenchman is sure, the German is sure, the Spaniard is sure, and the island Cuban is sure. The engineer, the deckhand on the Great Lakes, or on the Mississippi, or St. Lawrence, or Sacramento, or Hudson, or Pomonic Sound, claims him. The gentleman of perfect blood acknowledges his perfect blood, the insulter, the prostitute, the angry person, the beggar, see themselves in the ways of him, he strangely transmutes them. They are not vile any more. They hardly know themselves. They are so grown. 2. The indications and tally of time. Perfect sanity shows the master among philosophs. Time, always without break, indicates itself in parts. 
what always indicates the poet is the crowd of the pleasant company of singers and their words. The words of the singers are the hours or minutes of the light or dark, but the words of the maker of poems are the general light and dark. The maker of poems settles justice, reality, immortality. His insight and power encircle things and the human race. He is the glory and extract thus far of things and of the human race. The singers do not beget, only the poet begets. The singers are welcomed, understood, appear often enough, but rare has the day been, likewise the spot, of the birth of the maker of poems, the answerer. Not every century, nor every five centuries, has contained such a day for all its names. The singers of successive hours of centuries may have ostensible names, but the name of each of them is one of the singers. The name of each is eye singer, ear singer, head singer, sweet singer, night singer, parlor singer, love singer, weird singer, or something else. All this time and at all times wait the words of true poems. The words of true poems do not merely please. The true poets are not followers of beauty, but the august masters of beauty. The greatness of sons is the exuding of the greatness of mothers and fathers. The words of true poems are the tuft and final applause of science. Divine instinct, breadth of vision, the law of reason, health, rudeness of body, withdrawnness, gaiety, suntan, air sweetness, such are some of the words of poems. The sailor and traveler underlie the maker of poems, the answerer. The builder, geometer, chemist, anatomist, phrenologist, artist, all these underlie the maker of poems, the answerer. The words of the true poems give you more than poems. They give you to form for yourself poems, religions, politics, war, peace, behavior, histories, essays, daily life, and everything else. They balance ranks, colors, races, creeds, and the sexes. They do not seek beauty, they are sought. Forever touching them or close upon them follows beauty, longing, vain, lovesick. They prepare for death, yet are they not the finish but rather the outset. They bring none to his or her terminus or to be content and full. Whom they take, they take into space to behold the birth of stars, to learn one of the meanings, to launch off with absolute faith, to sweep through the ceaseless rings and never be quiet again. Here ends Book Nine. Book 10. Our Old Foilage Always our old foilage. Always Florida's green peninsula. Always the priceless delta of Louisiana. Always the cotton fields of Alabama and Texas. Always California's golden hills and hollows and the silver mountains of New Mexico. Always soft breathed Cuba. Always the vast slope drained by the southern sea, inseparable with the slopes drained by the eastern and western seas. The area, the 83rd year of these states, the three and a half millions of square miles. The 18,000 miles of sea coast and bay coast on the main the 30,000 miles of river navigation, the seven millions of distinct families in the same number of dwellings, 
always these, and more, branching forth into numberless branches. Always the free range and diversity, always the continent of democracy, always the prairies, pastures, forests, vast cities, travelers, Canada, the snows. Always these compact lands tied at the hips with the belt stringing the huge oval lakes. Always the west with strong native persons, the increasing density there, the habitants, friendly, threatening, ironical, scorning invaders. All sites, south, north, east, all deeds, promiscuously done at all times, all characters, movements, growths, a few noticed, myriads unnoticed, through Manhattan's streets I walking, these things gathering, on interior rivers by night in the glare of pine knots, steamboats wooding up, sunlight by day on the valley of the Susquehanna, and on the valleys of the Potomac and the Rappahannock, and the valleys of the Roanoke and Delaware. In their northerly wilds, beasts of prey haunting the Adirondacks, the hills, or lapping the Saginaw waters to drink. In a lonesome inlet, a shell drake lost from the flock, sitting on the water, rocking silently. In farmers' barns, oxen in the stable, their harvest labor done, they rest standing, they are too tired. Afar on arctic ice, the she-walrus lying drowsily while her cubs play around, the hawk sailing where men have not yet sailed, the farthest polar sea, ripply, crystalline, open, beyond the flows. White drift spooning ahead where the ship in the tempest dashes. On solid land, what is done in cities as the bells strike midnight together? In primitive woods, the sounds there also sounding, the howl of the wolf, the scream of the panther, and the hoarse bellow of the elk. In winter, beneath the hard blue ice of Moosehead Lake, in summer, visible through the clear waters, the great trout swimming. In lower latitudes, in warmer air, in the Carolinas, the large black buzzard floating slowly high beyond the treetops. Below, the red cedar festooned with Tylandria, the pines and cypresses growing out of the white sand that spreads far and flat. Rude boats descending the big pedi, climbing plants, parasites with colored flowers and berries enveloping huge trees. The waving drapery on the live oak trailing long and low, noiselessly waved by the wind. The camp of Georgia wagoners just after dark, the supper fires and the cooking and eating by whites and negroes. Thirty or forty great wagons, the mules, cattle, horses, feeding from troughs. The shadows, gleams, up under the leaves of the old sycamore trees, the flames with the black smoke from the pitch pine curling and rising. Southern fishermen fishing, the sounds and inlets of North Carolina's coast, the shad fishery and the herring fishery the large sweep sands, the windlasses on shore warped by horses, the clearing, curing, and packing houses. Deep in the forest, in piney woods, turpentine dropping from the incisions in the trees, there are the turpentine works. There are the Negroes at work in good health, the ground in all directions is covered with pine straw. In Tennessee and Kentucky, slaves busy in the coalings, at the forge, by the furnace blaze, or at the corn chucking. In Virginia, the planter's son returning after a long absence, 
joyfully welcomed and kissed by the aged mulatto nurse. On rivers, boatmen safely moored at nightfall in their boats under shelter of high banks. Some of the younger men dance to the sound of the banjo or fiddle. Others sit on the gunwale smoking and talking. Late in the afternoon, the mockingbird, the American mimic, singing in the great dismal swamp. There are the greenish waters, the resinous odor, the plenteous moss, the cypress tree, and the juniper tree. Northward, young men of Manahatta, the target company from an excursion returning home at evening, the musket muzzles all bear bunches of flowers presented by women. Children at play, or on his father's lap, a young boy fallen asleep. How his lips move, how he smiles in his sleep. The scout riding on horseback over the plains west of the Mississippi, he ascends a knoll and sweeps his eyes around. California life, the miner, bearded, dressed in his rude costume, the stanch California friendship, the sweet air, the graves one in passing meets, solitary, just aside the horse path. Down in Texas the cotton field, the negro cabins, drivers driving mules or oxen before rude carts, cotton bales piled on banks and wharves. Encircling all, vast, darting up and wide, the American soul, with equal hemispheres, one love, one dilation or pride. In Arriere, the peace talk with the Iroquois, the Aborigines, the Calumet, the pipe of goodwill, arbitration, and endorsement. The Sachem blowing the smoke first toward the sun and then toward the earth. The drama of the scalp dance enacted with painted faces and guttural exclamations. The setting out of the war party, the long and stealthy march. The single file, the swinging hatchets, the surprise and slaughter of enemies. All the acts, scenes, ways, persons, attitudes of these states, reminiscences, institutions. All these states compact, every square mile of these states without accepting a particle. Me pleased, rambling in lanes and country fields, pomonix fields, observing the spiral flight of two little yellow butterflies shuffling between each other, ascending high in the air. The darting swallow, the destroyer of insects, the fall traveler southward but returning northward early in the spring. The country boy at the close of the day, driving the herd of cows and shouting to them as they loiter to browse by the roadside. The city wharf, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Charleston, New Orleans, San Francisco. The departing ships when the sailors heave at the capstan. Evening, me in my room, the setting sun. The setting summer sun shining in my open window, showing the swarm of flies, suspended, balancing in the air in the center of the room, darting athwart, up and down, casting swift shadows and specks on the opposite wall where the shine is. The athletic American matron speaking in public to crowds of listeners, males, Females, immigrants, combinations, the copiousness, the individuality of the states, each for itself, the money makers, factories, machinery, the mechanical forces, the windlass, lever, pulley, all certainties. The certainty of space, increase, freedom, futurity. In space, the sporides, 
the scattered islands, the stars on the firm earth, the lands, my lands. O、oh, lands, all so dear to me, what you are, whatever it is, I putting it at random in these songs, become a part of that, whatever it is. Southward there, I screaming, with wings slow flapping, with the myriads of gulls wintering along the coasts of Florida. Other ways there, atwixt the banks of the Arkansas, the Rio Grande, the Nueces, the Brazos, the Tombigbee, the Red River, the Saskatchewan, or the Osage. I with the spring waters laughing and skipping and running. Northwards on the sands, on some shallow bay of Pomonic, I with parties of snowy herons wading in the wet to seek worms and aquatic plants. Retreating triumphantly, twittering the king bird from piercing the crow with its bill for amusement. And I triumphantly twittering, the migrating flock of wild geese alighting in autumn to refresh themselves. The body of the flock feed. The sentinels outside move around with erect heads watching, and are from time to time relieved by other sentinels. And I feeding and taking turns with the rest. In Canadian forests, the moose, large as an ox, cornered by hunters, rising desperately on his hind feet and plunging with his forefeet, the hoofs as sharp as knives, and I plunging at the hunters, cornered and desperate. In the Manahatta, streets, piers, shipping, storehouses. And the countless workmen working in the shops, and I too of the Manahatta, singing thereof, and no less in myself than the whole of the Manahatta in itself, singing the song of these my ever united lands, my body no more inevitably united, part to part, and made out of a thousand diverse contributions, one identity. Any more than my lands are inevitably united and made one identity. Nativities, climates, the grass of the great pastoral plains, cities, labors, death, animals, products, war, good and evil, these me. These affording in all their particulars. The old foliage to me and to America. How can I do less than pass the clue of the union of them to afford the like to you? Whoever you are, how can I but offer you divine leaves that you also be eligible as I am? How can I but as here chanting invite you for yourselves? To collect bouquets of the incomparable foliage of these states. Here ends Book Ten. Today's reading is by Chris Mitchell. The Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Book Eleven, A Song of Joys. Oh, to make the most jubilant song, full of music, full of manhood, womanhood, infancy, full of common employments, full of grain and trees. Oh, for the voices of animals. Oh, for the swiftness and balance of fishes. Oh, for the dropping of raindrops in a song. Oh, for the sunshine and motion of waves in a song! Oh, the joy of my spirit! It is uncaged. It darts like lightning. It is not enough to have this globe for a certain time. I will have thousands of globes and all time. 
Oh, the engineer's joys to go with the locomotive, to hear the hiss of steam, the merry shriek, the steam whistle, the laughing locomotive, to push with resistless way and speed off in the distance. Oh, the gleesome saunter over fields and hillsides, the leaves and flowers of the commonest weeds, the moist, fresh stillness of the woods, the exquisite smell of the earth at daybreak and all through the forenoon. Oh, the horseman's and horsewoman's joys, the saddle, the gallop, the pressure upon the seat, the cool gurgling by the ears and hair. Oh, the fireman's joys, I hear the alarm at dead of night, I hear bells, shouts, I pass the crowd, I run, the sight of the flames maddens me with pleasure. Oh, the joy of the strong bronzed fighter, towering in the arena in perfect condition, conscious of power, thirsting to meet his opponent. Oh, the joy of that vast elemental sympathy which only the human soul is capable of generating and emitting in steady and limitless floods. Oh, the mother's joys, the watching, the endurance, the precious love, the anguish, the patiently yielded life. Oh, the joy of increase, growth, recuperation, the joy of soothing and pacifying, the joy of concord and harmony. Oh, to go back to the place where I was born, to hear the birds sing once more, to ramble about the house and barn and over the fields once more, and through the orchard and along the old lanes once more. Oh, to have been brought up on bays, lagoons, creeks, or along the coast, to continue and be employed there all my life. The briny and damp smell, the shore, the salt weeds exposed at low water, the work of fishermen, the work of the eel fisher and clam fisher. I come with my clam rake and spade, I come with my eel spear. Is the tide out? I join the group of clam diggers on the flats. I laugh and work with them. I joke at my work like a mettlesome young man. In winter, I take my eel basket and eel spear and travel out on foot on the ice. I have a small axe to cut holes in the ice. Behold me well clothed, going gaily or returning in the afternoon, my brood of tough boys accompanying me, my brood of grown and part-grown boys who love to be with no one else so well as they love to be with me, by day to work with me and by night to sleep with me. Another time in warm weather out in a boat to lift the lobster pots where they are sunk with heavy stones. I know the buoys. Oh, the sweetness of the fifth month morning upon the water as I row just before sunrise toward the buoys. I pull the wicker pots up slantingly. The dark green lobsters are desperate with their claws as I take them out. I insert wooden pegs in the joints of their pincers. I go to all the places one after another and then row back to the shore. There in a huge kettle of boiling water, the lobsters shall be boiled till their color becomes scarlet. Another time mackerel taking, voracious, mad for the hook near the surface they seem to fill the water for miles. Another time fishing for rockfish in Chesapeake Bay, I, one of the brown-faced crew. Another time trailing for bluefish off Pomonic, 
I stand with braced body, my left foot is on the gunwale, my right arm throws far out the coils of slender rope. In sight around me the quick veering and darting of fifty skiffs, my companions. O oh, boating on the rivers, the voyage down the St. Lawrence, the superb scenery, the steamers, the ships sailing, the thousand islands, the occasional timber raft and the raftsmen with long reaching sweep oars, the little huts on the rafts, and the stream of smoke when they cook supper at evening. Oh, something pernicious and dread, something far away from a puny and pious life, something unproved, something in a trance, something escaped from the anchorage and driving free. Oh, to work in mines, or forging iron, foundry casting, the foundry itself, the rude high roof, the ample and shadowed space, the furnace, the hot liquid poured out and running. Oh, to resume the joys of the soldier, to feel the presence of a brave commanding officer, to feel his sympathy, to behold his calmness, to be warmed in the rays of his smile, to go to battle, to hear the bugles play and the drums beat, to hear the crash of artillery, to see the glittering of bayonets and musket barrels in the sun, to see men fall and die and not complain, to taste the savage taste of blood, to be so devilish, to gloat so over the wounds and deaths of the enemy. Oh, the whaleman's joys, oh, I cruise my old cruise again. I feel the ship's motion under me, I feel the Atlantic breezes fanning me. I hear the cry again, sent down from the masthead. There she blows. Again, I spring up the rigging to look with the rest. We descend, wild with excitement. I leap in the lowered boat. We row toward our prey where he lies. We approach stealthy and silent. I see the mountainous mass, lethargic, basking. I see the harpooners standing up. I see the weapon dart from his vigorous arm. Oh, swift again far out in the ocean, the wounded whale, settling, running to windward, tows me. Again I see him rise to breathe. We row close again. I see a lance driven through his side, pressed deep, turned in the wound. Again we back off. I see him settle again. The life is leaving him fast. As he rises, he spouts blood. I see him swim in circles, narrower and narrower. Swiftly cutting the water, I see him die. He gives one convulsive leap in the center of the circle, and then falls flat and still in the bloody foam. Oh, the manhood of me, my noblest joy of all, my children and grandchildren, my white hair and beard, my largeness, calmness, majesty, out of the long stretch of my life. Oh, ripened joy of womanhood, oh, happiness at last, I am more than eighty years of age, I am the most venerable mother, how clear is my mind, how all people draw nigh to me. What attractions are these beyond any before, what bloom more than the bloom of youth, what beauty is this that descends upon me and rises out of me. Oh, the orator's joys, to inflate the chest, to roll the thunder of the voice out from the ribs and throat, to make the people rage, weep, hate, desire with yourself, to lead America, to quell America with a great tongue. 
Oh, the joy of my soul leaning poised on itself, receiving identity through materials and loving them, observing characters and absorbing them. My soul vibrated back to me from them, from sight, hearing, touch, reason, articulation, comparison, memory, and the like. The real life of my senses and flesh transcending my senses and flesh. My body done with materials, my sight done with my material eyes. Proved to me this day beyond cavil that it is not my material eyes which finally see, nor my material body which finally loves, walks, laughs, shouts, embraces, procreates. Oh, the farmer's joys, Ohioans, Illinoisians, Wisconsinese, Canadians, Iowans, Kansians, Missourians, Oregonese joys, to rise at peep of day and pass forth nimbly to work, to plow land in the fall for winter sown crops, to plow land in the spring for maize, to train orchards, to graft the trees, to gather apples in the fall. Oh, to bathe in the swimming bath, or in a good place along shore, to splash the water, to walk ankle deep, or race naked along the shore. Oh, to realize space, the plenteousness of all, that there are no bounds, to emerge and be of the sky, of the sun and moon and flying clouds, as one with them. Oh, the joy of a manly selfhood, to be servile to none, to defer to none, not to any tyrant known or unknown, to walk with erect carriage, a step springy and elastic, to look with calm gaze or with a flashing eye, to speak with a full and sonorous voice out of a broad chest, to confront with your personality all the other personalities of the earth. Knowest thou the excellent joys of youth, joys of the dear companions and of the merry word and laughing face? Joy of the glad light beaming day, joy of the wide breathed games, joy of sweet music, joy of the lighted ballroom and the dancers, joy of the plenteous dinner, strong carouse and drinking, Yet, O oh, my soul supreme, knowest thou the joys of pensive thought, joys of the free and lonesome heart, the tender gloomy heart, joys of the solitary walk, the spirit bowed yet proud, the suffering and the struggle, the agonistic throes, the ecstasies, joys of the solemn musings day or night, joys of the thought of death, the great spheres, time, and space, prophetic joys of better, loftier love's ideals, the divine wife, the sweet, eternal, perfect comrade, joys all thine own, undying one, joys worthy thee, O soul. O while I live to be the ruler of life, not a slave, to meet life as a powerful conqueror, no fumes, no ennui, no more complaints or scornful criticisms. To these proud laws of the air, the water, and the ground, proving my interior soul impregnable, and nothing exterior shall ever take command of me. For not life's joys alone I sing, repeating, the joy of death, the beautiful touch of death, soothing and benumbing a few moments for reasons, myself discharging my excrementitious body to be burned or rendered to powder or buried, my real body doubtless left to me for other spheres, my voided body nothing more to me 
returning to the purifications, further offices, eternal uses of the earth. O oh, to attract by more than attraction, how it is I know not, yet behold, the something which obeys none of the rest, it is offensive, never defensive, yet how magnetic it draws. O oh, to struggle against great odds, to meet enemies undaunted, to be entirely alone with them, to find how much one can stand, to look strife, torture, prison, popular odium, face to face, to mount the scaffold, to advance to the muzzles of guns with perfect nonchalance, to be indeed a god. O oh, to sail to sea in a ship, to leave this steady, unendurable land, to leave the tiresome sameness of the streets, the sidewalks, and the houses, to leave you, O oh, you, solid, motionless land, and entering a ship to sail and sail and sail. O oh, to have life henceforth a poem of new joys, to dance, clap hands, exult, shout, skip, leap, roll on, float on, to be a sailor of the world bound for all ports, a ship itself, see indeed these sails I spread to the sun and air, a swift and swelling ship full of rich words, full of joys. Here ends Book 11. Book 12. Song of the Broad Axe. 1. Weapon shapely, naked, wan, head from the mother's bowels drawn, wooded flesh and metal bone, limb only one and lip only one, gray blue leaf by red heat grown, health produced from a little seed sown, resting the grass amid and upon, to be leaned and to lean on. Strong shapes and attributes of strong shapes, masculine trades, sights and sounds, long varied train of an emblem, dabs of music, fingers of the organist skipping staccato over the keys of the great organ. 2. Welcome are all earth's lands, each for its kind. Welcome our lands of pine and oak. Welcome our lands of the lemon and fig. Welcome our lands of gold. Welcome our lands of wheat and maize. Welcome those of the grape. Welcome our lands of sugar and rice. Welcome the cotton lands. Welcome those of the white potato and sweet potato. Welcome our mountains, flats, sands, forests, prairies. Welcome the rich borders of rivers, tablelands, openings. Welcome the measureless grazing lands. Welcome the teeming soil of orchards, flax, honey, hemp. Welcome just as much the other, more hard-faced lands. Lands rich as lands of gold or wheat and fruit lands. Lands of mines, lands of the manly and rugged ores. Lands of coal, copper, lead, tin, zinc. Lands of iron, lands of the make of the axe. 3. The log at the wood pile, the axe supported by it. The sylvan hut, the vine over the doorway, the space cleared for a garden. The irregular tapping of rain down on the leaves after the storm is lulled. The wailing and moaning at intervals, the thought of the sea. The thought of ships struck in the storm and put on their beam ends and the cutting away of masts. The sentiment of the huge timbers of old-fashioned houses and barns. The remembered print or narrative, 
the voyage at a venture of men, families, goods, the disembarkation, the founding of a new city, the voyage of those who sought a new England and found it, the outset anywhere, the settlements of the Arkansas, Colorado, Ottawa, Willamette, the slow progress, the scant fare, the axe, rifle, saddlebags, the beauty of all adventurous and daring persons, the beauty of wood boys and wood men with their clear untrimmed faces, the beauty of independence, departure, actions that rely on themselves, the American contempt for statutes and ceremonies, the boundless impatience of restraint, the loose drift of character, the inkling through random types, the solidification, the butcher in the slaughterhouse, the hands aboard schooners and sloops, the raftsman, the pioneer, lumbermen in their winter camp, daybreak in the woods, stripes of snow on the limbs of trees, the occasional snapping, the glad, clear sound of one's own voice, the merry song, the natural life of the woods, the strong day's work, the blazing fire at night, the sweet taste of supper, the talk, the bed of hemlock boughs and the bear skin, the house builder at work in cities or anywhere, the preparatory jointing, squaring, sawing, mortising, the hoist up of beams, the push of them in their places, laying them regular, setting the studs by their tenons in the mortises according as they were prepared, the blows of mallets and hammers, the attitudes of the men, their curved limbs, bending, standing, astride the beams, driving in pins, holding on by posts and braces. The hooked arm over the plate, the other arm wielding the axe. The floor men forcing the planks close to be nailed, their postures bringing their weapons downward on the bearers. The echoes resounding through the vacant building. The huge storehouse carried up in the city well underway. The six framing men two in the middle and two at each end, carefully bearing on their shoulders a heavy stick for a crossbeam. The crowded line of masons with trowels in their right hands rapidly laying the long sidewall, two hundred feet from front to rear. The flexible rise and fall of backs, the continual click of the trowels striking the bricks. The bricks one after another, each laid so workmanlike in its place, and set with a knock of the trowel handle. The piles of materials, the mortar on the mortar boards, and the steady replenishing by the hodmen. Spar makers in the spar yard, the swarming row of well-grown apprentices, the swing of their axes on the square-hued log shaping it toward the shape of a mast, the brisk short crackle of the steel driven slantingly into the pine, the butter-colored chips flying off in great flakes and slivers, the limber motion of brawny young arms and hips in easy costumes, the constructor of wharves, bridges, piers, bulkheads, floats, stays against the sea. The city firemen, the fire that suddenly bursts forth in the close-packed square. The arriving engines, the hoarse shouts, the nimble stepping and daring, the strong command through the fire trumpets, the falling in line, the rise and fall of the arms forcing the water. The slender, spasmic, blue-white jets, the bringing to bear of the hooks and ladders and their execution, the crash and cut away of connecting woodwork or through floors if the fire smolders under them, 
The crowd with their lit faces watching, the glare and dense shadows. The forger at his forge furnace and the user of iron after him. The maker of the axe, large and small, and the welder and temperer. The chooser breathing his breath on the cold steel and trying the edge with his thumb. The one who clean shapes the handle and sets it firmly in the socket. The shadowy processions of the portraits of the past users also. The primal, patient mechanics. The architects and engineers. The far-off Assyrian edifice and Mizra edifice. The Roman lictors preceding the consuls. The antique European warrior with his axe in combat. The uplifted arm. The clatter of blows on the helmeted head. The death howl, the limpsy tumbling body, the rush of friend and foe thither, the siege of revolted lieges determined for liberty, the summons to surrender, the battering at castle gates, the truce and parley, the sack of an old city in its time, the bursting in of mercenaries and bigots tumultuously and disorderly, roar, Flames, blood, drunkenness, madness. Goods freely rifled from houses and temples. Screams of women in the grip of brigands. Craft and thievery of camp followers. Men running, old persons despairing. The hell of war. The cruelties of creeds. The list of all executive deeds and words, just or unjust. The power of personality, just or unjust. 4. Muscle and pluck forever. What invigorates life invigorates death, and the dead advance as much as the living advance, and the future is no more uncertain than the present. For the roughness of the earth and of man encloses as much as the delicatesse of the earth and of man, and nothing endures but personal qualities. What do you think endures? What do you think a great city endures, or a teeming manufacturing state, or a prepared constitution, or the best built steamships? or hotels of granite and iron, or any chef d'oeuvres of engineering, forts, armaments. Away! These are not to be cherished for themselves. They fill their hour, the dancers dance, the musicians play for them, the show passes, all does well enough of course, all does very well till one flash of defiance. A great city is that which has the greatest men and women. If it be a few ragged huts, it is still the greatest city in the whole world. 5. The place where a great city stands is not the place of stretched wharves, docks, manufactures, deposits of produce merely nor the place of ceaseless salutes of newcomers or the anchor lifters of the departing, nor the place of the tallest and costliest buildings or shops selling goods from the rest of the earth, nor the place of the best libraries and schools, nor the place where money is plenteous, nor the place of the most numerous population. Where the city stands with the brawniest breed of orators and bards. Where the city stands that is beloved by these and loves them in return and understands them. Where no monuments exist to heroes but in the common words and deeds. Where thrift is in its place and prudence is in its place where the men and women think lightly of the laws, where the slave ceases and the master of slave ceases, where the populace rise at once against the never-ending audacity of elected persons, 
where fierce men and women pour forth as the sea to the whistle of death pours its sweeping and unripped waves, where outside authority enters always after the precedence of inside authority, where the citizen is always the head and ideal, and president, mayor, governor, and what not are agents for pay where children are taught to be laws to themselves and to depend on themselves, where equanimity is illustrated in affairs, where speculations on the soul are encouraged, where women walk in public processions in the streets the same as the men, where they enter the public assembly and take places the same as the men where the city of the faithfulest friends stands, where the city of the cleanliness of the sexes stands, where the city of the healthiest fathers stands, where the city of the best-bodied mothers stands, there the great city stands. 6. How beggarly appear arguments before a defiant deed, how the floridness of the materials of cities shrivels before a man's or woman's look. All waits or goes by default till a strong being appears. A strong being is the proof of the race and of the ability of the universe. When he or she appears, materials are overawed. The dispute on the soul stops the old customs and phrases are confronted, turned back, or laid away. What is your money making now? What can it do now? What is your respectability now? What are your theology, tuition, society, traditions, statute books now? Where are your jibes of being now? Where are your cavils about the soul now? 7. A sterile landscape covers the ore. There is as good as the best for all the forbidding appearance. There is the mine, there are the miners. The forge furnace is there, the melt is accomplished. The hammers men are at hand with their tongs and hammers. What always served and always serves is at hand. Than this nothing has better served, it has served all. Served the fluent tongue and subtle-sensed Greek, and long ere the Greek. Served in building the buildings that last longer than any. Served the Hebrew, the Persian, the most ancient Hindustani, Served the mound razor on the Mississippi, served those whose relics remain in Central America. Served albic temples in woods or on plains with unhewn pillars and the druids. Served the artificial clefts, vast, high, silent, on the snow-covered hills of Scandinavia served those who time out of mind made on the granite walls rough sketches of the sun, moon, stars, ships, ocean waves, served the paths of the eruptions of the Goths, served the pastoral tribes and nomads, served the long distant Celt, served the hardy pirates of the Baltic, served before any of those the venerable and harmless men of Ethiopia, served the making of helms for the galleys of pleasure and the making of those for war, served all great works on land and all great works on the sea, for the medieval ages and before the medieval ages, served not the living only then as now, but served the dead. 8. I see the European headsman. He stands masked, clothed in red, with huge legs and strong naked arms, and leans on a ponderous axe. 
Whom have you slaughtered lately, European headsman? Whose is that blood upon you so wet and sticky? I see the clear sunsets of the martyrs. I see from the scaffolds the descending ghosts. Ghosts of dead lords, uncrowned ladies, impeached ministers, rejected kings, rivals, traitors, poisoners, disgraced chieftains, and the rest. I see those who in any land have died for the good cause. The seed is spare, nevertheless the crop shall never run out. Mind you, O foreign kings, O priests, the crop shall never run out. I see the blood washed entirely away from the axe. Both blade and helve are clean. They spurt no more the blood of European nobles. They clasp no more the necks of queens. I see the headsmen withdraw and become useless. I see the scaffold untrodden and moldy. I see no longer any axe upon it. I see the mighty and friendly emblem of the power of my own race, the newest, largest race. 9. America, I do not vaunt my love for you. I have what I have. The axe leaps. The solid forest gives fluid utterances. They tumble forth. They rise and form. Hut. Tent. Landing, survey, flail, plow, pick, crowbar, spade, shingle, rail, prop, wainscot, lamb, lathe, panel, gable, citadel, ceiling, saloon, academy, organ, exhibition house, library, cornice, trellis, pilaster, Balcony, window, turret, porch, hoe, rake, pitchfork, pencil, wagon, staff, saw, jack plane, mallet, wedge, rounce, chair, tub, hoop, table, wicket, vein, sash, floor, workbox, chest, stringed instrument, Boat, frame, and what not. Capitals of states and capital of the nation of states. Long, stately rows in avenues. Hospitals for orphans or for the poor or sick. Manhattan steamboats and clippers taking the measure of all seas. The shapes arise. Shapes of the using of axes anyhow and the users and all that neighbors them, cutters down of wood and haulers of it to the Penobscot or Kennebec, dwellers in cabins among the Californian mountains or by the little lakes or on the Columbia, dwellers south on the banks of the Gila or Rio Grande, friendly gatherings, the characters and fun. Dwellers along the St. Lawrence, or north in Canada, or down by the Yellowstone, dwellers on coasts and off coasts, seal fishers, whalers, Arctic seamen, breaking passages through the ice. The shapes arise, shapes of factories, arsenals, foundries, markets, shapes of the two-threaded tracks of railroads, Shapes of the sleepers of bridges, vast frameworks, girders, arches. Shapes of the fleets of barges, tows, lake and canal craft, river craft. Shipyards and dry docks along the eastern and western seas, and in many a bay and by place. The live oak kelsons, the pine planks, the spars, the hackmatack roots for knees, the ships themselves on their ways, the tiers of scaffolds, the workmen busy outside and inside, the tools lying around, the great auger and little auger, the adze, bolt, line, 
square, gouge, and bead plane. 10. The shapes arise, the shape measured, sawed, jacked, joined, stained, the coffin shape for the dead to lie within in his shroud. The shape got out in posts, in the bedstead posts, in the posts of the bride's bed. The shape of the little trough, the shape of the rockers beneath, the shape of the babe's cradle, the shape of the floor planks, the floor planks for dancers' feet, the shape of the planks of the family home, the home of the friendly parents and children, the shape of the roof of the home of the happy young man and woman, the roof over the well-married young man and woman, the roof over the supper joyously cooked by the chaste wife and joyously eaten by the chaste husband, content after his day's work. The shapes arise, the shape of the prisoner's place in the courtroom and of him or her seated in the place, the shape of the liquor bar leaned against by the young rum drinker and the old rum drinker, the shape of the shamed and angry stairs trod by sneaking footsteps, the shape of the sly settee and the adulterous, unwholesome couple, the shape of the gambling board with its devilish winnings and losings, the shape of the stepladder for the convicted and sentenced murderer, the murderer with haggard face and pinioned arms, the sheriff at hand with his deputies, the silent and white-lipped crowd, the dangling of the rope, the shapes arise, shapes of doors giving many exits and entrances, the door passing the dissevered friend flushed and in haste, the door that admits good news and bad news, the door whence the son left home confident and puffed up, the door he entered again from a long and scandalous absence, diseased, broken down, without innocence, without means. 11. Her shape arises, she less guarded than ever, yet more guarded than ever. The gross and soiled she moves along do not make her gross and soiled. She knows the thoughts as she passes, nothing is concealed from her. She is none the less considerate or friendly therefore. She is the best beloved. It is without exception. She has no reason to fear, as she does not fear. Oaths, quarrels, hiccuped songs, smutty expressions are idle to her as she passes. She is silent. She is possessed of herself. They do not offend her. She receives them as the laws of nature receive them. She is strong. She too is a law of nature. There is no law stronger than she is. 12. The main shapes arise. Shapes of democracy total, result of centuries. Shapes ever projecting other shapes. Shapes of turbulent manly cities. Shapes of the friends and home givers of the whole earth. Shapes bracing the earth and braced with the whole earth. Here ends Book 12. Recording by Eric Armstrong. Please visit me on the web at voiceguy.blogspot.com. Leaves of Grass, Book 13. Song of the Exposition. One. Ah, little Rex the laborer, how near his work is holding him to God, the loving laborer through space and time. After all, not to create only, or found only, but to bring perhaps from afar what is already founded, to give it our own identity, average, limitless, free, to fill the gross, the torpid bulk, with vital religious fire, not to repel or destroy so much, 
as accept, fuse, rehabilitate, to obey as well as command, to follow more than to lead. These also are the lessons of our new world. While how little the new after all, how much the old, old world. Long and long has the grass been growing. Long and long has the rain been falling. Long has the globe been rolling round. Two. Come, muse, migrate from Greece and Ionia. Cross out, please, those immensely overpaid accounts. That matter of Troy and Achilles' wrath, and Aeneas's, Odysseus's wanderings. Placard removed and to let on the rocks of your snowy Parnassus. Repeat at Jerusalem, place the notice high on Jaffa's gate and on Mount Moriah. The same on the walls of your German, French, and Spanish castles and Italian collections, for know a better, fresher, busier sphere, a wide, untried domain awaits you, demands you. Three. Responsive to our summons, or rather to her long-nursed inclination, joined with an irresistible, natural gravitation, she comes. I hear the rustling of her gown. I scent the odor of her breath's delicious fragrance. I mark her step divine, her curious eyes a-turning, rolling upon this very scene. The dame of dames, can I believe then those ancient temples, sculptures classic, could none of them retain her? Nor shades of Virgil and Dante, nor myriad memories, poems, old associations, magnetize and hold on to her? But that she's left them all, and here? Yes, if you will allow me to say so, I, my friends, if you do not, can plainly see her the same undying soul of Earth's activities, beauties, heroism's expression, out from her evolutions hither come, ended the strata of her former themes, hidden and covered by today's foundation of today's, ended, deceased through time, her voice by Castile's fountain, silent the broken-lipped sphinx in Egypt, silent all those century-baffling tombs, Ended for A, the epics of Asia's, Europe's helmeted warriors. Ended the primitive call of the muses. Calliope's call forever closed. Cleo, Melpomene, Thalia, dead. Ended the stately rhythmus of Una and Oriana. Ended the quest of the Holy Graal. Jerusalem, a handful of ashes blown by the wind, extinct. The crusader's dreams of shadowy midnight troops sped with the sunrise. Amadis, Tancred, utterly gone. Charlemagne, Roland, Oliver, gone. Palmeran, Ogre, departed. Vanished the turrets that us from its waters reflected. Arthur vanished with all his knights. Merlin and Lancelot and Galahad, all gone. Dissolved utterly, like an exhalation. Past, past, for us, forever past. That once so mighty world now void, inanimate, phantom world, embroidered, dazzling, foreign world, with all its gorgeous legends, myths, its kings and castles proud, its priests and warlike lords and courtly dames, passed to its charnel vault, coffined with crown and armor on, blazoned with Shakespeare's purple page, and dirged by Tennyson's sweet, sad rhyme. I say I see, my friends, if you do not, the illustrious emigre, having, it is true, in her day, although the same changed, journeyed considerable, making directly for this rendezvous, vigorously clearing a path for herself, striding through the confusion by thud of machinery and shrill steam whistle undismayed, bluffed not a bit by drain pipe, gasometer, artificial fertilizers, smiling and pleased with palpable intent to stay. She's here, installed amid the kitchenware. But hold, don't I forget my manners, 
to introduce the stranger. What else indeed do I live to chant for? To thee, Columbia. In liberty's name, welcome, immortal. Clasp hands, and ever henceforth, sisters dear, be both. Fear not, O oh muse. Truly, new ways and days receive you, surround you. I candidly confess a queer, queer race of novel fashion, and yet the same old human race, the same within, without, faces and hearts the same, feelings the same, yearnings the same, the same old love, beauty, and use the same. Five. We do not blame thee, elder world, nor really separate ourselves from thee. Would the son separate himself from the father? Looking back on thee, seeing thee to thy duties, grandeurs, through past ages bending, building, we build to ours today. Mightier than Egypt's tombs, fairer than Grisha's, Roma's temples, prouder than Milan's statued spired cathedral, more picturesque than Rhenish castle keeps, we plan, even now, to raise beyond them all thy great cathedral sacred industry, no tomb, a keep for life, for practical invention. As in a waking vision, e'en while I chant, I see it rise, I scan and prophesy, outside and in, its manifold ensemble. Around a palace, loftier, fairer, ampler than any yet. Earth's modern wonder, history's seven outstripping, high rising tier on tier with glass and iron facades, gladdening the sun and sky, and hued in cheerfulest hues, bronze, lilac, robin's egg, marine and crimson, over whose golden roof shall flaunt beneath thy banner freedom, the banners of the states and flags of every land, a brood of lofty, fair but lesser palaces shall cluster. Somewhere within their walls shall all that forwards perfect human life be started, tried, taught, advanced, visibly exhibited. Not only all the world of works, trade, products, but all the workmen of the world here to be represented. Here shall you trace in flowing operation in every state of practical busy movement, the rills of civilization. Materials here, under your eye, shall change their shape as if by magic. The cotton shall be picked almost in the very field, shall be dried, cleaned, ginned, baled, spun into thread and cloth before you. You shall see hands at work at all the old processes and all the new ones. You shall see the various grains and how flour is made, and then bread baked by the bakers. You shall see the crude ores of California and Nevada passing on and on till they become bullion. You shall watch how the printer sets type and learn what a composing stick is. You shall mark in amazement the hoe press whirling its cylinders, shedding the printed leaves steady and fast. The photograph, model, watch, pin, nail shall be created before you. In large calm halls, a stately museum shall teach you the infinite lessons of minerals. In another, woods, plants, vegetation shall be illustrated. In another, animals, animal life and development. One stately house shall be the music house. Others, for other arts, learning, the sciences, shall all be here. None shall be slighted, none, but shall here be honored, helped, example. Six. This, this and these, America, shall be your pyramids and obelisks, your Alexandrian pharaohs, gardens of Babylon, your temple at Olympia. The male and female many laboring not shall ever here confront the laboring many, with precious benefits to both, glory to all, to thee, America, and to thee, eternal muse. And here shall ye inhabit powerful matrons, in your vast state, vaster than all the old, echoed through long, long centuries to come, to sound of different, prouder songs, with stronger themes, practical, peaceful life, the people's life, 
The people themselves lifted, illumined, bathed in peace, elate, secure in peace. Chapter 7 Away with themes of war, away with war itself. Hence, from my shuddering sight, to never more return that show of blackened, mutilated corpses. That hell unpent and raid of blood, fit for wild tigers or for lop-tongued wolves, not reasoning men. And in its stead, speed industry's campaigns, with thy undaunted armies engineering, thy pennants labor, loosen to the breeze, thy bugles sounding loud and clear. Away with old romance, away with novels, plots and plays of foreign courts, away with love verses sugared in rhyme, the intrigues, amours of idlers, fitted for only banquets of the night where dancers to late music slide, the unhealthy pleasures, extravagant dissipations of the few, with perfumes, heat and wine, beneath the dazzling chandeliers. To you, you reverent sane sisters, I raise a voice for far superber themes for poets and for art, to exalt the present and the real, to teach the average man the glory of his daily walk and trade, to sing in songs how exercise and chemical life are never to be baffled, to manual work for each and all, to plow, hoe, dig, to plant and tend the tree, the berry, vegetables, flowers, for every man to see to it that he really do something, for every woman too, to use the hammer and the saw, rip or crosscut, to cultivate a turn for carpentry, plastering, painting, to work as tailor, tailoress, nurse, hostler, porter, to invent a little, something ingenious, to aid the washing, cooking, cleaning, to hold it no disgrace, to take a hand at them themselves. I say I bring thee muse today and here, all occupations, duties broad and close, toil, healthy toil and sweat, endless without cessation, the old, old practical burdens, interests, joys, the family, parentage, childhood, husband and wife, the house comforts, the house itself and all its belongings, food and its preservation, chemistry applied to it, Whatever forms the average, strong, complete, sweet-blooded man or woman, the perfect longeve personality, and helps its present life to health and happiness, and shapes its soul for the eternal, real life to come. With latest connections, works, the intertransportation of the world, steam power, the great express lines, gas, petroleum, these triumphs of our time, the Atlantic's delicate cable, the Pacific Railroad, the Suez Canal, the Mont Cenis and Gothard and Hoosick Tunnels, the Brooklyn Bridge, this earth all spanned with iron rails, with lines of steamships threading in every sea, our own rondure, the current globe I bring. Chapter 8 And thou, America, thy offspring, Towering air so high, yet higher thee above all towering, with victory on thy left, and at thy right hand law. Thou union, holding all, fusing, absorbing, tolerating all, thee, ever thee, I sing. Thou, also thou, O world, with all thy wide geographies, manifold, different, distant, rounded by thee in one, one common orbic language one common, indivisible destiny for all. And by the spells which ye vouchsafe to those your ministers in earnest, I here personify and call my themes to make them pass before ye. Behold, America, and thou, ineffable guest and sister, for thee come trooping up thy waters and thy lands, Behold thy fields and farms, thy far-off woods and mountains, as in procession coming. Behold the sea itself, and on its limitless heaving breast the ships. See where their white sails, bellying in the wind, speckle the green and blue, 
See the steamers coming and going, steaming in or out of port. See, dusty and undulating, the long pennants of smoke. Behold, in Oregon, far in the north and west, or in Maine, far in the north and east, thy cheerful axemen, yielding all day their axes. Behold, on the lakes, thy pilots at their wheels, thy oarsmen, how the ash writhes under those muscular arms. There, by the furnace, and there, by the anvil, behold thy sturdy blacksmiths, swinging their sledges, Overhand so steady, overhand they turn and fall with joyous clank, like a tumult of laughter. Mark the spirit of invention everywhere, thy rapid patents, thy continual workshops, foundries, risen or rising. See from their chimneys how the tall flame fires stream. Mark thy interminable farms, north, south, thy wealthy daughter states, Eastern and Western, the varied products of Ohio, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Georgia, Texas, and the rest, thy limitless crops, grass, wheat, sugar, oil, corn, rice, hemp, hops, thy barns all filled, the endless freight train and the bulging storehouse, the grapes that ripen on the vines, the apples in thy orchards, thy incalculable lumber, beef, pork, potatoes, thy coal, thy gold and silver, the inexhaustible iron in thy mines, all thine, O sacred union, ships, farms, shops, barns, factories, mines, city and state, north, south, item and aggregate, we dedicate, dread mother, all to thee. Protectress absolute thou, bulwark of all, for well we know that while thou givest each and all generous as God, without thee neither all nor each, nor land, home, nor ship, nor mine, nor any here this day secure, nor aught, nor any day secure. Chapter 9 And thou, the emblem waving over all, delicate beauty, a word to thee, it may be salutary, Remember thou hast not always been as here today so comfortably and sovereign. In other scenes than these have I observed thee, flag, not quite so trim and whole and freshly blooming in folds of stainless silk. But I have seen thee bunting to tatters torn upon thy splintered staff, or clutched to some young color-bearer's breast with desperate hands, savagely struggled for, for life or death, fought over long, mid cannon's thunder crash, and many a curse and groan and yell, and rifle volleys cracking sharp, and moving masses as wild demons surging, and lives as nothing risked, for thy mere remnant grimed with dirt and smoke and sopped in blood, for sake of that my beauty, and that thou mightst dally is now secure up there, many a good man have I seen go under. Now here and these and hence in peace, all thine, O flag, and here and hence for thee, O universal muse, and thou for them, and here and hence, O union, all the work and workmen thine, none separate from thee, henceforth one only, we and thou. For the blood of the children, what is it only the blood maternal, and lives and works? What are they all at last except the roads to faith and death? While we rehearse our measureless wealth, it is for thee, dear mother, we own it all and several, today indissoluble in thee. Think not our chant, our show, merely for products gross or lucre. It is for thee, the soul in thee, electric, spiritual. Our farms, inventions, crops, we own in thee. Cities and states in thee, our freedom all in thee. Our very lives in thee. Recording by Eric Armstrong. Visit me on the web at voiceguy.blogspot.com.
Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, Book 14, Song of the Redwood Tree, Chapter 1. A California song, a prophecy, and indirection, a thought impalpable to breathe as air, a chorus of dryads fading, departing, or hamadryads departing, a murmuring, fateful, giant voice, out of the earth and sky, a voice of a mighty dying tree in the redwood forest dense. Farewell, my brethren. Farewell, O earth and sky. Farewell, ye neighboring waters. My time has ended. My term has come. Along the northern coast, just back from the rock-bound shore and the caves, in the saline air from the sea in the Mendocino country, with the surge for bass and accompaniment low and hoarse, with crackling blows of axes sounding musically, driven by strong arms, riven deep by the sharp tongues of the axes, there in the redwood forest dense, I heard the mighty tree its death chant chanting. The choppers heard not, the camp shanties echoed not, the quick-eared teamsters and chain and jackscrew men heard not, as the wood spirits came from their haunts of a thousand years to join the refrain. But in my soul I plainly heard. Murmuring out of its myriad leaves, down from its lofty top rising two hundred feet high, out of its stalwart trunk and limbs, out of its foot-thick bark, that chant of the seasons and time, chant not of the past only, but the future. You untold life of me, and all you venerable and innocent joys, perennial hardy life of me with joys mid rain and many a summer sun, and the white snows and night, and the wild winds. Oh, the great, patient, rugged joys, my soul's strong joys unwrecked by man. For know I bear the soul befitting me. I, too, have consciousness, identity, and all the rocks and mountains have, and all the earth. Joys of the life befitting me and brothers mine. Our time, our term has come. Nor yield we mournfully majestic brothers, we who have grandly filled our time with nature's calm content, with tacit huge delight. We welcome what we wrought for through the past, and leave the field for them. For them, predicted long, for a superber race, they too to grandly fill their time. For them we abdicate, in them ourselves, ye forest kings. In them, these skies and airs, these mountain peaks, Shasta, Nevadas, these huge precipitous cliffs, these amplitude, these valleys far, Yosemite, to be in them absorbed, assimilated. Then to a loftier strain, still prouder, more ecstatic, rose the chant, as if the heirs and deities of the West, joining with master tongue, bore part. Not wan from Asia's fetishes, nor red from Europe's old dynastic slaughterhouse, area of murder plots of thrones, with scent left yet of wars and scaffolds everywhere, but come from nature's long and harmless throes, peacefully builded thence, these virgin lands, lands of the western shore, to the new culminating man, to you, the empire new, you promised long, we pledge, we dedicate. You occult deep volitions, 
you average spiritual manhood, purpose of all, poised on yourself, given not taking law, you womanhood divine, mistress and source of all, whence life and love and aught that comes from life and love. You unseen moral essence of all the vast material of America, age upon age, working in death the same as life. You that, sometimes known, oftener unknown, really shape and mold the new world, adjusting it to time and space. You hidden national will, lying in your abysms, concealed but ever alert, you past and present purposes tenaciously pursued may be unconscious of yourselves, unswerved by all the passing errors, perturbations of the surface. You vital, universal, deathless germs beneath all creeds, arts, statutes, literatures, here build your homes for good, establish here these areas entire, lands of the western shore, we pledge, we dedicate to you. For man of you, your characteristic race, here may he hardy, sweet, gigantic grow, here tower proportionate to nature, here climb the vast, pure spaces unconfined, unchecked by wall or roof, here laugh with storm or sun, here joy, here patiently endure, here heed himself, Unfold himself, not others' formulas heed. Here fill his time to duly fall, to aid unwrecked at last, to disappear, to serve. Thus, on the northern coast, in the echo of teamsters' calls and the clinking chains and the music of choppers' axes, the falling trunk and limbs, the crash, the muffled shriek, the groan, such words combined from the redwood tree, as of voices ecstatic, ancient and rustling, the century-lasting unseen dryads singing, withdrawing, all their recesses of forests and mountains leaving, from the Cascade Range to the Wasatch, or Idaho Far, or Utah, to the deities of the modern henceforth yielding, the chorus and indications, the vistas of coming humanity, the settlements Features all in the Mendocino woods I caught. Chapter 2 The flashing and golden pageant of California. The sudden and gorgeous drama, the sunny and ample lands, the long and varied stretch from Puget Sound to Colorado South. Lands bathed in sweeter, rarer, healthier air, valleys and mountain cliffs, the fields of nature long prepared and fallow, the silent, cyclic chemistry, the slow and steady ages plodding, the unoccupied surface ripening, the rich ores forming beneath. At last, the new arriving, assuming, taking possession, a swarming and busy race, settling and organizing everywhere, ships coming in from the whole round world and going out to the whole world to India and China and Australia and the thousand island paradises of the Pacific, populous cities, the latest inventions, the steamers on the rivers, the railroads with many a thrifty farm, with machinery and wool and wheat and the grape and diggings of yellow gold. Chapter 3 But more in you than these lands of the western shore these but the means, the implements, the standing ground. I see in you, certain to come, the promise of thousands of years, till now deferred, promised to be fulfilled, our common kind, the race. The new society, at last, proportionate to nature, in man of you, more than your mountain peaks or stalwart trees imperial, in woman more, far more, than all your gold or vines or even vital air. Fresh come to a new world indeed, yet long prepared. I see the genius of the modern, child of the real and ideal, clearing the ground for broad humanity, the true America, 
heir of the past so grand to build a grander future. This recording by Gordon Mackenzie. Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Book 15. A Song for Occupations. One. A Song for Occupations. In the labor of engines and trades, in the labor of fields, I find the developments and find the eternal meanings. Work men and work women. Were all educations practical and ornamental well displayed out of me, what would it amount to? Were I, as the head teacher, charitable proprietor, wise statesman, what would it amount to? Were I to you as the boss, employing and paying you, would that satisfy you? The learned, virtuous, benevolent, and the usual terms. A man like me, and never the usual terms. Neither a servant nor a master I. I take no sooner a large price than a small price. I will have my own whoever enjoys me. I will be even with you, and you shall be even with me. If you stand at work in a shop, I stand as nigh as the nighest in the same shop. If you bestow gifts on your brother or dearest friend, I demand as good as your brother or dearest friend. If your lover, husband, wife, is welcome by day or night, I must be personally as welcome. If you become degraded, criminal, ill, then I become so for your sake. If you remember your foolish and outlawed deeds, do you think I cannot remember my own foolish and outlawed deeds? If you carouse at the table, I carouse at the opposite side of the table. If you meet some stranger in the streets and love him or her, why, I often meet strangers in the street and love them. Why, what have you thought of yourself? Is it you, then, that thought yourself less? Is it you that thought the president greater than you? or the rich better off than you, or the educated wiser than you. Because you are greasy or pimpled or were once drunk or a thief, or that you are diseased or rheumatic or a prostitute, or from frivolity or impotence, or that you are no scholar and never saw your name in print. Do you give in? You are any less immortal. Two. Souls of men and women. It is not you I call unseen, unheard, untouchable and untouching. It is not you I go argue, pro and con about and to shelter whether you are alive or no. I own publicly who you are, if nobody else owns. Grown, half-grown, and babe, of this country and every country, indoors and outdoors, one just as much as the other, I see, and all else behind or through them. The wife and she is not one jot less than the husband, the daughter, and she is just as good as the son, the mother, and she is every bit as much as the father, offspring of ignorant and poor, boys apprenticed to trades, young fellows working on farms and 
Old fellows working on farms. Sailor men, merchant men, coasters, immigrants. All these I see, but nigher and farther the same I see. None shall escape me, and none shall wish to escape me. I bring what you much need, yet always have. Not money, amours, dress, eating, erudition, but as good. I send no agent or medium, offer no representative of value, but offer the value itself. There is something that comes to one now and perpetually. It is not what is printed, preached, discussed. It eludes discussion and print. It is not to be put in a book. It is not in this book. It is for you, whoever you are. It is no farther from you than your hearing and sight are from you. It is hinted by nearest, commonest, readiest. It is ever provoked by them. You may read in many languages, yet read nothing about it. You may read the president's message and read nothing about it there. Nothing in the reports from the State Department or Treasury Department or in the daily papers or weekly papers or in the census or revenue returns, prices, current, or any accounts of stock. Three. The sun and stars that float in the open air. The apple-shaped earth and we upon it Surely the drift of them is something grand. I do not know what it is, except that it is grand, and that it is happiness, and that the enclosing purport of us here is not a speculation or bon mot or reconnaissance, and that it is not something which by luck may turn out well for us and without luck must be a failure for us and not something which may yet be retracted in a certain contingency the light and shade the curious sense of body and identity the greed that with perfect complacence devours all things, the endless pride and outstretching of man, unspeakable joys and sorrows, the wonder everyone sees and everyone else he sees, and the wonders that fill each minute of time forever. What have you reckoned them for, camarado? Have you reckoned them for your trade or farm work or for the profits of your store or to achieve yourself a position or to fill a gentleman's leisure or a lady's leisure? Have you reckoned that the landscape took substance and form, that it might be painted in a picture, or men and women, that they might be written of, or songs sung, or the attraction of gravity, and the great laws and harmonious combinations, and the fluids of the air as subjects for the savants, for the brown land and the blue sea, for maps and charts, for the stars to be put in constellations and named fancy names, for that the growth 
of seeds is for agriculture tables or agriculture itself. Old institutions, these arts, libraries, legends, collections, and the practice handed along in manufactures, will we rate them so high? Will we rate our cash and business high? I have no objection. I rate them as high as the highest. Than a child born of a woman and man, I rate beyond all rate. We thought our union grand and our constitution grand. I do not say they are not grand and good, for they are. I am this day just as much in love with them as you. Then I am in love with you and with all my fellows upon the earth. We consider Bibles and religions divine. I do not say they are not divine. I say they have all grown out of you and may grow out of you still. It is not they who give the life. It is you who give the life. Leaves are not more shed from the trees or trees from the earth than they are shed out of you. For the sum of all known reverence I add up in you, whoever you are. The president is there in the White House for you. It is not you who are here for him. The secretaries act in their bureaus for you, not you here for them. The Congress convenes every twelfth month for you. Laws, courts, the forming of states, the characters of cities, the going and coming of commerce and malls are all for you. List close, my scholars, dear. Doctrines, politics, and civilization exerge from you. Sculpture and monuments and anything inscribed anywhere are tallied in you. The gist of histories and statistics as far back as the records reach is in you this hour. And myths and tales the same. If you were not breathing and walking here, where would they all be? The most renowned poems would be ashes. Orations and plays would be vacuums. All architecture is what you do to it when you look upon it. Did you think it was in the white or gray stone? or the lines of the arches and cornices. All music is what awakes from you when you are reminded by the instruments. It is not the violins and the cornets. It is not the oboe, nor the beating drums, nor the score of the baritone singer singing his sweet romanza, nor that of the men's chorus nor that of the woman's chorus. It is nearer and farther than they. Five. Will the whole come back then? Can each see signs of the best by a look in the looking glass? Is there nothing greater or more? Does all sit there with you, with the mystic unseen soul?
strange and hard that paradox true I give. Objects gross and the unseen soul are one. House building, measuring, sawing the boards, blacksmithing, glass blowing, nail making, coopering, tin roofing, shingle dressing, ship joining, dock building, fish curing, flagging of sidewalks by flaggers, the pump, the pile driver, the great derrick, the coal kiln and brick kiln, coal mines and all that is down there, the lamps in the darkness, echoes, songs, what meditations, what vast native thoughts look through smudged faces. Ironworks forge fires in the mountains or by riverbanks. Men around feeling the melt with huge crowbars, lumps of ore, the dew combining of ore, limestone, coal, the blast furnace and the puddling furnace, the loop lump at the bottom of the melt at last, the rolling mill, the stumpy bars of pig iron, the strong, clean-shaped trail for railroads, oil works, silk works, white lead works, the sugar house, steam saws, the great mills and factories, stone cutting, shapely trimmings for facades or windows or door lintels, the mallet, the tooth chisel, the jib to protect the thumb, the caulking iron, the kettle of boiling vault cement, and the fire under the kettle, the cotton bale, the stevedore's hook, the saw and buck of the sawyer, the mold of the molder, the working knife of the butcher, the ice saw, and all the work with ice. The work and tools of the rigger, grappler, sail maker, block maker. Goods of the gutta percha, papier mache, colors, brushes, brush making, glazier's implements. The veneer and glue pot, the confectioner's ornaments, the decanter and glasses, the shears and flat iron the awl and knee strap, the pint measure and quart measure, the counter and stool, the writing pen of quill or metal, the making of all sorts of edged tools, the brewery, brewing, the malt, the vats, everything that is done by brewers, winemakers, Vinegar makers, coach making, boiler making, rope twisting, distilling, sign painting, lime burning, cotton picking, electroplating, electrotyping, stereotyping, stave machines, planing machines, reaping machines, plowing machines, thrashing machines, steam wagons, the cart of the carman, the omnibus the ponderous dray, pyrotechny, letting off colored fireworks at night, fancy figures and jets, beef on the butcher's stall, the slaughterhouse of the butcher, the butcher in his killing clothes, the pens of live pork, the killing hammer, the hog hook, the scalder's tub gutting, the gutter's cleaver, the packer's maul, and the plenteous winter work of pork packing. Flower works, grinding of wheat, rye, maize, rice, the barrels and the half and quarter barrels, the loaded barges, the high piles on wharves and levees, the men and the work of the men on ferries, railroads, coasters, fish boats, canals, the hourly routine
routine of your own or any man's life. The shop, yard, store, or factory. These shows all near you by day and night. Workmen, whoever you are, your daily life. In that and them, the heft of the heaviest. In that and them, far more than you estimated. And far less also. In them, realities for you and me. In them, poems for you and me. In them, not yourself, you and your soul enclose all things regardless of estimation in them the development good in them all themes hints possibilities i do not affirm that what you see beyond is futile i do not advise you to stop I do not say leadings you thought great are not great, but I say that none lead to greater than these lead to. Six. Will you seek afar off? You surely come back at last. In things best known to you, finding the best, or as good as the best. In folks nearest to you, finding the sweetest, strongest, lovingest happiness, knowledge, not in another place, but this place, not for another hour, but this place hour man in the first you see or touch always in friend brother nighest neighbor woman in mother sister wife the popular tastes and employments taking precedence in poems or anywhere you work women and work men of these states have your own divine and strong life and all else giving place to men and women like you. When the psalm sings instead of the singer. When the script preaches instead of the preacher when the pulpit descends and goes, instead of the carver that carved the supporting desk, when I can touch the body of books by night or by day, and when they touch my body back again, when a university course convinces like a slumbering woman and child convince, when the minted gold in the vault smiles like the night watchman's daughter when warranty deeds loaf in chairs opposite and are my friendly companions I intend to reach them my hand and make as much of them as I do of men and women like you end of book 15 Recording by Brett Barney, WhitmanArchive.org Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, Book 16 A Song of the Rolling Earth 1. A Song of the Rolling Earth and of Words According Were you thinking that those were the words, those upright lines, those curves, angles, no, those are not the words. Substantial words are in the ground and sea. 
They are in the air. They are in you. Were you thinking that those were the words, those delicious sounds out of your friends' mouths? No, the real words are more delicious than they. Human bodies are words, myriads of words. In the best poems reappears the body, man's or woman's, well-shaped, natural, gay. Every part able, active, receptive, without shame or the need of shame. Air, soil, water, fire. Those are words. I myself am a word with them. My qualities interpenetrate with theirs. My name is nothing to them. Though it were told in the three thousand languages, what would air, soil, water, fire know of my name? A healthy presence, a friendly or commanding gesture, or words, saying. Meanings, the charms that go with the mere looks of some men and women, are sayings and meanings also. The workmanship of souls is by those inaudible words of the earth. The masters know the earth's words and use them more than audible words. Amelioration is one of the earth's words. The earth neither lags. Or hasten. It has all attributes, growths, effects, latent in itself from the jump. It is not half beautiful only. Defects and excrescences show just as much as perfections show. The earth does not withhold. It is generous enough. The truths of the earth continually wait. They are not so concealed. Either they are calm, subtle, untransmissible by print. They are imbued through all things, conveying themselves willingly, conveying a sentiment and invitation. I utter and utter. I speak not, yet if you hear me not, of what avail am I to you? To bear, to better. Lacking these, of what avail am I? Akush, Akushé, will you rot your own fruit in yourself there? Will you squat and stifle there? The earth does not argue, is not pathetic, has no arrangements, does not scream, haste, persuade, threaten. Promise makes no discriminations, has no conceivable failures, closes nothing, refuses nothing, shuts none out. Of all the powers, objects, states, it notifies, shuts none out. The earth does not exhibit itself, nor refuse to exhibit itself. Possesses still underneath. Underneath the ostensible sounds, the august chorus of heroes, the wail of slaves, persuasions of lovers, curses, gasps of the dying, laughter of young people, accents of bargainers. Underneath these, possessing words that never fail. To her children, the words of the eloquent, dumb, great mother never fail. The true words do not fail, for motion does not fail, and reflection does not fail. Also, the day and night do not fail, and the voyage we pursue does not fail. Of the interminable sisters, of the ceaseless cotillions of sisters, of the centripetal and centrifugal sisters, the elder. And younger sisters, the beautiful sister we know dances on with the rest, with her ample back towards every beholder, with the fascinations of youth 
and the equal fascinations of age. Sits she whom I too love like the rest. Sits undisturbed, holding up in her hand what has the character of a mirror, while her eyes glance back from it. Glance as she sits, inviting none, denying none, holding a mirror day and night, tirelessly before her own face. Seen at hand, or seen at a distance, duly the twenty-four appear in public every day, duly approach and pass with their companions or a companion, looking from no countenances of their own, but from the countenances of those who are with them, from the countenances of children or women, or the manly countenance, from the open countenances of animals, or from inanimate things, from the landscape or waters, or from the exquisite apparition of the sky, from our countenances, mine and yours, faithfully returning them, every day in public appearing without fail, but never twice with the same companions. Embracing men, embracing all, proceed the three hundred and sixty-five resistlessly round the sun. Embracing all, soothing, supporting, follow close three hundred and sixty-five offsets of the first, sure and necessary as they. Tumbling on steadily, nothing dreading, sunshine, storm, cold, heat, forever withstanding, passing, carrying, the soul's realization and determination still inheriting. The fluid vacuum around and ahead, still entering and dividing, no balk retarding, no anchor anchoring, on no rock striking, swift, glad, content, unbereaved, nothing losing, of all able and ready at any time to give strict account, the divine ship sails the divine sea. Two, whoever you are, motion and reflection are especially for you. The divine ship sails the divine sea for you. Whoever you are, you are he or she for whom the earth is solid and liquid. You are he or she for whom the sun and moon hang in the sky. For none more than you are the present and the past. For none more than you is immortality. Each man to himself and each woman to herself is the word of the past and present and the true word of immortality. No one can acquire for another not one. No one can grow for another, not one. The song is to the singer, and comes back most to him. The teaching is to the teacher, and comes back most to him. The murder is to the murderer, and comes back most to him. The theft is to the thief and comes back most to him. The love is to the lover and comes back most to him. The gift is to the giver and comes back most to him. It cannot fail. The oration is to the orator. The acting is to the actor and actress, not to the audience. And no man understands any greatness or goodness but his own, or the indication of his own. Three, I swear the earth shall surely be complete to him or her who shall be complete. The earth remains jagged and broken only to him or her who remains jagged and broken. I swear there is no greatness or power that does not emulate those of the earth. There can be no theory of any account unless it corroborate the theory of the earth. No politics, song, religion, behavior, 
or whatnot is of account unless it compare with the amplitude of the earth, unless it face the exactness, vitality, impartiality, rectitude of the earth. I swear I begin to see love with sweeter spasms than that which responds love. It is that which contains itself, which never invites and never refuses. I swear I begin to see little or nothing in audible words. All merges toward the presentation of the unspoken meanings of the earth, toward him who sings the songs of the body and of the truths of the earth, toward him who makes the dictionaries of words that print cannot touch. I swear I see what is better than to tell the best. It is always to leave the best untold. When I undertake to tell the best, I find I cannot. My tongue is ineffectual on its pivots. My breath will not be obedient to its organs. I become a dumb man. The best of the earth cannot be told anyhow. All or any is best. It is not what you anticipated. It is cheaper, easier, nearer. Things are not dismissed from the places they held before. The earth is just as positive and direct as it was before. Facts, religions, improvements, politics, trades are as real as before. But the soul is also real. It too is positive and direct. No reasoning, no proof has established it. Undeniable growth has established it. Four. These to echo the tones of souls and the phrases of souls. If they did not echo the phrases of souls, what were they then? If they had not reference to you in a special, what were they then? I swear I will never henceforth have to do with the faith that tells the best. I will have to do only with that faith that leaves the best untold. Say on, sayers. Sing on, singers. Delve, mold, pile the words of the earth. Work on, age after age. Nothing is to be lost. It may have to wait long, but it will certainly come in use. When the materials are all prepared and ready, the architects shall appear. I swear to you the architects shall appear without fail. I swear to you they will understand you and justify you. The greatest among them shall be he who best knows you and encloses all and is faithful to all. He and the rest shall not forget you. They shall perceive that you are not an iota less than they. You shall be fully glorified in them. Youth, day, old age, and night. Youth, large, lusty, loving. Youth, full of grace, force, fascination. Do you know that old age may come after you with equal grace, force, fascination? Day full-blown and splendid. Day of the immense sun, action, ambition, laughter. The night follows close with millions of stars and sleep and restoring darkness. End book 16. Today's reading by Hugh McGuire. Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Book 17. Birds of Passage. Song of the Universal. One. Come, said the muse. Sing me a song no poet has yet chanted. Sing me the Universal. In this broad earth of ours, amid the measureless grossness and the slag, enclosed 
and safe within its center heart nestles the seed perfection. By every life a share, or more or less, none born, but it is born, concealed or unconcealed, the seed is waiting. Two, low, keen-eyed towering science, as from tall peaks the modern overlooking, successive absolute fiat's issue. Yet again, lo, the soul above all science, for it has history gathered like husks around the globe, for it the entire star myriads roll through the sky. In spiral routes by long detours, as a much tracking ship upon the sea, for it the partial to the permanent flowing, for it the real ideal tends, for it the mystic evolution, not the right only justified, what we call evil also justified, from their masks no matter what, from the huge festering trunk, from craft and guile and tears, health to emerge and joy, joy universal, out of the bulk, the morbid and the shallow, out of the bad majority, the varied countless frauds of men and states, electric, antiseptic, yet cleaving, suffusing all. Only the good is universal. Three, over the mountain growths, disease and sorrow, an uncaught bird is ever hovering, hovering, high in the purer, happier air. From imperfection's murkiest cloud Darts always forth one ray of perfect light One flash of heaven's glory To fashion customs discord To the mad babble din The deafening orgies Soothing each lull a strain is heard Just heard From some far shore the final chorus sounding Oh, the blessed eyes, the happy hearts that see, that know the guiding thread so fine along the mighty labyrinth. Four, and thou, America, for the scheme's culmination, its thought and its reality, for these, not from thyself, thou hast arrived. Thou too surroundest all, embracing, carrying, welcoming all, Thou too by pathways broad and new To the ideal tendest The measured faiths of other lands The grandeurs of the past Are not for thee but grandeurs of thine own Deific faiths and amplitudes Absorbing, comprehending all All eligible to all All, all for immortality Love the light silently wrapping all nature's amelioration, blessing all, the blossoms, fruits of ages, orchards, divine and certain, forms, objects, growths, humanities, to spiritual images ripening. Give me, O oh God, sing that thought. Give me, give him or her, I love this quenchless faith. In thy ensemble, whatever else withheld, withhold not from us belief in plan of the enclosed in time and space, health, peace, salvation, universal. Is it a dream? Nay, but the lack of it the dream, and failing it life's lore and wealth a dream, and all the world a dream. Pioneers, O oh pioneers, come, my tan-faced children, follow well in order. Get your weapons ready. Have you your pistols? Have you your sharp-edged axes? Pioneers, O oh pioneers. For we cannot tarry here. We must march, my darlings. We must bear the brunt of danger. We, the youthful, sinewy races, all the rest on us depend. Pioneers, oh pioneers. You youths, 
Western youth so impatient, full of action, full of manly pride and friendship. Plain I see you, Western youths, see you tramping with the foremost. Pioneers, oh pioneers, have the elder races halted? Do they droop and end their lesson, wearied over there beyond the seas? We take up the task eternal, burden and the lesson, pioneer, oh pioneer. All the past we leave behind, we debouch upon a newer, mightier world, varied world, fresh and strong the world we seize, world of labor and the march, pioneers. up the mountain steep, conquering, holding, daring, venturing as we go the unknown ways. Pioneers, oh pioneers, we primeval forests felling, we the rivers stemming, vexing, we and piercing deep the mines within, we the surface broad surveying, we the virgin soil up. Sierras and the high plateaus, from the mine and from the gully, from the hunting trail we come. Pioneers, oh pioneers, from Nebraska, from Arkansas, central inland race we are, from Missouri, with the continental blood interveined. All the hands of comrades clasping, all the southern, all the northern, pioneers, oh pioneers. Resistless, restless race, beloved race and all. Oh, my breast aches with tender love for all. Oh, I mourn you yet exult. I am wrapped with love for all. Mother Mistress, waving high the delicate mistress over all the starry mistress. Bend your heads all, raise the fanged and warlike mistress, stern and passive weapon mistress, pioneers, oh pioneers. See my children, resolute children, by those swarms upon our rear we must never yield or falter. Ages back in ghostly millions frowning there, behind us urging pioneers, oh pioneers. On and on the compact ranks with the sessions ever waiting, with the places of the dead quickly filled through the battle, through defeat, moving yet, never stopping. Are there some of us to droop and die? Has the hour come? Then upon the march we fittest die, soon and sure the gap is filled. Pioneers, oh pioneers. All the pulses of the world falling in, they beat for us with western movement, beat holding single or together, steady moving to the front, all for us. Life's involved at varied pageants, all the forms and shows, all the workmen at their work, all the seamen and the landsmen, all the masters with their slaves. Pioneers, oh pioneers. All the hapless, silent lovers, all the prisoners in the prisons, all the righteous and the wicked, all the joyous, all the sorrowing, all the living, all the dying, pioneers. I, too, with my soul and body, we, curious trio, picking, wandering on our way, through these shores amid the shadows, with the apparitions pressing. Pioneers, oh pioneers. Lo, the darting, bowling orb, lo, the brother, orbs around, all the clustering suns and planets, all the dazzling days, all the mystic nights with dreams, pioneers, oh pioneers. These are of us, they are with us, 
all for primal needed work, while the followers there in embryo wait behind. We today's procession heading, we the route for travel clearing. Pioneers, oh pioneers. Oh you daughters of the West, oh you young and elder daughters, oh you mothers and you wives, never must you be divided. In our ranks we move, united, pioneers, oh pioneers. Minstrels latent on the prairies, shrouded bards of other lands, you may rest, you have done your work. Soon I hear you coming, warbling, soon you rise and tramp amid us. Pioneers, oh pioneers, not for delectation sweet, not the cushion and the slipper, not the peaceful and the studious, not the riches safe and palling, not for us the tame enjoyment. Pioneers, oh pioneers, do the feasters gluttonous feast, do the corpulent sleepers sleep, have they locked and bolted doors? Still be ours, the diet hard and the blanket on the ground. Pioneers, oh pioneers. As the night descended, was the road of late so toilsome? Did we stop discouraged, nodding on our way? Yet a passing hour I yield you in your tracks to pause oblivious. Pioneers, oh pioneers. Till with the sound of trumpet, far, far off the daybreak call, Hark! How loud and clear I hear it wind, swift, to the head of the army, swift, spring to your places, pioneers, oh pioneers. To you, whoever you are, I fear you are walking the walk of dreams. I fear these supposed realities are to melt from under your feet and hands. Even now your features, joys, speech, house, trade, manners, troubles, follies, costumes, crimes, dissipate away from you. Your true soul and body appear before me. They stand forth out of affairs, out of commerce, shops, work, farms, clothes, the house, buying, selling, eating, drinking, suffering, dying. Whoever you are, now I place my hand upon you. That you be my poem, I whisper with lips close to your ear. I have loved many women and men, but I love none better than you. Oh, I have been dilatory and dumb. I should have straight to you long ago, I should have blabbed nothing but you, I should have chanted nothing but you. I will leave all and come and make the hymns of you, none has understood you, but I understood you. None has done justice to you, you have not done justice to yourself. None but has found you imperfect, I only find no imperfection in you. I only am he who will ever consent to subordinate you. I only am he who places over you no master, owner, better, God, beyond what waits intrinsically in yourself. Painters have painted their swarming groups, the center figure of all. From the head of the center figure spreading a nimbus of gold-colored light. But I paint myriads. such grandeurs and glories about you. You have not known what you are. You have slumbered upon yourself all your life. Your eyelids have been the same as closed most of the time. What you have done returns already in mockeries. Your thrift, knowledge, prayers, if they do not return in mockeries, what is their return? The mockeries are not you. Underneath them and within them I see you lurk. 
I pursue you where none else has pursued you. Silence the desk, the flippant expression, the night, the accustomed routine. If these conceal you from others or from yourself, they do not conceal you from me. The shaved face, the unsteady eye, the impure complexion. If these balk others, they do not balk me. The pert apparel, the deformed attitude, drunkenness, greed, premature death, all these I part aside. There is no endowment in man or woman that is not tallied in you. There is no virtue, no beauty in man or woman, but as good is in you. No pluck, no endurance in others, but as good is in you. No pleasure waiting for others, but an equal pleasure waits for you. As for me, I give nothing to anyone, except I give the like carefully to you. I sing the songs of glory of none, not God, sooner than I sing the songs of glory of you. Whoever you are, claim your own at any hazard. These shows of the East and West are tame compared to you. These immense meadows, these interminable rivers, you are immense and interminable as they. These furies, elements, storms, motions of nature, throes of apparent disillusion. You are he or she who is master or mistress over them, master or mistress in your own right over nature, elements. Hopples fall from your ankles. You find an unfailing sufficiency, old or young, male or female, rude, low, rejected by the rest. Whatever you are promulgates itself through birth, life, death, burial. The means are provided. Nothing is scanted. Through angers, losses, ambition, ignorance, envy, what you are takes its way. France, the 18th year of the estate. A great year in place, a harsh, discordant natal scream out sounding, to touch the mother's heart closer than any year. I walked the shores of my eastern sea, heard over the waves the little voice, saw the divine infant where she woke mournfully wailing amid the roar of cannon, curses, shouts, crash of falling building was not so sick from the blood in the gutters running nor from the single corpses nor those in heaps nor those borne away in the tumble was not so desperate at the factory of death was not so shocked and repeated fuselage of the gun pale, silent, stern what could I say to that long and retribution could I wish humanity different? Could I wish the people made of wood and stone? Or that there be no justice in destiny and time? Liberty, oh mate for me. Here too the blaze, the grape shot and the axe in reserve. Fetch them out in case of need. Here too, through long repressed, can never be destroyed. Here too could rise at last, murdering and ecstatic. Here too, demanding full arrears of vengeance. Hence I sign this salute over the sea, and I do not deny the terrible red birth and baptism, but remember the little voice that I heard wailing, and wait with perfect trust no matter how long. And from today, sad and cogent, I maintain the bequeathed cause as for all lands, and I send these words to Paris with my love, and I guess some chansonnier there will understand them. For I guess there is latent music yet in France, floods of it. Oh, I hear already the bustle of instruments. They will soon be drowning all that would interrupt them. Oh, I think the east wind brings a triumphal and free march. It reaches hither, it swells me to joyful madness. I will run, transpose it in words, to justify. I will yet sing a song for you, my friend. 
myself and mine. Myself and mine, gymnastics ever, to stand the cold or heat, to take good aim with the gun, to sail a boat, to manage horses, to beget superb children, to speak readily and clearly, to feel at home among common people, and to hold our own in terrible positions on land and sea. Not for an embroiderer. There will always be plenty of embroiderers. I welcome them also. But for the fiber of things and for inherent men and women. Not to chisel ornaments, but to chisel with free stroke the heads and limbs of plenteous, supreme gods, that the states may realize them walking and talking. Let me have my own way. Let others promulgate the laws. I will make no count of the laws. Let others praise eminent men and hold up peace. I hold up agitation and conflict. I praise no eminent man. I rebuke to his face the one that was thought most worthy. Who are you, and what are you secretly guilty of all your life? Will you turn aside all your life? Will you grub and chatter all your life? And who are you, babbling by rote years, pages, languages, reminiscing? Unwitting today, if you do not know how to speak properly a single word. Let others finish specimens, I never finish specimens. I start them by exhaustive laws of nature does fresh, modern, continuous. I give nothing as duties. What others give as duties, I give as living impulses. Shall I give the heart's action as a duty? Let others dispose of questions, I dispose of nothing. I arouse unanswerable questions. Who are they I see and touch? And what about them? What about these lights of myself that draw me so close by tender directions and indirections? I call to the world to distrust the accounts of my friends, but listen to my enemies as I myself do. I charge you forever reject those who would expound me, for I cannot expound myself. I charge that there be no theory or school founded out of me. I charge you to be all free as I have left all free. After me, Mista. Oh, I see life is not short, but immeasurably long. I henceforth tread the world chaste, temperate, and early riser, a steady grower, Every hour the semen of centuries, and still of centuries. I must follow up these continual lessons of the air, water, earth. I perceive I have no time to lose. Year of Meteors, 1859-1860. Year of Meteors. Brooding year, I would bind in words retrospectively. I would sing your contest in the 19th presidential I would sing how an old man, tall, with white hair, mounted the scaffold of the game. I was at hand, silent, stood with teeth shut closed. I walked. I stood very near you, old man, and cool and indifferent, but trembling with age and with the unfinished moon as you mounted the scaffold. I would sing my copious song of census returns of the states. The tables of population and products I would sing of your ships and their cargoes. The proud black ships of Manhattan arriving, some filled with immigrants, some from the Isthmus, with cargoes of gold. The songs thereof I would sing. Surging the happiest crowds. As you passed with your courtiers of nobles, there in the crowd.
clouds did I see you out. Long it sailed its balls of unearthly light over our heads, then departed, dropped in the night and was gone. Of such, and fitful as they, I sing, with gleams from them with gleam and patches chant. Your chant, O year all mottled with evil and good, year of foreboding, year of comets and meteors, transient and strange, lo! Even here, one equally transient and strange. As I flick through you hastily, soon to fall and be gone, what is this chant? What am I myself but one of your meeting? With antecedents, one. With antecedents, with my fathers and mothers and the accumulations of past ages, with all which, had it not been, I would not now be here as I am with Egypt, India, Phoenicia, Greece, and Rome, with the Celt, the Scandinavian, the Alb, and the Saxon, with antique maritime ventures, laws, artisanship, wars, and journeys, with the poet, the skald, the saga, the myth, and the oracle, with the sale of slaves, with enthusiasts, with the troubadour, the crusader, and the monk, with those old continents whence we have come to this new continent, with the fading kingdoms and kings over there, with the fading religions and priests, with the small shores we look back from our own large and present shores, with countless years drawing themselves onward and arrived at these years, you and me arrived, America arrived at making this year, this year, sending itself Oh, but it is not the years, it is I, it is you. We touch all laws and tally all antecedents. We are the skull, the oracle, the monk, and the knight. We easily include them, and more. We stand amid time beginningless. as much darkness as light. The very sun swings itself in its system of planets around us. Its sun and its again all swing around us. As for me, torn, stormy amid these vehement days, I have the idea of all, and am all, and believe in all. I believe materialism is true and spiritualism is true. I reject no part. Have I forgotten any part, anything in the past? Come to me, whoever and whatever, till I give you recognition. I respect Assyria, China, Teutonia, and the Hebrews. I adopt each theory, myth, god, and demigod. I see that the old accounts, Bibles, genealogies are true without exception. I assert that all past days were what they must have been, and that they could know how have been better than they were, and that today is what it must be, and that America is, and that today and America could know how be better than they are. Three. In the name of these states, and in your and my name, the past, and in the name of these states, and in your and my name, the present time. I know that the past was great, and the future will be great. And I know that both curiously conjoint in the present time, 
for the sake of him, I typify for the common average man's sake, for your sake if you are he. And that where I am, or you are, this present day, there is the center of all days, all races. And there is meaning to us of all that has ever come, of races and days, or ever will come. End of Book 17 Recording by Hugh McGuire, Montreal, November 18th, 2005 Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, Book 18 A Broadway Pageant, 1 Over the western sea, hither from Nifon come Courteous, the swart-cheeked, two-sorted envoys, leaning back in their open barouches, bareheaded, impassive, ride today through Manhattan. Libertad, I do not know whether others behold what I behold. In the procession along with the nobles of Nifon, the errand bearers bringing up the rear, hovering above, around, or in the ranks, marching. But I will sing you a song of what I behold in Libertad. When million-footed Manhattan unpent descends to her pavement. When the thunder-cracking guns arouse me with the proud roar of love. When the round-mouthed guns out of the smoke and smell I love spit their sleep. When the fire-flashing guns have fully alerted me, and heaven clouds canopy my city with delicate thin haze, when gorgeous the countless straight stems, the forests at the wharves thicken with colors, when every ship richly dressed carries her flag at the peak, when pennants trail and sweet festoons hang from the windows, when Broadway is entirely given up to foot passengers and foot standards, when the mass is densest, when the facades of the house are alive with people, when eyes gaze riveted tens of thousands at a time, when the guests from the islands advance, when the pageant moves forward visible, when the summons is made, when the answer that waited Thousands of years answers I too the rising answering descend to the pavement, merge with the crowd and gaze with them. Two superb faced Manhattan Comrade Americano, to us then at last the Orient come. To us, my city, where our tall topped marble and iron beauties range on opposite sides, to walk in the space between, today our antipodes come. The originatress comes, the nest of languages, the bequeather of poems, the race of eld, floored with blood, pensive, wrapped with musings, hot with passion, sultry with perfume, with ample and flowing garments, with sunburned visage, with intense soul and glittering eyes, the race of Brahma come. See my cantable, these and more flashing to us from the procession, as it moves changing, a kaleidoscope divine, it moves changing before us. For not the envoys nor the ten Japanese from his island only, lithe and silent the Hindu appears, the Asiatic continent itself appears, the past, the dead, the murky night morning of wonder and fable inscrutable, the enveloped mysteries, the old and unknown hive bees, the north, the sweltering south, eastern Assyria, the Hebrews, the ancient of ancients, vast, desolated cities, 
the gliding present. All of these and more are in the pageant procession. Geography, the world is in it. The great sea, the brood of islands, Polynesia, the coast beyond, the coast you henceforth are facing in Libertad. From your western golden shores, the countries there with their populations, the millions en masse are curiously here. The swarming marketplaces, the temples with idols ranged along the sides or at the end, booze, brahmin and lama, mandarin, farmer, merchant, mechanic and fisherman. The singing girl and the dancing girl, the ecstatic persons, the secluded emperors, Confucius himself, the great poets and heroes, the warriors, the cast, all, trooping up, crowding from all directions, from the Altai Mountains, from Tibet, from the four winding and far-flowing rivers of China, from the southern peninsulas and the demi-continental islands in Malaysia. These are whatever belongs to them palpable to show forth to me. They're seized by me, and I am seized by them. They're friendly, held by them. Till as here, them, all I chant, libertad for themselves, For I too, raising my voice, join the ranks of this pageant. I am the chanter. I chant aloud over the pageant. I chant the world on my western sea. I chant copious islands beyond, thick as stars in the sky. I chant the new empire grander than any before, as in a vision it comes to me. I chant America the mistress. I chant a greater supremacy. I chant projected a thousand blooming cities yet in time on those groups of sea islands. My sail ships and steamships threading the archipelago. My stars and stripes fluttering in the wind. Commerce opening, the sleep of ages having done its work. Races reborn, refreshed, lives, works resumed, the object I know not, but the old, the Asiatic, renewed as it must be, commencing from this day, surrounded by the world. Three, and you, Libertad of the world, you shall sit in the middle well poised thousands and thousands of years as today from one side the nobles of Asia come to you and tomorrow from the other side the Queen of England sends her eldest son to you the sign is reversing the orb is enclosed the wind is circled the journey is done the box lid is but perceptibly open nevertheless the perfume pours copiously out of the whole box. Young Libertad, with the venerable Asia, the All Mother, be considerate with her now, and ever hot Libertad, for you are all. Bend your proud neck to the long off mother now sending messages over the archipelagos of you. Bend your proud neck low for once, young Libertad. Here, the children strain westward so long, so wide the tramping. Here, the precedent dim ages debouching westward from paradise so long. Where the centuries steadily footing it that way, all the while unknown for you and for reason. They are justified, they are accomplished. They shall now return the other way also, and travel toward the 
they shall now also march obediently eastward for your sake, through the time. End of Book 18. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Book 19, Sea Drift. Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking. Out of the Cradle, Endlessly Rocking. Out of the Mockingbird's Throat, The Musical Shuttle. Out of the Ninth Month Midnight, Over the Sterile Sands, and the fields beyond, where the child, leaving his bed, wandered alone, bareheaded, barefoot, down from the showered halo, up from the mystic play of shadows twining and twisting as if they were alive, out from the patches of briars and blackberries, from the memories of the bird that chanted to me, from your memories, sad brother, from the fitful risings and fallings I heard, from under that yellow half-moon, late risen and swollen as if with tears, from those beginning notes of yearning and love there in the mist, from the thousand responses of my heart never to cease, from the myriad thence aroused words, from the word stronger and more delicious than any, from such as now they start the scene revisiting, as a flock twittering, rising, or overhead passing, borne hither Ere all eludes me hurriedly, a man, yet by these tears, a little boy again, throwing myself on the sand, confronting the waves. I, chanter of pains and joys, uniter of here and hereafter taking all hints to use them, but swiftly leaping beyond them, a reminiscence sing. Once, Palmanoch, when the lilac scent was in the air and the fifth month grass was growing, up this seashore in some briars, two feathered guests from Alabama, two together, and their nest, and four light green eggs spotted with brown. And every day the he-bird to and fro near at hand, and every day the she-bird crouched on her nest, silent with bright eyes. And every day I, a curious boy, never too close, never disturbing them, Cautiously peering, absorbing, translating. Shine, shine, shine. Pour down your warmth, great sun, while we bask, we two together. Two together. Winds blow south or winds blow north. Day come white or night come black, home, or rivers and mountains from home, singing all time, minding no time, while we two keep together, till of a sudden, maybe killed, unknown to her mate, one forenoon, the sheepherd crouched not on the nest, nor returned that afternoon, nor the next, nor ever appeared again. And thenceforward, all summer in the sound of the sea, 
and at night under the full of the moon in calmer weather, over the hoarse surging of the sea, or flitting from briar to briar by day, I saw, I heard at intervals the remaining one, the he-bird, the solitary guest from Alabama. Blow, 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 blow up sea winds along Pomanoc's shore. I wait and I wait till you blow my mate to me. Yes, when the stars glistened all night long on the prong of a moss-scalloped stake, down almost amid the slapping waves, sat the lone singer, wonderful causing tears. He called on his mate, he poured forth the meanings which I, of all men, know. Yes, my brother, I know. The rest might not, but I have treasured every note. For more than once dimly down to the beach gliding, Silent, avoiding the moonbeams, blending myself with the shadows, recalling now the obscure shapes, the echoes, the sounds and sights after their sorts, the white arms out in the breakers, tirelessly tossing, I, with bare feet, a child, the wind wafting my hair, listen. Long and long, listened to keep, to sing, now translating the notes, following you, my brother. Soothe, soothe, soothe. Close on its wave, soothes the wave behind, and again. Another behind, embracing and lapping. Everyone close. But my love soothes not me, not me. Low hangs the moon. It rose late. It is lagging. Oh, I think it is heavy with love, with love. Oh, madly. The sea pushes upon the land with love, with love. O oh, night, do I not see my love fluttering out among the breakers? What is that little black thing I see there in the white? Loud, loud, loud. Loud I call to you, my love. High and clear I shoot my voice over the waves. Surely you must know who is here, is here. You must know who I am, my love. Low-hanging moon, what is that dusky spot in your brown-yellow? Oh, it is the shape, the shape of my mate. Oh, moon, do not keep her from me any longer. Land, land, oh, land. Whichever way I turn, oh, I think you could give me my mate back again if you only would. For I am almost sure I see her dimly, whichever way I look. Oh, rising stars. Perhaps the one I want so much will rise, will rise with some of you. O oh, throat, O oh, trembling throat, sound clearer through the atmosphere, pierce the woods, the earth, somewhere listening to catch you, must be the one I want. Shake out carols. Solitary here, the night's carols, carols of lonesome love, death's carols, 
carols under that lagging yellow waning moon. Oh, under that moon where she droops almost down into the sea. Oh, reckless, despairing carols. But soft, sink low. Soft, let me just Wait a moment, you husky noised sea. For somewhere, I believe I heard my mate responding to me. So faint, I must be still, be still to listen. But not altogether still, for then she might not come immediately to me. Hither, my love. Here I am, here, with this just sustained note, I announce myself to you. This gentle call is for you, my love, for you. Do not be decoyed elsewhere. That is the whistle of the wind, it is not my voice. That is the fluttering, the fluttering of the spray. Those are the shadows of the leaves. Oh, darkness. Oh, in vain. Oh, I am very sick and sorrowful. Oh, brown halo in the sky near the moon drooping upon the sea. Troubled reflection in the sea. Oh, throat. Oh, throbbing heart. And I, singing uselessly, uselessly all the night. Oh, past. Oh, happy life. Oh, songs of joy. In the air, in the woods. Over fields, loved, 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 loved. But my mate, no more, no more with me. We two together, no more. The area sinking, all else continuing. The stars shining, the winds blowing, the notes of the bird continuous echoing. With angry moans, the fierce old mother incessantly moaning. On the sands of Pomenoc's shore, gray and rustling, the yellow half moon enlarged, sagging down, drooping, the face of the sea almost touching. The boy ecstatic, with his bare feet, the waves, with his hair, the atmosphere dallying. The love in the heart long pent, now loose, now at last tumultuously bursting. The area's meaning, the ears, the soul swiftly depositing. The strange tears down the cheeks coursing. The colloquy there. The trio. Each uttering. The undertone. The savage old mother incessantly crying. To the boy's soul's questions sullenly timing. Some drowned, secret hissing setting bard demon or bird said the boy's soul is it indeed toward your mate you sing or is it really to me for I that was a child my tongue's use sleeping now I have heard you now in a moment I know what I am for, 
I awake, and already a thousand singers, a thousand songs, clearer, louder, and more sorrowful than yours. A thousand warbling echoes have started to life within me, never to die. Oh, you singer solitary, singing by yourself, projecting me, O oh, solitary me listening, never more shall I cease perpetuating you, never more shall I escape, never more the reverberations, never more the cries of unsatisfied love be absent from me, never again leave me to be the peaceful child I was before what there in the night by the sea under the yellow and sagging moon the messenger there aroused the fire the sweet hell within the unknown want the destiny of me oh give me the clue it lurks in the night here somewhere Oh, if I am to have so much, let me have more. A word, then, for I will conquer it. The word, final, superior to all, subtle, sent up. What is it? I listen. Are you whispering it? All the time, you sea waves? Is that it? From your liquid rims and wet sands? Where to answering? The sea, delaying not, hurrying not, whispered me through the night. And very plainly, before daybreak, lisped to me the low, this word, death, and again, death, 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 hissing, melodious, neither like the bird, nor like my aroused child's heart, but etching near as privately for me rustling at my feet, creeping thence steadily up to my ears, and laving me softly all over. Death. 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 Which I do not forget. But fuse the song of my dusky demon and brother that he sang to me in the moonlight on Pomenoc's gray beach with a thousand responsive songs at random. My own songs awaked from that hour, and with them the key, the word up from the waves word of the sweetest song and all songs, that strong, delicious word which, creeping to my feet, or like some old crone rocking the cradle, swathed in sweet garments, bending aside, the sea. As I ebbed with the ocean of life, one, as I ebbed with the ocean of life, as I wended the shores I know, as I walked where the ripples continually wash you, Palmanoc, where they rustle up, hoarse and sibilant, where the fierce old mother endlessly cries for her castaways, 
I musing late in the autumn day, gazing off southward, held by this electric self out of the pride of which I utter poems, was seized by the spirit that trails in the lines underfoot, the rim, the sediment that stands for all the water and all the land of the globe. Fascinated, my eyes reverting from the south dropped to follow those slender windrows, chaff, straw, splinters of wood, weeds and the sea gluten, scum, scales from shining rocks, leaves of salt lettuce left by the tide, miles walking, the sound of breaking waves the other side of me, Palmanoc there and then as I brought the old thought of likenesses. These you presented to me, you fish-shaped island, as I wended the shores I know, as I walked with that electric self seeking types. Two, as I wend to the shores I know not, as I list to the dirge, the voices of men and women wrecked, as I inhale the impalpable breezes that set in upon me, as the ocean so mysterious rolls toward me closer and closer, I too but signify at the utmost a little washed up drift, a few sands and dead leaves to gather, gather and merge myself as part of the sands and drift. Oh, baffled, balked, bent to the very earth, oppressed with myself that I have dared to open my mouth, aware now that amid all that blab whose echoes recoil upon me, I have not once had the least idea who or what I am, but that before all my arrogant poems, the real me stands yet untouched, untold, altogether unreached, withdrawn far, mocking me with mock congratulatory signs and bows, with peals of distant ironical laughter at every word I have written, pointing in silence to these songs, and then to the sand beneath. I perceive I have not really understood anything, not a single object, and that no man ever can. Nature here in sight of the sea taking advantage of me to dart upon me and sting me, because I have dared to open my mouth to sing at all. Three. You oceans both, I close with you. We murmur alike, reproachfully rolling sands and drift, not knowing why. These little shreds indeed, standing for you and me and all. You friable shore with trails of debris, you fish-shaped island, I take what is underfoot. What is yours is mine, my father. I too, Palmanoc, I too have bubbled up, floated the measureless float, and been washed on your shores. 
I too am but a trail of drift and debris. I too leave little wrecks upon you, you fish-shaped island. I throw myself upon your breast, my father. I cling to you so that you cannot unloose me. I hold you so firm till you answer me something. Kiss me, my father. Touch me with your lips as I touch those I love. Breathe to me while I hold you close. The secret of the murmuring I envy. Four. Ebb, ocean of life. The flow will return. Cease not your moaning, you fierce old mother. Endlessly cry for your castaways. But fear not, deny not me. Rustle not up so hoarse and angry against my feet as I touch you or gather from you. I mean tenderly by you and all. I gather for myself and for this phantom looking down where we lead and following me and mine. Me and mine. Loose windrows. Little corpses. Froth. Snowy white. And bubbles. See, from my dead lips the ooze exuding at last. See the prismatic colors glistening and rolling. Tufts of straw, sands, fragments. Void hither from many moods, one contradicting another. From the storm, the long calm, the darkness, the swell, music. Wandering, a breath, a briny tear, a dab of liquid or soil, up just as much out of the fathomless workings fermented and thrown, a limp blossom or two, torn, just as much over waves floating, drifted at random. Just as much for us, that sobbing dirge of nature. Just as much, whence we come, that blare of the cloud trumpets. We capricious, brought hither, we know not whence, spread out before you. You up there, walking or sitting. Whoever you are, we too lie in drifts at your feet. Tears, 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 in the night, in solitude, tears. On the white shore, dripping, dripping, sucked in by the sand, tears, not a star shining, all dark and desolate, moist tears from the eyes of a muffled head. Oh, who is that ghost, that form in the dark? Years. What shapeless lump is that bent, crouched there on the sand? Streaming tears, sobbing tears, throes choked with wild cries. O oh, storm, embodied, rising, careering with swift steps along the beach, 
O wild and dismal night storm with wind, O belching and desperate, O shade so sedate and decorous by day, with calm countenance and regulated pace, but away at night as you fly, none looking, O then the unloosed ocean of tears, tears, tears. To the man of war bird, Thou who hast slept all night upon the storm, Waking renewed on thy prodigious pinions, Burst the wild storm, above it thou ascendedst, And rested on the sky, thy slave that cradled thee, Now a blue point far, far in heaven floating. As to the light emerging here on deck, I watch thee, myself a speck, a point on the world's floating vast. Far, far at sea, after the night's fierce drifts have strewn the shore with wrecks, with reappearing day as now so happy and serene, the rosy and elastic dawn, the flashing sun, the limpid spread of air cerulean, thou also reappearest. Thou born to match the gale, thou art all wings, to cope with heaven and earth and sea and hurricane, thou ship of air that never furlest thy sails, days, even weeks, untired and onward, through spaces, realms gyrating, at dusk thou lookest on Senegal, at morn America, that sportest amid the lightning flash and thunder cloud, in them, in thy experiences, Hadst thou my soul, what joys, what joys were thine? Aboard at a ship's helm Aboard at a ship's helm, a young steersman steering with care. Through fog on a sea coast dolefully ringing, an ocean bell. Oh, a warning bell rocked by the waves. Oh, you give good notice indeed. You bell by the sea reefs ringing, ringing, ringing to warn the ship from its wreck place. For as on the alert, O oh steersman, you mind the loud admonition, the bows turn, the freighted ship tacking speeds away under her gray sails, the beautiful and noble ship with all her precious wealth speeds away gaily and safe. But oh, the ship, the immortal ship, oh ship aboard the ship, ship of the body, ship of the soul, voyaging, voyaging, voyaging. On the beach at night. On the beach at night stands a child with her father, watching the east, the autumn sky. Up through the darkness, while ravening clouds, the burial clouds, in black masses spreading, lower sullen and fast athwart and down the sky. Amid a transparent clear belt of ether yet left in the east, ascends large and calm the Lord star Jupiter, and nigh at hand, only a very little above, swim the delicate sisters, the Pleiades. From the beach, the child holding the hand of her father 
Those burial clouds that lower Victoria soon to devour all, watching silently weeps. Weep not, child. Weep not, my darling. With these kisses, let me remove your tears. The ravening clouds shall not long be victorious. They shall not long possess the sky. They devour the stars only in apparition. Jupiter shall emerge. Be patient. Watch again another night. The Pleiades shall emerge. They are immortal. All those stars, both silvery and golden, shall shine out again. The great stars and the little ones shall shine out again. They endure. The vast immortal suns and the long enduring pensive moons shall again shine. Then. Dearest child, mournest thou only for Jupiter? Considerest thou alone the burial of the stars? Something there is, with my lips soothing thee, adding, I whisper, I give thee the first suggestion, the problem, and indirection. Something there is more immortal even than the stars. Many the burials, many the days and nights passing away. Something that shall endure longer even than lustrous Jupiter, longer than sun or any revolving satellite. Or the radiant sisters, the Pleiades. The world below the brine. The world below the brine. Forests at the bottom of the sea. The branches and leaves. Sea lettuce. Vast lichen, strange flowers and seeds. The thick. Tangle openings and pink turf, different colors, pale gray and green, purple, white and gold. The play of light through the water. Dumb swimmers there among the rocks, coral, gluten, grass, rushes, and the element of the swimmers. Sluggish existences grazing there, suspended, or slowly crawling close to the bottom. The sperm whale at the surface, blowing air and spray, or disporting with his flukes. The leaden-eyed shark, the walrus, the turtle, the hairy sea leopard, and the stingray. Passions there. Wars, pursuits, tribes, sight in those ocean depths, breathing that thick breathing air, as so many do. The change thence to the sight here, and to the subtle air breathed by beings like us, who walk this sphere. The change onward from ours. That of beings who walk other spheres. On the beach at night, alone. On the beach at night, alone. As the old mother sways her to and fro, singing her husky song. As I watch the bright stars shining. I think a thought of the clef of the universe and of the future, a vast similitude interlocks all, 
all spheres, grown, ungrown, small, large, suns, moons, planets, all distances of place, however wide, all distances of time, all inanimate forms, all souls. All living bodies, though they be ever so different, or in different worlds, all gaseous, watery, vegetable, mineral processes, the fish, the brutes, all nations, colors, barbarism, civilizations, languages, all identities that have existed or may exist on this globe or any globe. All lives and deaths, all of the past, present, future. This vast similitude spans them, and always has spanned, and shall forever span them, and compactly hold and enclose them. Song for all seas, all ships. One. Today, a rude, brief recitative of ships sailing the seas, each with its special flag or ship signal, of unnamed heroes in the ships, of waves spreading and spreading far as the eye can reach. Of dashing spray, and the winds piping and blowing, and out of these a chant for the sailors of all nations, fitful like a surge. Of sea captains, young or old, and the mates, and of all intrepid sailors, of the few. Very choice, taciturn, whom fate can never surprise nor death dismay. Picked sparingly, without noise, by thee, old ocean, chosen by thee, thou sea that pickest and cullest the race in time, and unitest nations, suckled by thee, old husky nurse. Embodying the indomitable, untamed as the ever the heroes on water or on land, by ones or twos appearing, ever the stock preserved and never lost, though rare enough for seed preserved. Two. Flaunt out, O sea, your separate flags of nations. Flaunt out, visible as ever, the various ship signals. But do you reserve, especially for yourself and for the soul of man, one flag above all the rest? A spiritual woven signal for all nations. Emblem of man, elate above death. Token of all brave captains and all intrepid sailors and mates, and all that went down doing their duty. Reminiscent of them, twined from all intrepid captains, young or old, a pennant, universal. Subtly waving all time over all brave sailors, all seas, all ships. Patrolling Barnegat, wild, wild the storm, and the sea high running. Steady the roar of the gale, with incessant undertone muttering, 
shouts of demoniac laughter, fitfully piercing and peeling. Waves, air, midnight, their savagest trinity lashing. Out in the shadows where milk-white combs careering, on beachy slush and sand spurts of snow fierce slanting, where through the murk the easterly death wind breasting, through cutting swirl and spray watchful and firm advancing, that in the distance is that a wreck? Is the red signal flaring? Slush and sand of the beach, tireless till daylight wending, steadily, slowly, through hoarse roar never remitting, along the midnight edge by those milky white combs careering, a group of dim, Weird forms struggling, the night confronting, the savage trinity warily watching. After the sea ship, after the sea ship, after the whistling winds. After the white-gray sails taut to their spars and ropes, below a myriad, myriad waves hastening, lifting up their necks, tending in ceaseless flow toward the track of the ship. Waves of the ocean, bubbling and gurgling, blithely prying, waves. Undulating waves, liquid, uneven, emulous waves, toward that whirling current, laughing and buoyant, with curves, where the great vessel, sailing and tracking, displaced the surface. Larger and smaller waves, in the spread of the ocean, yearnfully flowing. The wake of the sea ship after she passes, flashing and frolicsome under the sun, a motley procession with many a fleck of foam and many fragments, following the stately and rapid ship in the wake, following. End of book nineteen. Recording by Hugh McGuire. Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Book twenty by the roadside. A Boston Ballad, eighteen fifty four. To get bedtimes in Boston town, I rose this morning early. Here's a good place at the corner. I must stand and see the show. Clear the way there, Jonathan. Way for the president's marshal. Way for the government cannon. Way for the federal foot and dragoons. And the apparitions copiously tumbling. I love to look on the stars and stripes. I hope the fifes will play Yankee Doodle. How bright shine the cutlasses of the foremost troops! Every man holds his revolver, marching stiff through Boston town. The fog follows. Antiques of the same come limping. Some appear wooden-legged, and some appear bandaged and bloodless. Why, this is indeed a show. It is called the dead out of the earth. The old graveyards of the hills have hurried to see phantoms, phantoms countless by flank and rear, cocked hats and mothy mould, crutches made of mist, arms in slings, 
old men leaning on young men's shoulders. What troubles you, Yankee phantoms? What is all this chattering of bare gums? Does the ague convulse your limbs? Do you mistake your crutches for firelocks and level them? If you blind your eyes with tears, you will not see the president's marshal. If you groan such groans, you might balk the government cannon. For shame, old maniacs, bring down those tossed arms and let your white hair be. Here gape your great-grandsons, their wives gaze at them from the windows. See how well-dressed, see how orderly they conduct themselves. Worse and worse, can't you stand it? Are you retreating? Is this hour with the living too dead for you? Retreat then, pell-mell, to your graves, back, back to the hills, old neighbors. I do not think you belong here anyhow. But there is one thing that belongs here. Shall I tell you what it is, gentlemen of Boston? I will whisper it to the mayor. He shall send a committee to England. They shall get a grant from the parliament. Go with a cart to the royal vault. Dig out King George's coffin. Unwrap him quick from the grave cloth. Box up his bones for a journey. Find a swift Yankee clipper. Here is freight for you, black-bellied clipper. Up with your anchor. Shake out your sails. Steer straight toward Boston Bay. Now call for the president's marshal again. Bring out the government cannon. Fetch home with roars from Congress. Make another procession. Guard it with foot and dragoons. This centerpiece for them. Look, all orderly citizens, look from the windows. Women. The committee open the box, set up the regal ribs, glue those that will not stay. Clap the skull on top of the ribs and clap a crown on top of the skull. You have got your revenge, old buster. The crown has come to its own, and more than its own. Stick your hands in your pockets, Jonathan. You are a made man from this day. You are mighty cute. And here is one of your bargains. Europe. The 72nd and 73rd years of these states. Suddenly, out of its stale and drowsy lair, the lair of slaves, like lightning, it leapt forth, half startled at itself. Its feet upon the ashes and the rags, its hands tight to the throats of kings. O oh, hope and faith, O oh, aching close of exiled patriots' lives, O oh, many a sickened heart, turn back unto this day and make yourselves afresh. And you, paid to defile the people, you liars, mark. Not for numberless agonies, murders, lusts. For court thieving in its manifold mean forms, worming from his simplicity the poor man's wages. For many a promise sworn by royal lips and broken and laughed at in the breaking. Then in their power, not for all these, did the blows strike revenge. Where the heads of the nobles fall, the people scorn the ferocity of kings. But the sweetness of mercy brewed bitter destruction, and the frightened monarchs come back. Each comes in state with his train, hangman, priest, tax gatherer, soldier, lawyer, lord, jailer, and sycophant. Yet behind all lowering, stealing low, a shape, vague as the night, draped interminably, head, front, and form in scarlet folds, whose face and eyes none may see. 
Out of its robes only this, the red robes lifted by the arm, one finger crooked, pointed high over the top, like the head of a snake appears. Meanwhile, corpses lie in new-made graves, bloody corpses of young men, the rope of the gibbet hangs heavily. The bullets of princes are flying, the creatures of powers laugh aloud, and all these things bear fruits, and they are good. Those corpses of young men, those martyrs that hang from the gibbets, those hearts pierced by the gray lead, cold and motionless as they seem live elsewhere with unslaughtered vitality. They live in other young men, O kings. They live in brothers again ready to defy you. They were purified by death. They were taught and exalted. Not a grave of the murdered for freedom, but grows seed for freedom in its turn to bear seed, which the winds carry afar and re-sow and the rains and the snows nourish. Not a disembodied spirit can the weapons of tyrants let loose, but it stalks invisibly over the earth, whispering, counseling, cautioning. Liberty, let others despair of you. I never despair of you. Is the house shut? Is the master away? Nevertheless, be ready. Be not wary of watching. He will soon return. His messenger is coming on. Hand mirror. Hold it up sternly. See this, it sends back. Who is it? Is it you? Outside, fair costume within ashes and filth. No more flashing eye. No more a sonorous voice or springy step. Now some slave's eye, voice, hand, step. A drunkard's breath, unwholesome eater's face. For Nereali's flesh... Lungs rotting away, piecemeal, stomach sour and cankerous, joints rheumatic, bowels clogged with abomination, blood circulating dark and poisonous streams, words babble, hearing and touch callous. No brain, no heart left, no magnetism of sex. Such from one look in this looking glass, ere you go hence. Such a result so soon, and from such a beginning. Gods. Lover divine and perfect comrade, waiting content, invisible yet certain. Be thou my god, thou, thou, the ideal man, fair, able, beautiful, content, and loving, complete in body, and dilate in spirit. Be thou my God. O death, for life has served its turn, opener and usher to the heavenly mansion, be thou my God. Aught, aught of mightiest best I see, conceive or know, to break the stagnant tie, thee, thee to free, O soul, be thou my God. All great ideas, the race's aspirations, all heroisms, deeds of rapt enthusiasts, be ye my gods. Or time and space, or shape of earth divine and wondrous, or some fair shape I viewing worship, or lustrous orb of the sun or star by night, be ye my gods. Germs. Forms, qualities, lives, humanity, language, thoughts. The ones known and the ones unknown. The ones on the stars. The stars themselves, some shaped, others unshaped. Wonders as of those countries. The soil, trees, cities, inhabitants, whatever they may be. Splendid suns, the moon and rings, the countless combinations and effects such like. And as good as such like, visible here or anywhere, stand provided for a handful of space which I extend my arm and half enclose with my hand that containing the start of each and all, the virtue, the germs of all.
thoughts of ownership, as if one fit to own things could not a pleasure enter upon all and incorporate them into himself or herself. A vista, suppose some sight in arriere through the formative chaos, presuming the growth, fullness, life, now attained on the journey. But I see the road continued, and the journey ever continued. Of what was once lacking on earth and in due time has become supplied, and of what will yet be supplied, because all I see and know I believe to have its main purport in what will yet be supplied. When I heard the learned astronomer, when I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer, where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became, tired and sick, Till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air and from time to time looked up perfect silence at the stars. Perfections. Only themselves understand themselves and the like of themselves as souls only understand souls. O me, O life, O oh, me, O oh life, of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish, of myself forever reproaching myself, for who more foolish than I, and who more faithless? Of eyes that vainly crave the light, of the objects mean, of the struggle ever renewed, of the poor results of all, of the clouding and sordid crowds I see around me, of the empty and useless years of the rest, with the rest me intertwined, the question, oh me, so sad recurring, what good amid these, oh me, oh life? Answer, that you are here, that life exists, and identity, that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse to a president. All you are doing and saying is to America dangled mirages. You have not learned of nature, of the politics of nature. You have not learned the great amplitude, rectitude, impartiality. You have not seen that only such as they are for these states, and that what is less than they must sooner or later lift off from these states. I sit and look out. I sit and look out upon all the sorrows of the world and upon all oppression and shame. I hear secret convulsive sobs from young men at anguish with themselves, remorseful after deeds done. I see in low life the mother misused by her children, dying, neglected, gaunt, and desperate. I see the wife misused by her husband. I see the treacherous seducer of young woman. I mark the ranklings of jealousy and unrequited love attempted to be hid. I see these sights on the earth. I see the workings of battle, pestilence, tyranny. I see martyrs and prisoners. I observe a famine at sea. I observe the sailors casting lots who shall be killed to preserve the lives of the rest. I observe the slights and degradations cast by arrogant persons upon laborers, the poor, and upon negroes and the like. All these, all the meanness and agony without end, I sitting look out upon, see, hear, and am silent. To rich givers, what do you give me I cheerfully accept? A little sustenance, a hut and garden, a little money. As I rendezvous with my poems, a traveler's lodging and breakfast a journey through the States, why should I be ashamed to own such gifts? Why to advertise for them? 
for I myself am not one who bestows nothing upon man and woman, for I bestow upon any man or woman the entrance to all the gifts of the universe. The dalliance of the eagles, skirting the river road, my forenoon walk, my rest. Skyward in air, a sudden muffled sound, the dalliance of the eagles, the rushing amorous contact high in space together. The clinching interlocking claws, a living, fierce, gyrating wheel, four beating wings, two beaks, a swirling mass, tight grappling, in tumbling, turning, clustering loops, straight downward falling, till o'er the river poised the twain, yet one a moment's lull, a motionless, still balance in the air, then parting, talons loosening. Upward again on slow, firm pinions slanting their separate, diverse flight. She hers, he his, pursuing. Roaming in thought after reading Hegel. Roaming in thought over the universe, I saw the little that is good steadily hastening towards immortality. And the vast all that is called evil, I saw hastening to merge itself and become lost and dead. A farm picture. Through the ample open door of the peaceful country barn, a sunlit pasture field with cattle and horses feeding, and haze and vista, and the far horizon fading. child's amaze, silent and amazed even when a little boy. I remember I heard the preacher every Sunday put God in his statements as contending against some being or influence. The runner. On a flat road runs the well-trained runner. He is lean and sinewy with muscular legs. He is thinly clothed. He leans forward as he runs with lightly closed fists and arms partially raised. Beautiful women. Women sit or move to and fro, some old, some young. The young are beautiful, but the old are more beautiful than the young. Mother and babe. I see the sleeping babe nestling the breast of its mother, the sleeping mother and the babe hushed. I study them long and long. Thought of obedience, faith, adhesiveness. As I stand aloof and look, there is to me something profoundly affecting in large masses of men following the lead of those who do not believe in men. Visored, a mask, a perpetual natural disguiser of herself, concealing her face, concealing her form, changes and transformations every hour, every moment, falling upon her even when she sleeps. Thought of justice, as if could be anything but the same ample law expounded by natural judges and saviors, as if it might be this thing or that thing, according to decisions. Gliding o'er all. Gliding o'er all, through all, through nature, time, and space, as a ship on the waters advancing, the voyage of the soul, not life alone, death. Many deaths, I'll say. Hast never come to thee an hour, Hast never come to thee an hour, a sudden gleam divine, precipitating, bursting all these bubbles, fashions, wealth, these eager business aims, books, politics, art, and wars, to utter nothingness. Thought of equality as if it harmed me, giving others the same chances and rights as myself as if it were not indispensable to my own rights that others possess the same. To old age, I see in you the estuary that enlarges and spreads itself grandly as it pours in the great sea. Location.
locations and times. Locations and times, what is it in me that meets them all? Whenever and wherever it makes me at home. Forms, colors, densities, odors, what is it in me that corresponds with them? Offerings. A thousand perfect women and men appear. Around each gathers a cluster of friends and gay children and youth with offerings. To the states to identify the 16th, 17th, or 18th Presidentiad. Why reclining, interrogating? Why myself and all drowsing? What deepening twilight scum floating atop the waters? Who are they as bats and night dogs askant in the capital? What a filthy presidentiad. O oh, south, your torrid suns. O oh, north, your arctic freezings. Are those really congressmen? Are those the great judges? Is that the president? Then I will sleep a while yet. For I see that these states sleep for reasons. With gathering murk, with muttering thunder, and lambent shoots, we all duly awake. South, north, east, west, inland and seaboard, we will surely wake. End of book 20. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, Book 21, Drum Taps, Part 1. First O Songs for a Prelude. First O Songs for a Prelude, lightly strike on the stretched tympanum, pride and joy in my city. How she led the rest to arms, how she gave the cue, how at once with lithe limbs unwaiting a moment she sprang. Oh, superb! Oh, Manhattan, my own, my peerless! Oh, strongest you in the hour of danger, in crisis! Oh, truer than steel! How you sprang, how you threw off the costumes of peace with indifferent hand, how your soft opera music changed, and the drum and fife were heard in their stead. How you led to the war. That shall serve for our prelude, Songs of Soldiers. How Manhattan drum taps led. Forty years had I in my city seen soldiers parading. Forty years as a pageant, till unawares the lady of this teeming and turbulent city, sleepless amid her ships, her houses, her incalculable wealth, with her million children around her, suddenly, at dead of night, at news from the south, incensed, struck with clinched hand, the pavement. A shock electric, the night sustained it, till with ominous hum our hive at daybreak poured out its myriads. From the houses then, and the workshops, and through all the doorways, leapt they tumultuous, and lo, Manhattan, arming. To the drum taps prompt, the young men falling in and arming, the mechanics arming, the trowel, the jack plane, the blacksmith's hammer, tossed aside with precipitation, the lawyer leaving his office and arming, the judge leaving his court, the driver deserting his wagon in the street, jumping down, throwing the reins abruptly down on the horses' backs. The salesman leaving the store, the boss, bookkeeper, porter, all leaving. Squads gather everywhere by common consent and arm. The new recruits, even boys, the old men show them how to wear their accoutrements. They buckle the straps carefully. Outdoors arming, indoors arming, the flash of the musket barrels. The white tents cluster in camps. The armed sentries around, the sunrise cannon, and again at sunset. Armed regiments arrive every day, pass through the city, and embark from the wharves. How good they look as they tramp down to the river, sweaty, with their guns on their shoulders. How I love them, 
how I could hug them with their brown faces and their clothes and knapsacks covered with dust. The blood of the city up-armed, armed, the cry everywhere, the flags flung out from the steeples of churches and from all the public buildings and stores, the tearful parting, the mother kisses her son, the son kisses his mother. Loath is the mother to part, yet not a word does she speak to detain him. The tumultuous escort, the ranks of policemen preceding, clearing the way. The unpent enthusiasm, the wild cheers of the crowd for their favorites. The artillery, the silent cannons bright as gold, drawn along, rumble lightly over the stones. Silent cannons, soon to cease your silence, soon unlimbered to begin the red business. All the mutter of preparation, all the determined arming, the hospital service, the lint, bandages and medicines, the women volunteering for nurses, the work begun for in earnest, no mere parade now. War, an armed race is advancing, the welcome for battle, no turning away. War, be it weeks, months, or years, an armed race is advancing to welcome it. Manhattan a march, and it's oh to sing it well, it's oh for a manly life in the camp. And the sturdy artillery, the guns bright as gold, the work for giants to serve well the guns, unlimber them. No more as the past forty years for salutes for courtesies merely. Put in something now besides powder and wadding. And you, lady of ships, you, Manahata, old matron of this proud, friendly, turbulent city, often in peace and wealth you were pensive or covertly frowned amid all your children. But now you smile with joy exulting, old Manahata. 1861. Armed year, year of the struggle. No dainty rhymes or sentimental love verses for you, terrible year. Not you as some pale poetling seated at a desk, lisping cadenza's piano. But as a strong man erect, clothed in blue clothes, advancing, carrying rifle on your shoulder. With well-gristled body and sunburnt face and hands with a knife in the belt at your side. As I heard you shouting loud, your sonorous voice ringing across the continent, your masculine voice, O oh year, as rising amid the great cities. Amid the men of Manhattan, I saw you as one of the workmen, the dwellers in Manhattan. Or with large steps crossing the prairies out of Illinois and Indiana, rapidly crossing the west with springy gait and descending the Alleghenies or down from the Great Lakes, or in Pennsylvania, or on deck along the Ohio River, or southward along the Tennessee or Cumberland Rivers, or at Chattanooga on the mountaintop, saw I your gait, and saw I your sinewy limbs clothed in blue, bearing weapons, robust year, heard your determined voice launched forth again and again, year that suddenly sang by the mouths, of the round-lipped cannon, I repeat you, hurrying, crashing, sad, distracted year. Beat, beat, drums. Beat, beat, drums. Blow, bugles, blow. Through the windows, through doors, burst like a ruthless force into the solemn church and scatter the congregation, into the school where the scholar is studying. Leave not the bridegroom quiet, no happiness must he have now with his bride, nor the peaceful farmer any peace, plowing his field or gathering his grain. So fierce you whir and pound, you drums, so shrill you bugles blow. Beat, beat, drums, blow, bugles, blow. Over the traffic of cities, over the rumble of wheels in the streets, are beds prepared for sleepers at night in the houses? No sleepers must sleep in those beds. No bargainers' bargains by day. No brokers or speculators. Would they continue? 
Would the talkers be talking? Would the singer attempt to sing? Would the lawyer rise in the court to state his case before the judge? Then rattle quicker, heavier drums. You bugles wilder blow. Beat, beat drums. Blow, bugles, blow. Make no parley. Stop for no expostulation. Mind not the timid. Mind not the weeper or prayer. Mind not the old man beseeching the young man. Let not the child's voice be heard, nor the mother's entreaties. Make even the trestles to shake the dead where they lie awaiting the hearses. So strong you thump, O oh, terrible drums. So loud you bugles blow. From Palmanach, starting, I fly like a bird. From Palmanach, starting, I fly like a bird, around and around, to soar, to sing the idea of all, to the north betaking myself to sing their arctic songs, to Canada till I absorb Canada in myself, to Michigan then, to Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, to sing their songs, they are inimitable, then to Ohio and Indiana to sing theirs, to Missouri and Kansas and Arkansas to sing theirs, to Tennessee and Kentucky, to the Carolinas and Georgia to sing theirs, to Texas, and so along up toward California, to Rome accepted everywhere, to sing first, to the tap of the war drum if need be, the idea of all, of the western world one and inseparable, and then the song of each member of these states. Song of the Banner at Daybreak Poet. Oh, a new song, a free song, flapping, 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 by sounds, by voices clearer, by the wind's voice and that of the drum, by the banner's voice and child's voice, and sea's voice and father's voice, low on the ground and high in the air, on the ground where father and child stand, in the upward air where their eyes turn where the banner at daybreak is flapping. Words, book words, what are you? Words no more, for hearken and see, my song is there in the open air, and I must sing with the banner and pennants of flapping. I'll weave the cord and twine in man's desire and babe's desire. I'll twine them in. I'll put in life. I'll put the bayonet's flashing point. I'll let bullets and slugs whiz as one carrying a symbol and menace far into the future, crying with trumpet voice, Arouse and beware, beware and arouse. I'll pour the verse with streams of blood, full of volition, full of joy, then loosen, launch forth, to go and compete with the banner and pennant, a flapping. Pennant. Come up here, bard, bard, Come up here, soul, soul. Come up here, dear little child, to fly in the clouds and winds with me and play with the measureless light. Child. Father, what is that in the sky beckoning to me with long finger, and what does it say to me all the while? Father. Nothing, my babe, you see in the sky, and nothing at all to you, it says. But look you, my babe, Look at these dazzling things in the houses, and see you the money shops opening, and see you the vehicles preparing to crawl along the streets with goods. These, ah, these, how valued and toiled for these, how envied by all the earth. Poet. Fresh and rosy red, the sun is mounting high. On floats the sea in distant blue, careering through its channels. On floats the wind over the breast of the sea, setting in toward land. The great steady wind from west or west by south, floating so buoyant with milk-white foam on the waters. But I am not the sea, nor the red sun. I am not the wind with girlish laughter, not the immense wind which strengthens, nor the wind which lashes, not the spirit that ever lashes its own body to terror and death. But I am that which unseen comes, and sings, 
sings, sings. Which babbles in brooks and scoots in showers on the land, which the birds know in the woods, mornings and evenings, and the shore sands know and the hissing wave, and that banner and pennant, aloft there, flapping and flapping. Child. Oh, father, it is alive. It is full of people. It has children. Oh, now it seems to me it is talking to its children. I hear it. It talks to me. Oh, it is wonderful. Oh, it stretches. It spreads and runs so fast. Oh, my father, it is so broad it covers the whole sky. Father. Cease, cease, my foolish babe. What you are saying is sorrowful to me. Much displeases me. Behold with the rest again, I say, behold not banners and pennants aloft, but the well-prepared pavements behold, and mark the solid-walled houses. Banner and Pennant Speak to the child, O bard, out of Manhattan. To our children all, or north or south of Manhattan, point this day, leaving all the rest to us over all, and yet we know not why. For what are we, mere strips of cloth, profiting nothing, only flapping in the wind? Poet I hear and see not strips of cloth alone. I hear the tramp of armies. I hear the challenging sentry. I hear the jubilant shouts of millions of men. I hear liberty. I hear the drums beat and the trumpets blowing. I myself move abroad, swift rising, flying then. I use the wings of the land bird and use the wings of the sea bird and look down as from a height. I do not deny the precious results of peace. I see populous cities with wealth incalculable. I see numberless farms. I see the farmers working in their fields or barns. I see mechanics working. I see buildings everywhere, founded, going up or finished. I see trains of cars swiftly speeding along railroad tracks drawn by the locomotives. I see the stores, depots of Boston, Baltimore, Charleston, New Orleans. I see far in the west the immense area of grain. I dwell a while hovering. I pass to the lumber forests of the north, and again to the southern plantation, and again to California. Sweeping the whole, I see the countless profit, the busy gatherings, earned wages. See the identity formed out of thirty-eight spacious and haughty states, and many more to come. See forts on the shores of harbors, see ships sailing in and out, then over all, I, I, my little and lengthened pennant shaped like a sword, runs swiftly up indicating war and defiance, and now the halyards have raised it. Side of my banner, broad and blue, side of my starry banner, discarding peace over all the sea and land. Banner and Pennant Yet louder, higher, stronger, bard, yet farther, wider cleave. No longer let our children deem us riches and peace alone. We may be terror and carnage, and are so now. Not now are we any one of these spacious and haughty states, nor any five, nor ten. Nor market, nor depot we, nor money bank in the city, but these and all, and the brown and spreading land, and the mines below, are ours. And the shores of the sea are ours, and the rivers great and small, and the fields they moisten, and the crops and the fruits are ours, bays and channels and ships sailing in and out are ours, while we over all, over the area spread below, the three or four millions of square miles, the capitals, the forty millions of people. O oh, bard, in life and death supreme, we, even we, henceforth flaunt out masterful, high up above, not for the present alone, for a thousand years chanting through you this song to the soul of one poor little child. Child. Oh, my father, I like not the houses. They will never to me be anything, nor do I like money. But to mount up there I would like, oh, father dear, 
That banner I like, that penance I would be and must be. Father. Child of mine, you fill me with anguish. To be that penant would be too fearful. Little you know what it is this day, and after this day forever, it is to gain nothing but risk and defy everything. Forward to stand in front of wars, and oh, such wars. What have you to do with them, with passions of demons, slaughter, premature death? Banner. Demons and death then I sing, put in all, I all will I, sword-shaped pennant for war, and a pleasure new and ecstatic, and the prattled yearning of children blent with the sounds of the peaceful land and the liquid wash of the sea, and the black ships fighting on the sea enveloped in smoke, and the icy cool of the far, far north with rustling cedars and pines, and the whir of drums and the sound of soldiers marching, and the hot sun shining south. And the beach waves combing over the beach on my eastern shore, and my western shore the same. And all between those shores, and my ever-running Mississippi with bends and shoots, and my Illinois fields, and my Kansas fields, and my fields of Missouri, the continent, devoting the whole identity without reserving an atom. Pour in, whelm that which asks, which sings, with all and the yield of all, fusing and holding, claiming, devouring the whole. No more with tender lip, nor musical labial sound, but out of the night emerging for good, our voice persuasive no more, croaking like crows here in the wind. Poet. My limbs, my veins dilate, my theme is clear at last. Banner so broad advancing out of the night, I sing you haughty and resolute. I burst through where I waited long, too long, deafened and blinded. My hearing and tongue are come to me. A little child taught me. I hear from above, O oh, pennant of war, your ironical call and demand. Insensate, insensate, yet I at any rate chant you, O banner, not houses of peace indeed are you, nor any nor all their prosperity. If need be, you shall again have every one of those houses to destroy them. You thought not to destroy those valuable houses, standing fast, full of comfort, built with money. May they stand fast then? Not an hour except you above them and all stand fast. O banner, not money so precious are you, not farm produce you, nor the material good nutriment, nor excellent stores, nor landed on wharves from the ships, not the superb ships with sail power or steam power, fetching and carrying cargoes, nor machinery, vehicles, trade, nor revenues, but you, as henceforth I see you, running up out of the night, bringing your cluster of stars, ever enlarging stars, divider of daybreak you, cutting the air, touched by the sun, measuring the sky, passionately seen and yearned for by one poor little child, while others remain busy or smartly talking, forever teaching thrift, thrift. Oh, you up there, oh, pennant, where you undulate like a snake, hissing so curious. Out of reach, an idea only, yet furiously fought for, risking bloody death, loved by me, so loved. Oh, you banner leading the day with stars brought from the night. Valueless, object of eyes, over all and demanding all, absolute owner of all. Oh, banner and pennant. I too leave the rest, great as it is, it is nothing. Houses, machines are nothing, I see them not. I see but you, O oh warlike pennant, O oh banner so broad, with stripes, sing you only, flapping up there in the wind. Rise, O oh days, from your fathomless deeps. Rise, O oh days, from your fathomless deeps. 
till you loftier, fiercer sweep. Long for my soul hungering gymnastic, I devoured what the earth gave me. Long I roamed amid the woods of the north, long I watched Niagara pouring. I traveled the prairies over and slept on their breast. I crossed the Nevadas, I crossed the plateaus. I ascended the towering rocks along the Pacific. I sailed out to sea, I sailed through the storm, I was refreshed by the storm. I watched with joy the threatening maws of the waves. I marked the white combs where they careered so high, curling over. I heard the wind piping. I saw the black clouds. Saw from below what arose and mounted. Oh, superb! Oh, wild as my heart and powerful! Heard the continuous thunder as it bellowed after the lightning. Noted the slender and jagged threads of lightning as sudden and fast amid the din they chased each other across the sky. These, and such as these, I, elate, saw, saw with wonder, yet pensive and masterful, all the menacing might of the globe uprisen around me, yet there with my soul I fed, I fed content, supercilious. Two. T'was well, O soul, t'was a good preparation you gave me, now we advance our latent and ampler hunger to fill. Now we go forth to receive what the earth and the sea never gave us. Not through the mighty woods we go, but through the mightier cities. Something for us is pouring now more than Niagara pouring. Torrents of men. Sources and rills of the northwest. Are you indeed inexhaustible? What, to pavements and homesteads here? What were those storms of the mountains and sea? What, to passions I witness around me today, was the sea risen? Was the wind piping the pipe of death under the black clouds? Lo, from deeps more unfathomable, something more deadly and savage, Manhattan rising, advancing with menacing front, Cincinnati, Chicago unchained, what was that swell I saw on the ocean? Behold what comes here, how it climbs with daring feet and hands, how it dashes, how the true thunder bellows after the lightning, how bright the flashes of lightning, how democracy with desperate, vengeful port strides on, shown through the dark by those flashes of lightning. Yet a mournful wail and low sob I fancied I heard through the dark, in a lull of the deafening confusion. Three. Thunder on, stride on, democracy, strike with vengeful stroke. And do you rise higher than ever yet, O days, O cities? Crash heavier, heavier yet, O storms. You have done me good. My soul prepared in the mountains absorbs your immortal strong nutriment. Long had I walked my cities, my country roads through farms, only half satisfied. One doubt, nauseous, undulating like a snake, crawled on the ground before me, continually preceding my steps, turning upon me oft, ironically hissing low. The cities I loved so well I abandoned and left. I sped to the certainties suitable to me, hungering, hungering, hungering for primal energies and nature's dauntlessness. I refreshed myself with it only. I could relish it only. I waited the bursting forth of the pent fire. On the water and air, waited long. But now I no longer wait. I am fully satisfied. I am glutted. I have witnessed the true lightning. I have witnessed my cities electric. I have lived to behold man burst forth and warlike America rise. Hence I will seek no more the food of the northern solitary wilds, no more the mountains roam or sail the stormy sea. Virginia, the West. The noble sire, fallen on evil days, I saw with hand uplifted, menacing, brandishing, Memories of old in abeyance, love and faith in abeyance. 
the insane knife toward the mother of all. The noble sun on sinewy feet advancing, I saw, out of the land of prairies, land of Ohio's waters and of Indiana, to rescue the stalwart giant, hurry his plenteous offspring, dressed in blue, bearing their trusty rifles on their shoulders. Then the mother of all, with calm voice speaking, as to you, rebellious, I seemed to hear her say, Why strive against me, and why seek my life? When you yourself forever provide to defend me, for you provided me Washington, and now these also. City of Ships City of Ships Oh, the black ships, oh, the fierce ships, oh, the beautiful sharp-bowed steamships and sail ships. City of the world, for all races are here, all the lands of the earth make contributions here. City of the sea, city of hurried and glittering tides, city whose gleeful tides continually rush or recede, whirling in and out with eddies and foam. City of wharves and stores, city of tall facades of marble and iron, proud and passionate city, mettlesome, mad, extravagant city. Spring up, O oh city, not for peace alone, but be indeed yourself warlike. Fear not, submit to no models but your own, O oh city. Behold me, incarnate me as I have incarnated you. I have rejected nothing you offered me. Whom you adopted, I have adopted. Good or bad, I never question you. I love all. I do not condemn anything. I chant and celebrate all that is yours. Yet peace no more. In peace I chanted peace. But now the drum of war is mine. War, red war, is my song through your streets, O city. THE CENTENARIAN'S STORY Volunteer of 1861 to 1862 at Washington Park, Brooklyn, assisting the centenarian. Give me your hand, old revolutionary. The hilltop is nigh, but a few steps. Make room, gentlemen. Up the path you have followed me well, spite of your hundred and extra years. You can walk, old man, though your eyes are almost done. Your faculties serve you, and presently I must have them serve me. Rest, while I tell what the crowd around us means. On the plain below, recruits are drilling and exercising. There is the camp. One regiment departs tomorrow. Do you hear the officers giving their orders? Do you hear the clank of the muskets? Why, what comes over you now, old man? Why do you tremble and clutch my hand so convulsively? The troops are but drilling. They are yet surrounded with smiles. Around them at hand, the well-dressed friends and the women, while splendid and warm, the afternoon sun shines down. Green, the midsummer verdure, and fresh blows the dallying breeze, o'er proud and peaceful cities, and arm of the sea between. But drill and parade are over. They march back to quarters. Only hear that approval of hands. Hear what a clapping. As wending, the crowds now part and disperse. But we, old man, not for nothing have I brought you hither. We must remain. You to speak in your turn. And I to listen and tell. The Centenarian when I clutched your hand, it was not with terror, but suddenly pouring about me here on every side, and below there where the boys were drilling, and up the slopes they ran, and where tents are pitched, and wherever you see south and southeast and southwest, over hills, across lowlands, and in the skirts of woods, and along the shores, in mire, now filled over, came again and suddenly raged. As eighty-five years agone, no mere parade received with applause of friends, but a battle which I took part in myself. I, long ago as it is, I took part in it, walking then this hilltop, this same ground. I, this is the ground. My blind eyes, even as I speak, 
behold it repeopled from graves. The years recede, pavements and stately houses disappear, rude forts appear again, the old hooped guns are mounted. I see the lines of raised earth stretching from river to bay. I mark the vista of waters. I mark the uplands and slopes. Here we lay encamped. It was this time in summer also. As I talk, I remember all. I remember the declaration. It was read here. The whole army paraded. It was read to us here. By his staff surrounded, the general stood in the middle. He held up his unsheathed sword. It glittered in the sun in full sight of the army. "'Twas a bold act, then. The English warships had just arrived. We could watch down the lower bay where they lay at anchor, and the transports swarming with soldiers. A few days more, and they landed, and then the battle. Twenty thousand were brought against us, a veteran force furnished with good artillery. I tell not now the whole of the battle, but one brigade early in the forenoon ordered forward to engage the redcoats. Of that brigade I tell, and how steadily it marched, and how long and well it stood confronting death. Who do you think that was marching steadily, sternly, confronting death? It was the brigade of the youngest men, two thousand strong, raised in Virginia and Maryland and most of them known personally to the general. Jauntily forward they went with quick step toward Gowanus waters, till of a sudden unlooked for by defiles through the woods, gained at night the British advancing, rounding in from the east, fiercely playing their guns. That brigade of the youngest was cut off, and at the enemy's mercy. The general watched them from this hill, they made repeated desperate attempts to burst their environment, then drew close together, very compact, their flag flying in the middle. But oh, from the hills, how the cannon were thinning and thinning them. It sickens me yet, that slaughter. I saw the moisture gather in drops on the face of the general. I saw how he wrung his hands in anguish. Meanwhile, the British maneuvered to draw us out for a pitched battle, but we dared not trust the chances of a pitched battle. We fought the fight in detachments. Sallying forth, we fought at several points, but in each the luck was against us. Our foe advancing, steadily getting the best of it, pushed us back to the works on this hill, till we turned menacing here, and then he left us. That was the going out of the brigade of the youngest men, two thousand strong. Few returned. Nearly all remain in Brooklyn. That and here my general's first battle. No women looking on, nor sunshine to bask in. It did not conclude with applause. Nobody clapped hands here then. But in darkness, in mist, on the ground, under a chill rain. Wearied that night, we lay foiled and sullen, while scornfully laughed many an arrogant lord off against us and camped, quite within hearing, feasting, clinking wine glasses together over their victory. So dull and damp, and another day, but the night of that, mist lifting, rain ceasing, silent as a ghost while they thought they were sure of him, my general retreated. I saw him at the riverside, down by the ferry, lit by torches, hastening the embarkation. My general waited till the soldiers and wounded were all passed over, and then, it was just ere sunrise, these eyes rested on him for the last time. Everyone else seemed filled with gloom, many, no doubt, thought of capitulation. But when my general passed me, as he stood in his boat and looked toward the coming sun, I saw something different from capitulation. Terminus. Enough. The centarian story ends. The two, past and present, have interchanged. I myself, as connector, as chansonnier of a great future, am now speaking. And is this the ground Washington trod? And these waters I listlessly daily cross, are these the waters he crossed? 
as resolute in defeat as other generals in their proudest triumph? I must copy the story, and send it eastward and westward. I must preserve that look as it beamed on you rivers of Brooklyn. See, as the annual round returns, the phantoms return. It is the 27th of August, and the British have landed. The battle begins and goes against us. Behold through the smoke Washington's face. The brigade of Virginia and Maryland have marched forth to intercept the enemy. They are cut off. Murderous artillery from the hills plays upon them. Rank after rank falls, while over them silently droops the flag, baptized that day in many a young man's bloody wounds. In death, defeat, and sisters, mothers, tears. Ah, hills and slopes of Brooklyn, I perceive you are more valuable than your owners supposed. In the midst of you stands an encampment very old, stands forever the camp of that dead brigade. Cavalry crossing a ford. A line in long array where they wind betwixt green islands. They take a serpentine course. Their arms flash in the sun. Hark to the musical clank. Behold the silvery river. In it the splashing horses loitering stop to drink. Behold the brown-faced men. Each group, each person a picture. The negligent rest on the saddles, while some emerge on the opposite bank. Others are just entering the ford, while scarlet and blue and snowy white, the Gwydon flags flutter gaily in the wind. Bivouac on a mountainside. I see before me now a traveling army halting. Below a fertile valley spread with barns and the orchards of summer. Behind the terraced sides of a mountain, abrupt, in places rising high, broken with rocks and clinging cedars, with tall shapes dingily seen. The numerous campfires scattered near and far, some away up on the mountain. The shadowy forms of men and horses looming, large sized flickering. And over all the sky, the sky, far, far out of reach, studded, breaking out, the eternal stars. End of Book 21, Part 1 Read by Kara Schallenberg on December 12th, 2005, in Oceanside, California. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman Book 21 Drum Taps Part 2 An Army Corps on the March With its cloud of skirmishers in advance, with now the sound of a single shot snapping like a whip, and now an irregular volley, the swarming ranks press on and on, the dense brigades press on, glittering dimly, toiling under the sun, the dust-covered men in columns rise and fall to the undulations of the ground. With artillery interspersed, the wheels rumble, the horses sweat, as the army corps advances. By the Bivouac's Fitful Flame By the Bivouac's Fitful Flame, a procession winding around me, solemn and sweet and slow, but first I note the tents of the sleeping army, the fields and woods dim outline, the darkness lit by spots of kindled fire, the silence, like a phantom, far or near, an occasional figure moving, the shrubs and trees, as I lift my eyes, they seem to be stealthily watching me, while wind in procession thoughts, oh, tender and wondrous thoughts, of life and death, of home and the past and loved, and of those that are far away. A solemn and slow procession there, as I sit on the ground, by the bivouac's fitful flame. Come up from the fields, father. 
Come up from the fields, father, here's a letter from our Pete. And come to the front door, mother, here's a letter from thy dear son. Lo, tis autumn. Lo, where the trees, deeper green, yellower and redder, cool and sweeten Ohio's villages with leaves fluttering in the moderate wind. Where apples ripe in the orchards hang, and grapes on the trellised vines. Smell you the smell of the grapes on the vines? Smell you the buckwheat, where the bees were lately buzzing? Above all, lo, the sky so calm, so transparent after the rain, and with wondrous clouds. Below, too, all calm, all vital and beautiful, and the farm prospers well. Down in the fields all prospers well. But now from the fields come father, come at the daughter's call, and come to the entry, mother, to the front door, come right away. Fast as she can she hurries, something ominous, her steps trembling. She does not tarry to smooth her hair, nor adjust her cap. Open the envelope quickly. Oh, this is not our son's writing, yet his name is signed. Oh, a strange hand writes for our dear son. Oh, stricken mother's soul. All swims before her eyes, flashes with black. She catches the main words only, sentences broken. Gunshot wound in the breast, cavalry skirmish, taken to hospital. At present low, but will soon be better. Ah, now the single figure to me, amid all teeming and wealthy Ohio, with all its cities and farms, sickly white in the face and dull in the head, very faint, by the jam of a door leans. Grieve not so, dear mother, the just-grown daughter speaks through her sobs. The little sisters huddle around, speechless and dismayed. See, dearest mother, the letter says Pete will soon be better. Alas, poor boy, he will never be better. Nor may be needs to be better, that brave and simple soul. While they stand at home at the door, he is dead already. The only son is dead. But the mother needs to be better. She, with thin form, presently dressed in black, by day her meals untouched. Then, at night, fitfully sleeping, often waking, in the midnight waking, weeping, longing, with one deep longing. Oh, that she might withdraw unnoticed, silent from life escape and withdraw, to follow, to seek, to be with her dear dead son. Vigil strange I kept on the field one night, Vigil strange I kept on the field one night, When you, my son, and my comrade, Dropped at my side that day. One look I but gave, which your dear eyes returned, With a look I shall never forget. One touch of your hand to mine, O oh boy, Reached up as you lay on the ground. Then onward I sped in the battle, The even contested battle. Till late in the night, Relieved to the place at last again I made my way, Found you in death, so cold, dear comrade, Found your body, son of responding kisses, Never again on earth responding. Bared your face in the starlight, Curious the scene, Cool blew the moderate night wind. Long there and then in vigil I stood, Dimly around me the battlefield spreading, Vigil wondrous and vigil sweet There in the fragrant silent night But not a tear fell Not even a long-drawn sigh Long, long I gazed Then on the earth partially reclining Sat by your side Leaning my chin in my hands Passing sweet hours Immortal and mystic hours With you, dearest comrade Not a tear not a word. Vigil of silence, love and death. Vigil for you, my son and my soldier, as onward, silently, stars aloft, eastward, new ones upward stole. Vigil final for you, brave boy. 
I could not save you. Swift was your death. I faithfully loved you and cared for you living. I think we shall surely meet again. Till at latest lingering of the night, indeed, just as the dawn appeared, my comrade I wrapped in his blanket, enveloped well his form, folded the blanket well, tucking it carefully overhead and carefully under feet. And there and then, and bathed by the rising sun, my son in his grave, in his rude-dug grave, I deposited. Ending my vigil strange with that, vigil of night and battlefield dim, vigil for boy of responding kisses, never again on earth responding. Vigil for comrades swiftly slain, vigil I never forget, how as day brightened, I rose from the chill ground, and folded my soldier well in his blanket, and buried him where he fell. A march in the ranks hard pressed, and the road unknown. A march in the ranks hard pressed, and the road unknown. A rout through a heavy wood with muffled steps in the darkness. Our army foiled with loss severe, and the sullen remnant retreating, till after midnight glimmer upon us the lights of a dim-lighted building. We come to an open space in the woods, and halt by the dim-lighted building. Tis a large old church at the crossing roads, now an impromptu hospital. Entering but for a minute, I see a sight beyond all the pictures and poems ever made. Shadows of deepest, deepest black, just lit by moving candles and lamps, and by one great pitchy torch, stationary with wild red flame and clouds of smoke. By these, crowds, groups of forms, vaguely I see on the floor, some in the pews laid down. At my feet, more distinctly, a soldier, a mere lad, in danger of bleeding to death. He is shot in the abdomen. I stanch the blood temporarily. The youngster's face is white as a lily. Then before I depart, I sweep my eyes o'er the scene, fain to absorb it all. Faces, varieties, postures beyond description, most in obscurity, some of them dead. Surgeons operating, attendants holding lights, the smell of ether, odor of blood. The crowd, oh, the crowd of the bloody forms, the yard outside also filled. Some on the bare ground, some on planks or stretchers, some in the death spasm, sweating. An occasional scream or cry, the doctors shouted orders or calls, the glisten of the little steel instruments catching the glint of the torches. These I resume as I chant. I see again the forms, I smell the odor. Then here outside the orders given, Fall in, my men, fall in. But first I bend to the dying lad. His eyes open, a half smile gives he me. Then the eyes close, calmly close, and I speed forth to the darkness, resuming, marching, ever in darkness marching, on in the ranks, the unknown road still marching. A sight in camp in the daybreak gray and dim. A sight in camp in the daybreak gray and dim, as from my tent I emerge so early sleepless, as slow I walk in the cool, fresh air, the path near by the hospital tent. Three forms I see on stretchers lying, brought out there, untended lying. Over each the blanket spread, ample brownish woolen blanket, gray and heavy blanket, folding, covering all. Curious I halt and silent stand, then with light fingers I from the face of the nearest, the first, just lift the blanket. Who are you, elderly man, so gaunt and grim, with well-grayed hair and flesh all sunken about the eyes? Who are you, my dear comrade? Then to the second I step, 
And who are you, my child and darling? Who are you, sweet boy, with cheeks yet blooming? Then to the third, a face nor child nor old, very calm, as of beautiful yellow-white ivory. Young man, I think I know you. I think this face is the face of the Christ himself, dead and divine, and brother of all. And here again he lies. As toilsome I wandered Virginia's woods. As toilsome I wandered Virginia's woods, to the music of rustling leaves kicked by my feet, for twas autumn. I marked at the foot of a tree the grave of a soldier, mortally wounded he, and buried on the retreat. Easily all could understand. The halt of a midday hour went up no time to lose, yet this sign left on a tablet scrawled and nailed on the tree by the grave, bold, cautious, true, and my loving comrade. Long, long I muse, then on my way go wandering, many a changeful season to follow, and many a scene of life, yet at times through changeful season and scene, abrupt, alone, or in the crowded street, comes before me the unknown soldier's grave, comes the inscription rude in Virginia's woods, bold, cautious, true, and my loving comrade. Not the pilot. Not the pilot has charged himself to bring his ship into port, though beaten back and many times baffled. Not the pathfinder penetrating inland, weary and long, by deserts parched, snows chilled, rivers wet, perseveres till he reaches his destination. More than I have charged myself, heeded or unheeded, to compose march for these states, for a battle call, rousing to arms if need be, years, centuries hence. Year that trembled and reeled beneath me. Year that trembled and reeled beneath me. Your summer wind was warm enough, yet the air I breathed froze me. A thick gloom fell through the sunshine and darkened me. Must I change my triumphant songs? said I to myself. Must I indeed learn to chant the cold dirges of the baffled and sullen hymns of defeat? The Wound Dresser. One. An old man bending, I come among new faces, years looking backward, resuming in answer to children. Come tell us, old man, as from young men and maidens that love me. Aroused and angry, I'd thought to beat the alarm and urge relentless war, but soon my fingers failed me, my face drooped, and I resigned myself to sit by the wounded and soothe them, or silently watch the dead. Years hence of these scenes, of these furious passions, these chances of unsurpassed heroes, was one side so brave, the other was equally brave. Now be witness again, paint the mightiest armies of earth, of those armies so rapid, so wondrous, what saw you to tell us? What stays with you latest and deepest, of curious panics, of hard-fought engagements or sieges tremendous, what deepest remains? Two. O oh, maidens and young men I love and that love me, what you ask of my days, those the strangest and sudden your talking recalls. Soldier alert, I arrive after a long march covered with sweat and dust, in the nick of time I come, plunge in the fight, loudly shout in the rush of successful charge. Enter the captured works, yet lo, like a swift running river they fade, pass and are gone, they fade. I dwell not on soldiers' perils or soldiers' joys. Both I remember well, many the hardships, few the joys. Yet I was content. 
But in silence, in dreams, projections, while the world of gain and appearance and mirth goes on, so soon what is over forgotten, and waves wash the imprints off the sand. With hinged knees returning, I enter the doors, while for you up there, whoever you are, follow without noise, and be of strong heart. Bearing the bandages, water and sponge, straight and swift, to my wounded I go, where they lie on the ground after the battle brought in, where their priceless blood reddens the grass, the ground, or to the rows of the hospital tent, or under the roofed hospital to the long rows of cots, up and down each side I return. To each and all, one after another I draw near, not one do I miss. An attendant follows, holding a tray. He carries a refuse pail soon to be filled with clotted rags and blood, emptied and refilled again. I onward go, I stop, with hinged knees and steady hand to dress wounds. I am firm with each, the pangs are sharp yet unavoidable. One turns to me his appealing eyes. Poor boy, I never knew you, yet I think I could not refuse this moment to die for you, if that would save you. Three. On, on I go. Open doors of time, open hospital doors. The crushed head I dress, poor crazed hand, tear not the bandage away. The neck of the cavalryman with the bullet through and through examine. Hard the breathing rattles, quite glazed already the eye, yet life struggles hard. Come, sweet death, be persuaded, O oh, beautiful death. In mercy, come quickly. From the stump of the arm, the amputated hand, I undo the clotted lint, remove the slough, wash off the matter and blood. Back on his pillow, the soldier bends with curved neck and side-falling head. His eyes are closed. His face is pale. He dares not look on the bloody stump and has not yet looked on it. I dress a wound in the side, deep, deep, but a day or two more, for see the frame all wasted and sinking, and the yellow-blue countenance, see. I dress the perforated shoulder, the foot with the bullet wound, cleanse the one with a gnawing and putrid gangrene, so sickening, so offensive, while the attendant stands behind, aside me, holding the tray and pail. I am faithful, I do not give out, the fractured thigh, the knee, the wound in the abdomen. These and more I dress with impassive hand. Yet deep in my breast a fire, a burning flame. Four. Thus in silence, in dreams, projections, returning, resuming, I thread my way through the hospitals. The hurt and wounded I pacify with soothing hand. I sit by the restless all the dark night. Some are so young, some suffer so much. I recall the experience, sweet and sad. Many a soldier's loving arms about this neck have crossed and rested. Many a soldier's kiss dwells on these bearded lips. Long, too long, America. Long, too long, America, traveling roads all even and peaceful, you learned from joys and prosperity only. But now, ah, now, to learn from crises of anguish, advancing, grappling with direst fate, and recoiling not. And now to conceive and show to the world what your children en masse really are. For who except myself has yet conceived what your children en masse really are? Give me the splendid silent sun. One. Give me the splendid silent sun with all his beams full dazzling. Give me autumnal fruit ripe and red from the orchard. Give me a field where the unmowed grass grows. Give me an arbor. Give me the trellised grape. Give me fresh corn and wheat. Give me serene moving animals teaching content. Give me nights perfectly quiet, as on high plateaus west of the Mississippi, and I looking up at the stars. 
Give me odorous at sunrise a garden of beautiful flowers where I can walk undisturbed. Give me for marriage a sweet-breathed woman of whom I should never tire. Give me a perfect child. Give me away, aside from the noise of the world, a rural domestic life. Give me to warble spontaneous songs recluse by myself for my own ears only. Give me solitude. Give me nature. Give me again, O oh nature, your primal sanities. These demanding to have them, tired with ceaseless excitement and racked by the war strife. These to procure, incessantly asking, rising in cries from my heart, while yet incessantly asking, still I adhere to my city. Day upon day and year upon year, O oh city, walking your streets, for you hold me enchained a certain time, refusing to give me up, yet giving to make me glutted, enriched of soul, to give me forever faces. Oh, I see what I sought to escape, confronting, reversing my cries, see my own soul trampling down what it asked for. 2. Keep your splendid silence, son. Keep your woods, O oh nature, and the quiet places by the woods. Keep your fields of clover and timothy, and your cornfields and orchards. Keep the blossoming buckwheat fields where the ninth month bees hum. Give me faces and streets. Give me these phantoms, incessant and endless, along the trottoirs. Give me interminable eyes. Give me women. Give me comrades and lovers by the thousand. Let me see new ones every day. Let me hold new ones by the hand every day. Give me such shows. Give me the streets of Manhattan. Give me Broadway with the soldiers marching. Give me the sound of the trumpets and drums. The soldiers in companies or regiments, some starting away, flushed and reckless. Some, their time up, returning with thinned ranks, young, yet very old, worn, marching. Noticing nothing. Give me the shores and wharves, heavy fringed with black ships. Oh, such for me. Oh, an intense life, full to repletion and varied. The life of the theater, bar room, huge hotel for me. The saloon of the steamer, the crowded excursion for me. The torchlight procession. The dense brigade bound for the war, with high piled military wagons following. People, endless, streaming with strong voices, passions, pageants. Manhattan streets with their powerful throbs, with beating drums as now. The endless and noisy chorus, the rustle and clank of muskets. Even the sight of the wounded. Manhattan crowds with their turbulent musical chorus. Manhattan faces and eyes, forever for me. Dirge for two veterans. The last sunbeam lightly falls from the finished Sabbath on the pavement here, and there beyond it is looking, down a new-made double grave. Lo, the moon ascending up from the east, the silvery round moon, beautiful over the housetops, ghastly, phantom moon, immense and silent moon, I see a sad procession, and I hear the sound of coming full-keyed bugles, all the channels of the city streets, their flooding, as with voices and with tears. I hear the great drums pounding, and the small drums steady whirring, and every blow of the great convulsive drums strikes me through and through. For the sun is brought with the father, in the foremost ranks of the fierce assault they fell. Two veterans, son and father, dropped together, and the double grave awaits them. Now nearer blow the bugles, and the drums strike more convulsive, and the daylight o'er the pavement quite has faded, and the strong dead march enwraps me. In the eastern sky, upboying, the sorrowful vast phantom moves illumined, till some mother's large transparent face in heaven brighter growing. O 
O strong dead march, you please me. O moon immense, with your silvery face, you soothe me. O my soldiers twain, O my veterans passing to burial, what I have I also give you. The moon gives you light, and the bugles and the drums give you music, and my heart, O my soldiers, my veterans, my heart gives you love. Over the carnage rose prophetic a voice. Over the carnage rose prophetic a voice. Be not disheartened. Affection shall solve the problems of freedom yet. Those who love each other shall become invincible. They shall yet make Columbia victorious. Sons of the mother of all, you shall yet be victorious. You shall yet laugh to scorn the attacks of all the remainder of the earth. No danger shall balk Columbia's lovers. If need be, a thousand shall sternly immolate themselves for one. One from Massachusetts shall be a Missourian's comrade, from Maine and from hot Carolina. And another, an Oregonese, shall be friend's triune, more precious to each other than all the riches of the earth. To Michigan, Florida perfumes shall tenderly come. Not the perfumes of flowers, but sweeter, and wafted beyond death. It shall be customary in the houses and streets to see manly affection. The most dauntless and rude shall touch face to face lightly. The dependence of liberty shall be lovers. The continuance of equality shall be comrades. These shall tie you and band you stronger than hoops of iron. I, ecstatic, O oh partners, O oh lands, with the love of lovers tie you. Were you looking to be held together by lawyers, or by an agreement on a paper, or by arms? Nay, nor the world, nor any living thing will so cohere. I saw old general at bay. I saw old general at bay. Old as he was, his gray eyes yet shone out in battle like stars. His small force was now completely hemmed in, in his works. He called for volunteers to run the enemy's lines, a desperate emergency. I saw a hundred and more step forth from the ranks, but two or three were selected. I saw them receive their orders aside. They listened with care. The adjutant was very grave. I saw them depart with cheerfulness, freely risking their lives. THE ARTILLERYMAN'S VISION While my wife at my side lies slumbering, and the wars are over long, and my head on the pillow rests at home, and the vacant midnight passes, and through the stillness, through the dark, I hear, just hear, the breath of my infant. There in the room, as I wake from sleep, this vision presses upon me. The engagement opens there and then in fantasy unreal, the skirmishers begin. They crawl cautiously ahead. I hear the irregular snap, snap. I hear the sounds of the different missiles, the short t -t 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 of the rifle balls. I see the shells exploding, leaving small white clouds. I hear the great shells shrieking as they pass. The grape like the hum and whir of wind through the trees. Tumultuous now the contest rages. All the scenes at the batteries rise in detail before me again. The crashing and smoking, the pride of the men in their pieces. The chief gunner ranges and sights his piece and selects a fuse of the right time. After firing, I see him lean aside and look eagerly off to note the effect. Elsewhere, I hear the cry of a regiment charging. The young colonel leads himself this time with brandished sword. I see the gaps cut by the enemy's volleys, quickly filled up, no delay. I breathe the suffocating smoke, then the flat clouds hover low, concealing all. Now a strange lull for a few seconds, not a shot fired on either side. Then resumed the chaos louder than ever, with eager calls and orders of officers. While from some distant part of the field the wind wafts to my ears a shout of applause, some special success. 
and ever the sound of the cannon far or near, rousing even in dreams a devilish exultation, and all the old mad joy in the depths of my soul. And ever the hastening of infantry, shifting positions, batteries, cavalry, moving hither and thither. The falling, dying I heed not, the wounded dripping and red heed not, some to the rear are hobbling. Grime, heat, rush, aid de camps galloping by, or on a full run, with the patter of small arms, the warnings of the rifles, these in my vision I hear or see, and bombs bursting in air, and at night the vari-colored rockets. Ethiopia saluting the colors. Who are you, dusky woman, so ancient, hardly human, with your woolly white and turbaned head and bare bony feet? Why, rising by the roadside here, do you the colors greet? Tis while our army lines Carolina's sands and pines, forth from thy hovel door, thou, Ethiopia, comest to me, as under doughty Sherman I march toward the sea. Me master years a hundred since from my parents sundered, a little child, they caught me as the savage beast is caught, then hither me across the sea, the cruel slaver brought. No further does she stay, but lingering all the day, her high-born turbaned head she wags, and rolls her darkling eye, and courtesies to the regiment, the guidons moving by. What is it, fateful woman, so blear, hardly human? Why wag your head with turban bound, yellow, red, and green? Are the things so strange and marvelous you see or have seen? Not youth pertains to me. Not youth pertains to me, nor delicatesse. I cannot beguile the time with talk, awkward in the parlor neither a dancer nor elegant, in the learned coterie, sitting constrained and still, for learning in yours not to me. Beauty, knowledge, in your not to me. Yet there are two or three things in your to me. I have nourished the wounded and soothed many a dying soldier, and at intervals waiting, or in the midst of camp, composed these songs. Race of veterans. Race of veterans, race of victors, race of the soil, ready for conflict, race of the conquering march. No more credulity's race, abiding, tempered race. Race henceforth owning no law but the law of itself, race of passion and the storm. World, take good notice. World, take good notice, silver stars fading. Milky hue ripped, wet of white detaching. Coals, 38, baleful, burning. Scarlet, significant, hands-off warning. Now and henceforth, flaunt from these shores. O oh, tan-faced prairie boy. O oh, tan-faced prairie boy. Before you came to camp came many a welcome gift. Praises and presents came and nourishing food till at last among the recruits you came, taciturn, with nothing to give, we but looked on each other, when lo, more than all the gifts of the world you gave me. Look down, fair moon. Look down, fair moon, and bathe this scene. Pour softly down night's nimbus floods on faces ghastly, swollen, purple. On the dead on their backs with arms tossed wide, pour down your unstinted nimbus, sacred moon. Reconciliation. Word over all, beautiful as the sky, beautiful that war and all its deeds of carnage must in time be utterly lost, that the hands of the sisters, death and night, incessantly, softly wash again, and ever again, this solid world. For my enemy is dead, a man divine as myself is dead. I look where he lies, white-faced and still in the coffin. I draw near, bend down, 
and touch lightly with my lips the white face in the coffin. How solemn as one by one, Washington City, 1865. How solemn as one by one, as the ranks returning worn and sweaty, as the men file by where stand, as the faces, the masks appear, as I glance at the faces studying the masks, as I glance upward out of this page studying you, dear friend, whoever you are. How solemn the thought of my whispering soul to each in the ranks and to you. I see behind each mask that wonder, a kindred soul. Oh, the bullet could never kill what you really are, dear friend, nor the bayonet stab what you really are. The soul, yourself I see, great as any, good as the best, waiting, secure and content, which the bullet could never kill, nor the bayonet stab, O oh friend. As I lay with my head in your lap, camarado, as I lay with my head in your lap, camarado, the confession I made I resume, what I said to you and the open air I resume. I know I am restless and make others so. I know my words are weapons full of danger, full of death, for I confront peace, security, and all settled laws to unsettle them. I am more resolute because all have denied me than I could ever have been had all accepted me. I heed not, and have never heeded either experience, cautions, majorities, nor ridicule. And the threat of what is called hell is little or nothing to me. And the lure of what is called heaven is little or nothing to me. Dear camarado, I confess I have urged you onward with me, and still urge you, without the least idea of what is our destination, or whether we shall be victorious, or utterly quelled and defeated. Delicate Cluster Delicate Cluster, flag of teeming life covering all my land, all my seashores lining. Flag of death, how I watched you through the smoke of battle pressing, how I heard you flap and rustle, cloth defiant. Flag cerulean, sunny flag with the orbs of night dappled, ah, my silvery beauty, ah, my woolly white and crimson. Ah, to sing the song of you, my matron mighty, the sacred one, my mother. To a certain civilian. 